Hi, and welcome to South by Southwest. I'm thrilled to introduce the featured session, Live from Space, NASA Astronauts in Your Work in Orbit. Please welcome to the stage, Leah Cheshire, Jennifer Buckley, and Kristen Fobb. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for getting up this morning and coming to join us at South by Southwest. We're really excited to be here. We'll get in with some introductions because coming up in just a few minutes, we are gonna be talking to two of our panelists. They couldn't be here with us in the room today because they are living in space. Um, so just to start off, my name is Leah Cheshire. I am a public affairs officer at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Um, I work with the Humans in Space team. That means I work everything International Space Station, commercial low Earth orbit, commercial crew program, and I do live TV commentary for NASA missions, which is my favorite part. And Jennifer, I'll go over to you to introduce yourself. Good morning, I'm Jennifer Buckley. I am the ISS program chief scientist. Um, I provide the science strategy for the ISS program. Um, I provide science recommendations to the ISS program, program manager um, at headquarters on ways that we should be utilizing 
uh, the International Space Station, manage the priorities for ISS, and ensure that we are fully utilizing all of our capability. Thanks so much. Kristen, over to you. All right, yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Kristen Fobb. I'm the Deputy Chief Scientist at the Human Research Program. Uh, so it's for us, it's really all about the human. How do we keep our humans safe and healthy in space? So it's all about reducing risk that uh, the crew may experience during spaceflight. So that could be physiological, like bone and muscle, and how does exercise play a role in that? It could be psychological, so behavioral health, stress, sleep, medical capabilities. And so it's all about understanding those risks and how do we counter those risks to make sure that we um, set our crew up for optimal crew health and performance during space exploration. All right, thank you. Well, let's get into it. So before we start, uh, we want to ask your questions to the astronauts today. So if you go into the South by Southwest app and you check out our panel, there is a button that says engage. You can go in there, submit questions for Slido, um, and we'll get a chance to ask some of those. So before we get started, what is a downlink. That's what we're about to do with these astronauts. They are living and working 250 miles above our heads, traveling 17,500 miles per hour. That's orbital velocity. And this is how we communicate with our crew members. So they do these downlinks either with schools or events like this. Um, but we also remain in contact with the astronauts pretty much at all times, uh, with some exceptions for satellite handovers, so that our researchers on the ground can communicate with them when they are running some experiments. Do either of you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, I can talk a little bit um, about that. So uh, we'll talk um, probably in a few minutes about the types of science that the crew is doing right now. Um, at any given time during their mission, they'll be doing uh, a variety of science, about 250 to 300 experiments. Um, and so, as you can imagine, um, those are pretty labor intensive. The crew often has their hands in a glove box. Um, you'll see some, uh, some of their workspaces here in a few moments. Um, and so, we use our comm on space station basically to enable the scientists real time. So, you can walk the crew members through um, your experiment as you're doing it on space station. They can give you feedback on how things look. You can adjust it and make tweaks. And that's been uh, just a tremendous evolution over the, the life of the program um, to be able to do something like that. I'll chat really quickly about a downlink some more too. So it's sort of a, um, a song and dance, you know, it's a, it's a call and response. So we have teams in Mission Control Houston, they work 24-7, 365, monitoring the health of the space station and helping it fly, um, as well as obviously the health and happiness of our astronauts. And so we'll be getting calls from the CAPCOM, that's the capsule communicator. Um, that is the one person in the room who speaks with the astronauts to make sure that they are getting all of their information from one place, keep it streamlined and clear and concise. Uh, so they will call out to us and make sure that we're ready for the event. We will let them know that we are more than ready for the event, and we'll get things started. So before that happens, in just a few minutes, a few more fast facts about the International Space Station. The space station is about the size of a football field, an American football field from end zone to end zone, um, including the solar arrays, and it's about the size of a six-bedroom house. So at all times, we typically have about seven people living and working in orbit. That's the number that is there right now because just yesterday, four people who were living on the space station came home. Uh, last week, we launched four new crew members. They completed a handover. And this morning at 4.47 a.m. Central Time, uh, the four returning crew members boosted Earth's population once again and splashed down just off the coast of Pensacola, um, healthy and happy after 199 days in space. So they spend about six months in orbit. We're going to be talking with Jeanette Epps, who just arrived a week ago today, as well as Laurel O'Hara, who launched in September 2023. And she's getting ready to come home here pretty soon. So two different perspectives, both first-time flyers. And uh, we're pretty excited. I mean, I hope you guys are excited. Any day you get to talk to space, I can't complain. It's a good day. <laughs> All right, so we should be getting that call from them in just seriously seconds now. Um, but anything else anybody wanted to share about the International Space Station, about our work in orbit? 
Actually, I, I'm really excited. You were just mentioning the, the swap off, so we were talking about Crew 8. Um, and so we're really excited because we have some new countermeasures, and so we're thinking about space motion sickness. We're actually going to be testing how we can reduce space motion sickness, which is a big deal for some of our crews. So we're really excited to test some of these out. Uh, it's really because of the International Space Station that we can understand what's happening, these changes that really help us to come up with how do we how do we get them so they're not feeling so woozy? And I'm seeing our astronauts, so I think we're about to get started. I'm going to stand by for those calls for Mission Control Houston. <laughs> Unfortunately, they can't see us, so. <laughs> We can hear you though, we have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hi Laurel, Hi Jeanette, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to South by Southwest. All right. Well, to, to get us started, Laurel, you've been up there for six months now. Thanks. And Jeanette, you just arrived last week. How's it been for both of you getting started here? Well, it's funny, we're on opposite ends of our mission, and um, for me, it's just been an amazing six months up here. Um, it's been especially fun um, having Crew 8 get here and get to relive my first couple weeks through their eyes on Space Station, just, uh, you know, getting to do all the things we've been training to do for so many years, um, see Space Station in real life, see Earth from the cupola. Um, it's just a bunch of amazing days and inspiring moments up here. And then I'll let Jeanette chime in as well. Well, I have to agree. It, it has been amazing to finally see this after so many years. And it has been a, a very big learning curve, learning how to move in space. Laurel is so calm. I, you know, every now and then you'll see me do that because I'm still getting used to how to operate in a zero G environment. But it is a wonderful thing um, to see the Earth from this vantage point, to see the space station, to do the work that we've trained our whole lives to do. Awesome. Well, just to dive in, we have some questions here from the audience in the room. Uh, we'll start with this one. How has your perspective on our planet changed since you've been in space? That's one of my favorite questions because seeing Earth from the International Space Station is probably my favorite, one of my favorite parts of being up here. Um, to get to see our planet as one whole planet, um, you can see entire continents from one spot uh, from Space Station as we're flying over them. And to get to see Earth from that perspective makes you realize how small our planet is and also, you know, not seeing borders and seeing it and against the blackness of space and the backdrop of stars. Um, it's just amazing and it makes, you what it makes you realize what a special and unique place we have on planet Earth and how much more we have in common with each other than we have differences. Thanks, Laurel. You're getting a round of applause in the room. I think we all echo that. All right, next question. You know, we have a lot of people here who are uh, tech developers, entrepreneurs, and they want to know, considering all the teamwork, discipline, focus, and the other abilities required to be an astronaut, what can entrepreneurs learn from your experiences? Well, I like to think that we're just a reminder that we do have to work together, build teams to be productive and perform at a really high level. And so for tech um, giants and entrepreneurs out there, you know, the projects that you work on, how to be inclusive, how to um, cu um, cultivate an environment where teams can work effectively together, you know, those are some of the things that we also work on here. Okay, I'm gonna take the next question. Um, can you share uh, some examples of the science experiments you've conducted on the International Space Station um, that have led to groundbreaking discoveries or uh, maybe what you guys have been working on just this increment that we will um, see some of the results coming back soon? Uh, 
Yeah, it's been super fun up here. We're getting to work on a wide array of science, um, everything from life sciences to material sciences, uh, combustion experiments. Uh, we get to do a little bit of everything every day. Some of the stuff that we've had going on this week um, is an experiment called Flawless Space Fibers, where we are producing a ha higher quality optical fiber than we can on Earth, um, looking at the materials and processes for that production. And then Jeanette's actually been working yesterday and today on an experiment called SIR, uh, which is a combustion experiment. And they are, they study all sorts of different things. Right now they're looking at um, different fire extinguishing techniques for the Orion capsule. Um, so different ways to put out flames in some of our exploration vehicles. Uh, so those are just two examples of the kind of work that we get to do up here. Do actually, I, I'm loving this question. Uh, so this question is: My 13-year-old daughter asks, "If you could upgrade your living and workspaces, what would you add?" She would love to be a lunar architect in the future. So we're we're laughing here because uh, you know one of my suggestions was to add a WHC to every room. A WHC is a waste hygiene compartment. It's our toilet. But you know, we always ask for that in, in our houses too. Um, it's interesting because you know, one person was saying that they would love to put their head down and trying to figure out a way where you could have a place where you can actually feel like you're putting your head down would be great. But it's actually, you know, you kind of float here and you don't really, lay down at all. So it's kind of hard to say what we, I would add, because I think our, our compartments are, they're, they're small, but they're pretty comfortable. <laughs> Thank you for the demonstration as well. Uh, for the people in the room, the astronauts essentially have a crew quarters that's about the size of a coat closet, because you don't need a bed in space necessarily. So they, they kind of strap up to the wall and get cozy, and uh, that is how they sleep. So I think laying your head down would feel pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, once, once you get used to sleeping up here, just floating in space is also really nice. And then I'll just add, we always want more windows. Yeah. Good views. I don't blame you. I hope to try that floating sometime. Speaking of that, for this crew, we are hiring new astronauts right now. So a question for the astronauts living and working on the International Space Station. What advice would you give to anyone aspiring to be an astronaut or prepare for a career in space-related research? Um, I, the first thing I would say is to follow your passions and interests. Um, in doing so, you and then also stay, re, just remain, op, keep an open mind as you move forward and learn new things. Um, keep an eye out for opportunities because, at least for me, what I found, you know, I started off with a certain path in my head, but as I learned more and started studying different topics, um, you never know where your interests will lead you um, down really interesting career paths. The Earth is a fascinating place to explore. I have to echo exactly what Laurel said. You know, I would also add to that, um, you know, following your passion, you can never go wrong. No matter what you do in life, as long as you're passionate about it, you'll end up somewhere great. You never know where you'll end up. You may even end up on the space station. But, you know, the other thing also is being able to live with other people who aren't like you, who don't look like you, and to be in a team environment like this has been amazing. Since I've come on board last week, Laurel has been awesome in helping me get adapted to this environment. So it's been, um, it's been very interesting. Um, being flexible, adaptable, and a good crewmate is probably one of the most important things that you need to get here. But also, you have to have a technical background. But I think having that mentality where you're going to be a good crewmate and you're going to help your crewmate adapt whatever they need and, and try to like reciprocate that, um, I think is very important in this kind of environment. All right, next question. Another one from the audience here. Is there a major challenge that you have had so far while in space?
So since I'm new, um, the challenges I've had in just conducting one, um, well, the second major experiment that I did um, this time was managing stuff. Because if you put something down and it's not tethered, it's going to float away. And finding it is way harder than you think. Um, it floats away. It has its own mind. So managing everything that comes out of a bag even. You open a bag and everything wants to escape. So management of stuff has been probably the most surprising to me, especially with a big experiment that, um, like the SIR one that we conducted this week. And yeah, we, we were talking earlier about this. Um, one of the fascinating things about being up here is how fast, how quickly our brains adapt to the microgravity environment. So, you know, in the first couple of weeks, microgravity is a challenge that you have to overcome. It's something that you're, you know, it, that's working against you. But the longer you stay up here, it becomes something that helps you out. So, in the first couple of weeks I was here, um, like Jeanette's describing, you're you're kind of working in spite of it. And now it's a tool that I use, um, you know, floating something next to me or taking advantage of the fact that we can spring and be on any surface at any moment. Um, those are all things that are super helpful. Okay, and I'm gonna ask this next one. Um, so what is the tastiest food you've had in space? And then if I can expand to that, can you maybe talk about the importance of food in space? Yeah, I think food is um, something that's always important to people. Um, it's definitely something that brings us together. It reflects our different cultures. Um, and we all look forward to a good meal at the end of a long, hard work day. Uh, some of my favorite foods, actually, interestingly, my favorite foods have changed a lot but since I was up here. Um, things that I really liked when I first got on orbit, now I don't like them as much. And I like things that the first time I tried them when I got up here, I was like, no way. I, I don't like that. So um, it's been interesting just to see, you know, over the course of the six months and our relatively limited, but I think really good menu um, has changed. Well, I have to agree. Like, um, for example, trying the Mexican scrambled eggs that we have here were not good for me, but Laurel <laughs> loves them. <laughs> yeah. So the, I guess the tastiest food that I've had was, <laughs> was the, you know, I, I guess it was the curried vegetables that I really like, and along with the chicken fajitas. Chicken fajitas are pretty good here. Wow. Yeah, we, do have, we do have taco nights up here, and those are always a favorite for everybody. Taco night in space. I'm there for it. <laughs> Sure, so the next question, um, I think uh, Kristen will appreciate from the Human Research Program. Someone is asking, what does your exercise routine look like in space? Great question. Uh, we're scheduled for two and a half hours of exercise a day. Um, and that usually includes an hour and a half of weightlifting on our weightlifting device, which is called A-RED. Um, also, our which is also in front of Cupola, so a space gym with amazing views. And then we also have a treadmill so we can run and a stationary bicycle so we get to do cycling. And we'll usually alternate between running and cycling each day. Those are some of our favorite two hours because in microgravity, it doesn't take a lot of um, energy to move your body around. Just with fingertip force, you can fly across the room. Uh, so exercise is really the only way we get to load our body up and actually feel tired. And so uh, that's something I definitely miss up here. And so I really enjoy the exercise hours. Yeah, and it's one of the, the countermeasures that we use for our bones and our muscles as well. Like um, moving around here is really easy, like Laurel said. But if we um, don't exercise when we get back to Earth, you know, we, we may have some muscle loss and maybe some bone density loss. So exercise is a must. Thank you both. I think we all have some experience with telework, so I like this next question. Um, as the world's most remote workers, do you have any tips for, <laughs> for how to work uh, well with your team members and your teammates that are actually on Earth? Definitely. 
Definitely. Space Station is an excellent platform for that, like you mentioned. Um, and I think kind of like Jeanette was saying earlier, just um, keeping an eye out for each other and helping, out, helping each other out when you can. Uh, like, for example, up here when we get close to the end of a day, um, if someone's finished with their tasks a little early, they go and check with everybody and see if anyone needs help with theirs. Um, even something as simple as you know, putting in dinner for one of their crewmates who's still working, um, that's really helpful. And then along the same lines, being able to take care of yourself. So make sure you're getting enough rest and personal time so that you can be focused and present for your team uh, when, when they need you to be. Yeah, and, and you know, even to the point of like, we have one um, toilet, one WHC, you know, being the courteous one, making sure you're not the one to like, you know, leave the toilet up like on earth or something bad. So, uh, you know, just being a really good crewmate and just considering how you would feel if someone helped you and, and try to do that for your, your fellow crewmate. Uh, I'll tell you that um, Laurel has been extremely helpful in getting me through this week and a lot of little things that, you know, sometimes you don't think matter, but it goes a long way. So you guys have talked a lot about um, teamwork and working together. Um, how do you celebrate things in space? So how do you um, celebrate holidays or maybe um, have that time together as a crew? Great question. Uh, I got to celebrate Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's on board. And uh, one of the things we got from the ground was special food, Bob, so some special holiday food. Uh, that was great. And then we also decorated the module, like for, um, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, we hung up decorations. Uh, Jasmine, who just landed on back on planet Earth today, made us all stockings with our name on it so we could put gifts in there. That was super fun. And then we also just do things like bake cakes if it's somebody's birthday. Um, we have some cake decorating supplies up here. So that's always fun. Right. Um, so you don't have a typical day and night on station. So can you talk to us about your perception of time, uh, your sleep cycles? How does all of that work in, on ISS? Time, to me, has been really funny on Space Station. Um, like you said, we don't have a sunset and a sunrise every day. We have 16. So in many senses, we get multiple days in one, um, and you just don't have the same light cues like you do on Earth. So it can be a real time warp up here. Um, I'll start working on something and think a couple minutes has passed, and it'll be an hour or two. Uh, so time really flies. And then if I look at my entire mission, um, I will have spent 200 days in space by the time I go home. And even just this year, it's been, you know, 72 days already, and they've just gone by in the blink of an eye. Um, even though sometimes our days can, you know, stretch on, we have 12-hour work days, uh, the time overall is just flying. Don't worry, they are also uh, going by pretty fast here on Earth, too. I didn't realize we were 72 days into the year. Um, another question, I love this one. My 10-year-old daughter has always dreamed of becoming an astronaut and the first woman on Mars. What fields of science do you think someone should study that will be particularly relevant in the future? Well, it's interesting. I think Laurel alluded to following your passion earlier, and um, I have to agree. As long as you're in a technical field, I think they, you know, the requirements now say you have to be in a technical field. I'm aerospace, and Laurel's also aerospace. We're <laughs> marine biology. Well, but she's done so many different things outside of aerospace as well, and so it's kind of interesting. You can be aerospace. Um, biology. We have geologists. We have fighter pilots who are like who are also electrical engineers. We have medical doctors. So there's many different paths you can take. I would say pick your passion and follow it. And I'll just add, um, for exploration in general and NASA's mission, um, it really takes a wide variety of people to support that. So 
um, beyond just being an astronaut, you have uh, photographers, you have, um, we have people in, yeah. Flight directors, flight, <laughs> yeah, flight, controllers. flight directors, flight controllers, we have publicists, we have graphic artists, uh, we have, of course, a broad human resources support. So pretty much any job that people are doing in a small town, uh, people are doing at NASA. And so if you want to be in a, involved in exploration, um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Thank you both so much. I know that we are running out of time with you two today. We'll let you get back to your hard work aboard the space station. So thank you again, Jeanette. We can't wait to see everything you do over the next six months. And Laurel, we can't wait to welcome you home to Earth in just a few weeks. Thank you so much for the questions. We're super excited to be there today. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. That never gets old. No, I was going to say the same thing. That's still cool. <laughs> Wow, okay, well thank you all so much again for being here. We're gonna bring it back down to Earth a little bit uh, and talk about some of the research that's going on aboard the International Space Station. So, to get started, what is International Space Station research broad? Let's lay it out. Yeah, that's a great question. Laurel touched on that a little bit. Um, we have a huge diversity in the type of research that we do on Space Station. Um, and that has grown a lot over the years from when we started early days to what we are doing now. Um, so we just celebrated our 25th anniversary for the Space Station program of, of having a Space Station um, orbiting the Earth. Um, and so now we are doing research in biological sciences. So this would include things like cell biology. We do a fair amount of tissue engineering. Um, we do a lot of plant research, which is important um, both to support our crew members as well as for exploration. Um, we have a robust physical sciences program. So we do combustion research. Um, we do fluid physics. We also have um, a really unique vantage point, right? So you talked a little bit about um, we're orbiting the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour, um, but we have instruments on space station both looking out into space. So we do space science. Um, so we do things like astrophysics, heliophysics, and then also looking down. Um, so we do a lot of Earth science um, that we can talk about a little bit later. Um, but we really are using Space Station to inform us about, um, about our, our Earth and our world here. Um, and then we do a lot of tech demos. Um, a lot of those are for exploration, uh, but we do some for medical support of the crew as well. Um, and then finally, we do um, STEM engagement. So it's really important to us at NASA to make sure that we are um, inspiring the next generation um, of scientists and explorers and, and folks to come work with us. Maybe if I expand on that a little bit, um, there were some great examples uh, that we had from our astronauts about the importance of exercise. And so, um, you know, they have all of these technologies up on station now. So they have the treadmill, they have a way that they can cycle, they have a weightlifting ma machine, essentially. So like they can get strong, they can keep their strength, their muscle mass, keep their bone mineral density up. Um, and it's, it's really with the partnership that we have with the ISS. It's a very unique place for us to learn how to live and thrive in space. And so these are just some examples. The plant example is so huge because it's about nutrition, it's about behavioral health, like how does it reduce stress? And so just really emphasizing on what you're talking about, Jen, but I mean, that's 25 years of learning and understanding how to do all of the things that you're just mentioning. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. I, a couple of things I want to pull from that. One is the 25 years. So for 23 of those years, we have had somebody living in space at all times. So if you are under 23, the entire population of Earth has never been totally on Earth. You've always had somebody living in space during your lifetime. I think that's cool. Another thing you talked about is how important the space station is on helping us learn to live and work in space. Obviously, the space station is where we're at right now. Like we mentioned, this is 250 miles above our heads. We can typically get there and get home within a few hours, definitely within a day um, if we needed to. But when we think about going to the moon and Mars, the moon is 1,000 times farther away from 
from Earth than the space station is. So it becomes a little bit more of a journey. We have to know a little bit more about living and working in space because we're going to the moon and eventually to Mars to stay. We want to have a more permanent presence there. So how is space station research preparing us for those future missions to the moon and Mars? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll let Kristen open this one first for human research, right? That's something that, that we all think about is how do we prepare our astronauts to be able to make those journeys? Yeah, I mean, so Artemis is definitely on our mind, and then how do we use the moon to get us to Mars, right? And so we think about unique hazards that the crew can experience for space exploration. And so one can be radiation. So that could be galactic cosmic radiation, that could be solar radiation. Uh, it could be distance from Earth. You were just talking about the distance from Earth to the moon, and then Mars is so much further. Um, the isolation and confinement. And so uh, the International Space Station, you did get some, some uh, idea of the size of the station, but maybe our exploration vehicles are gonna be smaller. So what's that isolation and confinement going to do? And then there's also things like just the environment. What's the lighting and the sounds? Or if we're doing a surface mission, lunar dust, what does that do to our health or Martian dust? But what I love about the, the ISS is that it is the best place to study extended time and microgravity. There is no place like that on Earth. In fact, it's not, it's in space. Uh, so we have this great lab that we can understand a very unique hazard for space exploration, and that is an, on the uh, International Space Station. Yes, yeah, so we have a couple investigations that are specifically targeting exploration. How do we test technologies for our um, Moon and Mars programs? Um, so, you know, the advantage of having a space station that has been up there for such a long time is that we have runtime. Um, so these journeys that are going to take us beyond the lunar surface and onto Mars, you need to make sure that you have a really robust uh, life support system. You need to make sure that your water systems work well. Um, so one of the ones um, that I worked on when I first came to NASA was our regenerative, uh, we call it ECLIS, Environmental Control and Life Support System. Um, so this is really um, what recycles our water on board and provides the crew with drinking water. Um, that water then turns into, uh, we, we split the water, right, and the, that oxygen gets um, pumped back into the cabin. Um, so that's the air that the crew members uh, breathe. And then we have to scrub CO2 out of the environment. Um, and, you know, on the International Space Station, we had the luxury of, in the beginning, as we're trying to bring these systems online, uh, flying bags of water if something happened, um, if our system went down or something broke. But you know, we don't have that as we go these further distances. And so that has really served us as a wonderful platform to be able to test out these uh, systems and do, do some of our tech demos. Um, we also talk about when we go to the moon, um, or we go back to the moon, I should say, um, we're gonna have a more sustainable presence. And what does that mean? That means um, we are going to have a presence on the lunar surface um, and we're going to need infrastructure to support that. Um, so a lot of our um, experiments like we talked about, you know, things like greenhouses, plant growth, um, those are things that we'll wanna do on the lunar surface as well as um, even building structures and infrastructure. Um, so we've done some experiments on the International Space Station. We have a centrifuge up there where we've looked at how does concrete um, like substances form in space? Can we use lunar regolith, which is like a lunar, lunar dirt, right? How do, you, how do you use that and can you use that to make building materials? Um, and so uh, we've done things like what does it look like on microgravity? We can spin it in our centrifuge and say what does this look like in lunar gravity and what does this look like in Martian gravity? Um, so this is really informing a lot of the technologies that we'll need for our exploration programs. And just wanted to uh, give everyone a heads up before we move on to our next question that you can also ask questions of our panelists. So don't forget to go into the app, let us know what you're wondering about, and we're gonna get to those in just a few minutes. But to uh, bring it back home and make it a little more relatable, I think, how does what we're doing on the International Space Station through this research benefit life on Earth for, for all of us? Uh, yeah, I could start with that. So we actually study a lot of things that probably, you know, are very relatable. So like imagine if, uh, remember COVID, uh, we were all isolated. We were all stuck in our homes. We all had to adapt to a remote environment. We may have been stuck with people that we didn't necessarily want to be stuck with for a year. 
Um, so how do we deal with that? How do we study that? How do we make sure that we can thrive in those types of environments? And that's very similar to the things that we study, is how do we work on team dynamics? How do we work on uh, behavioral health? What does the impact of important nutrition and exercise do for behavioral health? Uh, we studied things like cancer. So we, again, I mentioned earlier, something like radiation. So we want to understand long-term effects. So we can study things like neurocognitive uh, complications like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and cancer. Um, Jen mentioned earlier medical technologies, and so we think about our tech demos, and so we want to be able to do a lot of our blood analysis or um, trying to take samples and do analysis right there on the spot. Uh, so if we have the ability to do that in space, then we can perhaps have the ability to do this anywhere on Earth, particularly in populations where maybe it's harder to get medical health care to them. Yeah, I think some of those biomedical examples kind of come to mind first um, when we talk about things like that. Um, science and, and, and um, biology works very different in microgravity, right? And we can use that to our advantage. Um, so 3D structures form more readily. Um, so you can do things like protein crystal growth. Um, so those are proteins that are really hard for scientists to um, recreate the structures here on Earth because you're fighting against gravity. That's been hugely successful in the pharmaceutical industry for the International Space Station. So we have been able to um, support investigations for advances of things like um, a drug that's in clinical trials now for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, we also had some early work on um, being able to take the, um, the chemotherapy drug or, or um, you know, cancer drug, Keytruda, um, and help um, make that protein um, in a way that, that patients could receive it as an injection to make it easier for people to take. Um, we do a lot of um, organoid type research, um, and uh, we even have a 3D bioprinter on board. Um, so this helps us have insight into creating models that we can potentially use on the ground, but also you know, use in space. So um, Jeanette's gonna be working on an experiment where we're looking at um, brain organoids in space and testing different therapeutics for neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and obviously those, those things are much easier to do when you're not fighting against gravity and you have these 3D structures more like what you would have in, in the human body. Um, we uh, also, I talked a little bit about some of our external instruments that are looking down on the Earth. Um, I, I'm very passionate um, about, about kind of the suite of instruments because I think it's a really great perspective that we have. Um, we have instruments that, that work together. So we have EcoStress, which looks at um, plant temperatures and can tell us how global warming is impacting um, plants and tropical forest canopies here on Earth. Um, we have JEDI, which then uh, also looks at that growth and, and how, um, how plants are performing, how the tree canopy is forming. Um, and then we have um, OCO3, which is our uh, orbiting carbon observatory. So that looks at what's happening in the, the carbon cycle um, here on Earth, too. And so I think the really unique thing about the International Space Station and, and low Earth uh, platforms with this capability in general is this is the only place that all of these instruments can work together. You can put each individual one on a satellite, um, but the International Space Station passes over 95% of the Earth's inhabited surfaces. So now you stack these all on the same platform, on the same orbit, where they have power, they have data, they have thermal cooling, um, and you can really get a powerful picture of what's happening globally, and that can inform a lot of our policy decisions and, and help us decide um, what we want to do going forward. For me, I'm, I'm passionate about NASA spinoffs, which is an entirely separate thing. So the work has been done, and then people on Earth can take it and say, how can we use this to advance uh, something else? And that could be a product, um, and, and I think those are fascinating. So you can really search anything on the spinoff website. I've tested it, and it seems that there has been uh, something that they've used NASA research for to improve products or um, you know processes here on Earth. Yeah, can we talk about the colloid work Please, that's in talk that? about it. Yeah, so that one's really cool. Um, we had uh, an experiment called ACE, um, which was looking at colloids. So um, 
we don't have sedimentation in microgravity, right? So things that are in suspension don't sink to the bottom. Um, so they were looking at um, kind of uh, colloids, these, these particles that are suspended in fluids in microgravity to figure out how you can um, improve things for medication or even like household products, right? How do you improve the, the shelf stability um, of these types of solutions? And, and Procter & Gamble actually has three patents now off of work that they've done on the space station um, looking at these types of things. That's a great example, Leah. I love it. All right, we're going to get into some questions from our friends in the audience. Um, let's see. In a world that is becoming increasingly becoming less globalized, less globalized, sorry, how do you guys imagine the future of international space station and international space travel? Yeah. So I, I can talk to the international aspect of it. You know, um, that's one thing that I think we have learned to do really well in our 25 years of, of the International Space Station, um, is it is truly a partnership um, with our international partners. Um, I talk a lot about the science on space station, but just the engineering feat of building a space station um, with uh, you know multiple countries assembling modules that have never been fit checked on the ground, putting them together for the first time in space. Your communication has to be very good, um, and so you know I. I, um, I think as far as where we're going with this, um, you know, none of us can do this alone. Um, space is hard. You will hear people say that over and over again. It is hard. Um, it's very expensive, and we can go much farther if we go together and combine our resources. Maybe I could just add to that. I mean, what, what you see, the science that you're seeing images on, uh, the, what the crew have been talking about, the experiments that they're, they're doing, um, there is probably, you know, a couple hundred people that are behind some of those studies and um, really just to emphasize that you can't do it alone uh, for our program just as, as well as yours or even across the agency. Those international partnerships, partnerships in general um, are crucial for us because people will have unique perspectives uh, based on your culture, based on where you come from. And so having that new perspective, that diverse perspective, really helps us to make sure that we're getting the best type of equipment, the best type of science, the best type of questions that set us up for uh, some of these successful missions. And so just really emphasizing on everything what Jen said there. And I think I can touch on, too, the future of the International Space Station and space travel. You know, we can't have the space station forever, unfortunately. Um, and so we are already working on what that looks like to maintain our human presence in low Earth orbit. So we're working with private companies that are building their own private space stations. And eventually, NASA wants to be one of many customers to these. Um, and we are already seeing, you know, we are launching astronauts on private spacecraft owned by, I should say, owned by private companies. Um, and we are one of many customers for those. So that allows us to take what we've been putting our efforts and our resources to on the International Space Station and start looking out further into space and start planning for the Artemis generation and our trips to the moon. Um, so that's a little bit about the future of the space station and space travel in general. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Leah. You know, the International Space Station um, is approved and funded to operate until 2030. Um, we know structurally it can continue on um, perhaps beyond that. Um, but, you know, NASA's mission really is to start partnering with some of these commercial companies that are looking at building uh, commercial LEO destinations. So you'll hear us talk about CLDs. Um, that's the next low Earth orbit generation, or, or um, generation of space stations. Um, and that will really allow us to look at stepping out into the solar system and focusing on exploration. I like this question. How are experiments and knowledge shared between teams from different countries? Is there a global idea of who wants to work on what? And are there shared teams? And are there project leaders? Well, I'll, I'll take a, a start at that. And then I'm sure that Jen can expand to the, the science and overall. But um, so we do have databases that uh, are available to our researchers. And so if we do experiments or if we have crew samples, and um, we do experiments on those crew samples, uh, we do try to have those databases available so that a researcher could come in and request certain types of data to give an example or what their study is and then request the type of data that they need to, to do their studies. Uh, so that is for domestic as a, an example of how to share data. Uh, now, as we're talking about the international partnerships, this is actually things that we are working on right now. We are, we are 
understanding that we are now in this data age where we can do big data, we can do these complex algorithms, machine learning, AI, uh, how do we work together? What's the guidance? What's the policies of what we need to do like to protect our astronauts, uh, our, our, the, the data from the crew, but also to make sure that we have the right type of availability in, the, in this world. So we're working on right now our, our, how we do our data sharing across both commercial and international partnerships. How do we navigate through that? Uh, it's complex, but that's, that's something that we think is very important and we're actively working on. Go ahead. I was just going to move on to the next question, but if you want to add something. No, I was just going to talk about the international partner aspect. I think they talked about, you know, um, different contributions or strengths, right? And, and Kristen touched on a little bit earlier. Um, each country has their, their strength, right? Um, so, you know, one example that always comes to mind is, you know, on the space shuttle, right? We had the, um, the robotic arm was built by Canada, right? So when you go to build an international space station, Canada is one of your partners. Guess who built our arm, right? Um, so everyone has things that they um, bring to the table that they are very strong in, both nation nationally, right, um, uh, that they contribute to, uh, to our different programs. All right, here's another one. Is there always a doctor in the crew or someone with medical training? So we have, um, it depends on the, the crew, right? Uh, but we also have what we call flight doctors, um, so that each crew member will have assigned a, a flight doc, is what we call them, and they work with the crew on all medical conditions or needs or questions that they may have. Uh, but I'm not sure, Jen, if you can speak to, I mean, I think it's just depending on the crew that's assigned on if they have a medical background or not, but we always wanna make sure that there is access to any medical needs or questions or concerns uh, with our flight with our flight doc. Yeah, we do have a number of astronauts in the office who um, are medical doctors or, or have medical backgrounds. Um, and so obviously it's great if they're on the crew, um, but also, uh, you know, we think about the, um, we always think about the what if scenarios, right? So what if something happens and that crew member is sick and needs help? And so all crew members get um, kind of a, a baseline level of training on medical response and medical support. And then if you don't have um, a physician on the crew, um, then you have someone who gets a little bit more training um, to be able to um, you know, intervene and help people on orbit as they work with teams on the ground. Right now on Kuwait, we happen to have um, Mike Barrett on board. Um, so he is an MD and he um, kind of literally wrote the textbook on aerospace medicine. Um, so they're in really good hands. Can I maybe expand on that a little bit uh, and just and take that to the next level of the future? Is this is where we can actually start to look at VR, virtual reality, or augmented reality so that we can, in these unknown unknowns, when we're doing space exploration, so when we're moving from the moon and beyond, how can we take advantage of virtual reality and augmented reality to train or to help guide on medical conditions? So having some more um, self-reliance on some of these conditions that may arise during space exploration so that we kind of see that as the future uh, that we want to pursue. And I think, too, we're, we're looking at the original telehealth as well. You know, they have private medical conferences weekly or any time that they need one, they're able to speak with someone on the ground, a flight surgeon, a flight doctor, um, who, and they can share how they're feeling emotionally, how they're feeling physically, and that's someone on the ground who has that expertise and that training to help them feel better. So if you've ever used telehealth, I, uh, you know, you're not far off from what an astronaut on the space station might experience. Uh, let's see. Do you have, do any of you have plans to visit the space station? I wish. Any, anytime they want to offer, I'm, I, I'll go. <laughs> I think I have to save up some money to do one of the private astronaut oh, yeah. missions. Yeah. It's a little... If anyone wants to fund me, I will go. <laughs> Okay, let's see. The ISS is a scientific lab. How do, how do researchers ensure the scientific e experiments conducted in microgravity can be translated and have a positive impact back on Earth? I mean, yeah, I could take a, uh, an exam take a stab at that. So, yes, so when we do the flight studies on, on station, like these are, we find this to be very important. They actually help us to plan for those future missions. But as we were talking about earlier, like how does our research come back to how does it help 
on Earth. So we, again, we have a team of scientists that plan for these. We have a team of people that implement the research on ISS. We work with our colleagues across the agency. We work with our ISS program peers to make sure that we are integrated and that we can perform our science. And if we have troubleshooting, if we need to, uh, to, if there's a glitch or a problem in the study, that we have a team to support to ensure that we get the science that we need. But again, just to emphasize, a lot of the, a lot of the studies that we do, we think have on Earth applications like behavioral health, like how do you deal with team dynamics. And so the studies that we do, we'll publish on and say, here's the impact, here's what we're learning on, on station, here's where we're learning on these isolation analogs across the planet and how this can hopefully be applied and translated into uh, everybody's um, daily lives. Yeah, and the research that we do on space station isn't just for space. Um, so the International Space Station is a um, national lab. So you'll hear us talk about the ISS National Lab. What this means is that Congress designated the International Space Station as a lab, um, so starting in 2005, um, it is a national lab, so it means 50% of resources on the International Space Station are open uh, to the American public for basically non-NASA use. Um, so there is um, uh, CASIS, the Center for Advancement of Science in Space, or you can find them on ISS National Lab. Um, so if you have ideas of research that can improve life here on Earth, um, but needs microgravity to do your research, um, it is open to the American public um, to come do so. All right, next question. How does the partnership with private entities like SpaceX, how has the, pri how has the partnership with private entities like SpaceX helped space missions? It, it's a game changer. It, it's opened up opportunities. Uh, you know, first of all, just being able to launch on, on U.S. soil again and being able to have a higher cadence of crew that can go to the International Space Station and do the type of research that we need to understand what, what are the risks, what are the hazards for space exploration. This is, it's disruptive. It's a game changer. Um, and, and not only just SpaceX, we actually have a whole group of people um, that are focused on those commercial partnerships within our program on what's, what's the future look like for CLDs, as Jim was saying. And so some of these partners that are going to have these low Earth orbit uh, stations that we will continue to do our studies on, uh, it's, it's going to be critical for us. Also, what are, what are our private astronaut missions looking like? What, what experiences are these these private astronauts experiencing. They don't go through the type of astronaut training that our, our crew do. So what's the behavioral con, uh, concept of that? What's, how are they feeling? What's the physiological changes? Can we, can we understand from our commercial partners that experience that, you know, again, just a game changer for us? Yeah, I think it's really expanded the accessibility of space. Um, so, you know, NASA, um, instead of being focused on transportation to and from low Earth orbit, we can focus on building vehicles for um, exploration. And, you know, SpaceX is one of, one of the companies, right, coming online um, soon. We'll have um, Boeing as well um, that will be taking astronauts back and forth to the space station. Northrop Grumman provides cargo services. Um, and those are some of the larger companies you hear a lot about. Um, we also have a lot of small companies um, that support the International Space Station and, and research in particular um, that help scientists translate science to on-orbit space operations. Um, and so I think it's really expanded. Um, again, you know, it, it's, it's helped the economy, um, but also commanded their expanded commercial space in, in general. Can I maybe just uh, pull a little bit on what you were just talking there with small companies? And so we actually do partner with, there's a, a small business opportunity that NASA provides as a program where you can come in as a small business and uh, look for technologies or what we're calling out for as a need, like maybe I need to look at a blood analysis tool or I need to look at something for my eye vision health and it needs to be small and compact. And so these are ways that we also try to do outreach to the communities and to again, foster some of the small business development that hopefully helps not just our space needs, but then also on Earth applications for the, for the company as well. All right, I'm gonna take one more question right here with, oh, let's see. Do you also lead experimentation in the energy sector, like solar energy from space or looking at nuclear waste? We do. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll I'll start with the, um, if you're going to space and you need power, 
Solar is your friend. Um, so, you know, you'll see many spacecrafts, not just the International Space Station, harnessing solar power as, as their primary power. Um, we, we have backups, too, um, for when we're in what we call insulation or, or out of sunlight. Um, so, yes, the International Space Station has massive solar arrays that, that power the station and also charge our batteries um, for when, when we don't have sun. Um, and we have... Um, contributed to um, new technologies kind of advancing that field that, that we need for space that hopefully we'll start to see, um, you know, improving things here on Earth too. So um, one of the ones that we have are called, when they were uh, a tech demo, they were called iROSA, Roll Out Solar Arrays. Um, and uh, we did this as kind of a demonstration on the International Space Station. There's solar arrays that unfurl basically like a blanket. Um, and they're really neat to look at. They just sort of are, are floating, you know, kind of suspended in microgravity um, coming out from the space station. And that was um, to supplement our original solar arrays. Uh, those worked so well as a tech demo uh, that as a program we have adopted them. So now we dropped the, the investigational eye and we call them our ROSA um, rollout solar arrays. And so um, we're replacing and kind of upgrading our power systems on, on space station based on that. Um, we also, uh, next week, are launching um, SpaceX 30 mission. So this is a cargo flight packed full of science. Um, and we have an investigation on that flight, um, which is looking um, at uh, basically um, improving solar cells. Um, so this is one of our EPS core investigations coming out of the educational department, and it's from a university. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, seeing how that research um, comes out. I love what Jen is highlighting here because it's, it's also about material science and moving material science forward too. And so all of these examples that, that you've just listed, Jen, like this is, this is another way of moving the, the, I mean, really moving the needle forward for material science uh, so th that you can do these types of things on Earth as well. So uh, thanks for that example. I think that was a really cool one. Yeah, we didn't talk much about uh, material science, but if you really want to test out um, the robustness of your materials, putting it in space where it's exposed to extreme temperatures, um, atomic oxygen, as well as micrometeoroid uh, um, debris, uh, you basically get these debris hits on the surface, um, are, are a really good way, um, both on small and large scale, to test out how robust uh, your materials are. So we have talked a lot about a lot of different types of research today, a lot of different opportunities. So I want to bring it all home and ask, how can someone who's interested get their research or their work and work with the space station? Uh, so from the, our human research program, that we, we do solicit for grants. And so if you're a scientist, if you're a researcher, uh, you know, just look. And we have grant opportunities where you can uh, apply for a grant. Uh, we also, again, I mentioned earlier, we partner with the, the SBIR program at NASA, and SBIR is really about small businesses, technologies. Um, we also have what we call ground analogs, and these ground analogs actually will mimic a component of space flight. And so if you think about Antarctica and isolation and confinement as an example of a ground analog, and so sometimes, and I think right now we even have open calls for recruitment for uh, ground analogs. And so if you want to experience components of what it's like to be in space or be an astronaut, that's a great opportunity. Uh, we also partner with something called TRISH. It's a Translational Research Institute uh, out at Baylor College of Medicine. They do a lot of uh, kind of disruptive, outside-the-box thinking on technologies and research as well. And so they will also have solicitations for science and technology development, too. And on the NASA side, um, we have a um, basically um, announcement of opportunities or um, a, a kind of centralized repository of um, where you can submit grants uh, for NASA-funded research. Um, so we'll leave you guys with a QR code at the end that has a link to that. Uh, we love acronyms, so it's called INSPIRES. Um, we also have the ISS National Lab, which I mentioned earlier, um, which, uh, you know, is open um, not just through the NASA um, funding and kind of NASA pathway, but to give everyone um, in, in the United States um, an opportunity um, to fly research in space. Um, I think we have a, a QR code that'll, that'll come up soon that'll have a link to a lot of these different uh, places if you're, if you're interested in working with us.
And of course, if you just want to learn more about NASA and get more engaged with NASA in general, we are all over social media and it's amazing content. Um, and you can actually see the International Space Station with your naked eye. It is the second brightest object in the night sky. You can't miss it. When you see it, you know that's it. Uh, it's called the Spot the Station app. It'll tell you when it's gonna fly over your area and it is really inspiring to look up and know that there are people working to benefit life on Earth. So everything that we've talked about, you should be able to find a link or something similar on that QR code. And I just want to thank both of our panelists for being here today, both of our astronauts for joining us today. It's a little bit of girl power for Women's History Month. So thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. It's time to boldly go where no one has gone before with the cast of Star Trek Discovery. Please welcome to the South by Southwest studio cast members, Sonequa Martin-Green, Doug Jones, David Ajala, Wilson Cruz, Blue Del Barrio, and Mary Wiseman, along with executive producers Alex Kurtzman and Michelle Paradise. And the fact that we got all those names. Yes. 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 We got it. Go Juju. Go Juju. Go Juju. All right, so this is an amazingly bittersweet moment. It's the final fifth season of Star Trek Discovery. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings? What's going through your minds right now? How are you guys feeling? Grateful. Yes. Grateful for the experience, um, for these people to have been introduced to all of these people who, um, who become a part of my life, mm -hmm. in each other's lives. Um, but grateful for this experience, for being able to tell this story with this incredibly diverse cast, um, and, and finally give voice and face to communities that have been longing to see themselves mm -hmm. in this franchise for mm -hmm. so many years. That's incredible. What, what can we look forward to in the coming season? Like, is there any, like, tips or, you know, little nuggets you can give us? I know there are people who are waiting to know. <laughs> 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 we, can't, we, can't say, we can't say too much. We want it to be um, a surprise for people. I think uh, people can expect uh, some, uh, a bit more action and adventure this uh, season. Not that we don't always have that, but uh, it's um, our heroes are on a quest this season, mm -hmm. and uh, there are things to discover. Get that with mm -hmm. the title. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think people will enjoy right. it. Well, it's a big season, and obviously, you got. I understood what you meant because you got to go bigger and better in the final season, right? You can't hold back anything, so I understand that. But looking back, what are some of your proudest moments? Like some of your greatest moments, personally, to each of you that you love working on this journey? I, I personally enjoy it. Um, Season three, episode one, we got to shoot in Iceland. Mm. Why are you laughing? That's also, because that's also the first time we see you. We see you. <laughs> when I showed up, Bet. it's my favorite. I raise you, I, I get you. Best part of the show. Um, I really enjoyed uh, filming in Iceland, getting mm. to spend so much time with Sneakwa, and just, we, we, we had so many action sequences that we had to just overcome. Thrown in the deep end, and it was just a wonderful way to just kind of start my personal kind of journey mm. in and amongst this wonderful, wonderful franchise. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I, lo I love that you, that we, it was selfish at first, and then you brought it to the, to the bigger group. <laughs> <laughs> I went from the micro to the macro. <laughs> Perfect, that's how we gotta do it over for here. For sure, for sure. Uh, when it comes to this new season, like obviously, um, you know, when it comes to Star Trek in general, the themes are just incredible. You know, they're very personal, they're very uh, cultural. What are some big things that we can look for when it comes to this season as well? Well, no. No, 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 no. if Alex is about to speak, Alex, just no, 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 You go. No, I, no, I was just gonna say, it's, it's, it, it, it's very much um, what you said, mm -hmm. the cultural themes that, mm -hmm. that are always there. They're, they're there and they're bigger. Um, they're grand, they're grand, they're brighter, uh, they're higher, mm -hmm. honestly. 
um, I, there are a lot of uh, big concepts and, and questions um, that are being posed uh, in, in season five. And so while there's this sense of adventure and fun, this tonal shift, we're also just dealing with the biggest, the, the biggest issues there are, yeah. you know, in, in life with existence, with, mm -hmm. with relationships, mm -hmm. with, with the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of them, you know, one of, I mean, we're, we've always asked existential questions, the, yeah. the biggest questions of life. But I think one of the themes that runs through it that I, I get to deal with directly is, you know, the line between faith and science. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. at what point uh, do, do we become okay with not knowing all of the answers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a, a peace to be found in knowing that um, you don't need to know everything and that there, is, um, there are mysteries in the universe yeah. that maybe we're not supposed to understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to get Doug in on this conversation as well because mm -hmm. you've played in so many different types of worlds and when it comes to fantasy and sci-fi, the, the themes often tie to the real world and I feel like, you know, the amount of things you did, you're kind of an expert in this. Ooh. But, <laughs> I don't that far, but thank you. Yeah. But uh, being in Star Trek Discovery, is there a theme that you kind of like saw in this that made you go, "Oh wow, I love I love bringing this to life and letting people like experience it." Yeah, yeah uh, science fiction uh, does parallel real life a lot, and that's why I think the fandom for this genre is so strong, mm -hmm. because people do see, uh, they can watch something fictional and then go into their real life and go, I've got power to face my demons uh, or the or whatever coming my way that day. Right. With my character on this, uh, I've found that like the fans seem to be responding to Saru's imposter syndrome, his fears, his anxieties that he starts with in this series, and he, watching him work through it, watching him evolve past it, watching him uh, uh, find confidence and courage in himself, uh, that's a theme that, that so many people have related to and told me about, like, oh my gosh, I, you, watching Saru has helped me through this, this, that. Mm -hmm. And uh, me too. I, I, me watching Saru go through this has been like, oh gosh. I don't have to. I don't have to have imposter syndrome anymore. I actually yeah. do belong here, Dag Nabbit. You know, right? Yeah. 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 So thank you. Love that. Helping everybody connect with it, including yourself. Yeah. That's Absolutely. incredible. Speaking Absolutely. of connection, mm -hmm. Sonequa, mm -hmm. Captain, mm -hmm. <laughs> Commander, mm -hmm. you are the first Black woman to helm a Star Trek series. Mm -hmm. Talk about that journey. What are you proud of? You know, I I can actually answer a previous question and this question at the same time mm. because that that is, of course, one of the things that I'm most proud of. I, there's no way that I could not be. Um, I made uh, we made television history twice. You know, um, first it was the first black female lead, and then it was the first black female lead and captain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those those moments um, mean so much to me. Even being able to just sit in the chair, it's like I could I could distill it to that moment of being able to sit in the chair. I was carrying my daughter mm. um, at the same time. Um, so being able to share that with her also. Um, and then being able to become a producer and then an executive producer behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Also just the moments that I've had with, with each of them. For, for you and I, it's interesting because some of my favorite moments with each of you are from season three. Actually, mm -hmm. you know the moment that I'm talking about I with do. me and you in my quarters. Mm -hmm. with, with, for you and I, it's Baharai, but then it's, mm -hmm. there's also something mm -hmm. coming up um, that yes. was really special. Yeah. Iceland, like you just said, in your subconscious. And then, oh my goodness, that moment <laughs> that we shared when we reunited at the top of season three. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Like, wow. these are some of my like wow. proudest moments yeah. on this show. Mm -hmm. Oh, we miss you, Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you, fine with you. He's too. not he's alive. <laughs> Man, he's just dang. In, he's just in time. Yeah. Dang, they thought they got a real exclusive with that yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. He's a new daddy and everything. He's, he's in Tokyo. Very he's very in Tokyo much. right now. Yeah. Tokyo yeah. chilling. Sorry. He's in Tokyo chilling right yeah. now. <laughs> Uh, okay, let me like compose myself because because like, everybody got a heart attack. Like, wait, what? I know. I'm like, oh god, I'm, uh, I'm a widower. <laughs> okay, so this is for Blue, Alex, and Michelle. Uh, this show has been a trailblazer in terms of like LGBT, LGBTQIA plus characters. Talk to us about like why is this so fitting for Star Trek's legacy of like infinite diversity and an infinite combinations. <laughs> Dive in. Um, <laughs> you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, I mean, it. I think it was a really perfect timing because I think the way that Ian and I were introduced right after this massive time jump was 
really perfect. And the way that we were introduced was very nonchalantly, which I think was the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've been saying this all weekend, but they're like, there's very rarely a trans character on a TV show. You, there's never two, and they're never in a relationship. So like <laughs> the fact that I got to do that with Ian is definitely what I'm most proud of in, in all of the work that I've done here. Um, I feel immensely grateful to have been like allowed to, you know, you guys gave us this platform and I, and I, it's, yeah, I didn't realize the effect that it would have. Um, and I'm like hugely grateful for it every single day. Uh, but I, I love the way that we were portrayed. I love the way that I got to bring a lot of my own life um, and transition into Adira and that I, I've got to do that on screen, although very scary. I'm, I'm really grateful for it. Um, and I'm glad I could do it. And I'm glad that it was not the most interesting thing about mm. either myself or Ian's mm. characters. Mm. Mm. Uh, in fact, we literally never talk about it, <laughs> which is perfect. Um, and I, I love that. I love Adira very, very much. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm very grateful. Mm. It's incredible. Uh, there's breaking down barriers, and then there's like kicking down that barrier, and then slowly sitting and having a cup of coffee, saying, "I'm here." <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you know, <laughs> and I and I felt that from your answer just now. Um, so, what have been your? This is for everyone. If you have one comes to mind, shout it out. What has been like your favorite strange like alien worlds or alien planets that you guys have visited within this show? On my own, uh, on the, the home of the <laughs> Kaminar uh, for mm -hmm. the Kelpians, was, I, I love the mm -hmm. aesthetic of it, mm -hmm. the uh, living in a hut, mm -hmm. and, and the transition of hut to spaceship mm -hmm. for me was, yeah. was quite, a, quite, quite a journey, but I never forgot my roots as a Kelpian. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was good. It's good for me. Yeah. That's a good answer. I loved uh, the, the 10C planet that we spent mm -hmm. a lot of time mm -hmm. in because this was, you know, a species that we had never encountered before, so we were trying to figure out how to communicate with mm -hmm. um, uh, a species that that didn't use um, words, mm -hmm. you know, was using pheromones and um, mm -hmm. what were those? Oh gosh, what were they it was called? A, it was a, it was two years ago. Yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> dust. Uh, but anyway, yes. the, the the point was that you know it, it, it felt you know we we use an AR wall, so it's like a 180 if not more degree um, uh, LED wall that with 11,000 yeah, screens. Yeah, it's incredible, and it's it was it was just a beautiful set, and it really allowed us. To escape reality and and throw ourselves into this strange world that a strange with a world? with a straight yes yeah. with a strange, yeah. strange yeah. world. Think, look at you tying stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Alex was happy with that. Well, yeah. <laughs> someone, good luck, good luck. Yeah. someone has a, a, a live Paramount Plus account. I love that. Um, but anyway, it was just so easily easy to lose ourselves in those surroundings. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. I loved the, the Tensi, and I loved that whole storyline about how you make first contact with a the species that, like that. Right, okay, mm -hmm. so we're running out of time, but I have one good question I feel like a lot of fans would like to answer, and that's mm -hmm. not finding out that somebody probably died. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what is a favorite behind the scenes moment that you would like to share? I'm gonna give it to you, because you've been awfully quiet. Yeah. Right. Looking What's great, that? but awfully quiet. Yes, I'm yeah, right? just chilling. <laughs> 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 She's a good one to go to about behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why would you say that? <laughs> it's a hunch on my part. Would you say that I'm a bit of a goof, a bit of a clown? <laughs> um, I don't. There's so many, but mm, I true. like all the stuff, all the shenanigans we get into on the bridge are just mm. my absolute favorite. Mm -hmm. When we're like kind of just like giddy and like. Dancing. Cra crazy yeah. Yeah. dancing, mm -hmm. all of like our little improvs that right. we have. We have like set improvs that we do. Like yeah. sneak one, my favorite one is like a sort of passive aggressive hairstylist. <laughs> yeah. it was, like, is that supposed to be? Is that? Let me just. And then, oh, are we going? Okay, that's it's. It's. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, you're like, but is it? Is it okay? No. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I think we gotta go. Yeah. 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 Remember our little thing? Uh, this is the other one I brought purse. up yesterday is like a tiny little purse and with like the funniest <laughs> tiny <laughs> thing you can take out of it, like a little lipstick. Cross from each other, we would do it to each other, just like looking in the <laughs> Please tell me those photos of this. I'm, I'm telling you, pray you, you throw a bunch of actors in a room for twelve hours, they're gonna find a way to <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, so. invisible yeah. invisible dark. Well that oh that was yeah, that was a great invisible dark. Okay, y'all. I know, show, I know we said that we're show, running out of time, but explain the invisible, invisible dirt. dirt. <laughs> yeah. 
Can I? Can we adopt that? Like, can yes. we like adopt <laughs> your words? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, South Thank you. <laughs> thank you <laughs> everyone for Star Trek Discovery and thank you to you all for stopping by you can watch all of our studio interviews on the South by Southwest YouTube page that is youtube.com slash SXSW I'm your host Juju Green thank you so much for watching
Hello everyone, my name is Austin Nauert. I'm the Senior Film and TV Programming Manager here at South by Southwest. It's great to see everyone. I believe today is day five, but the days have blurred together. Um, I hope everyone is enjoying their time here in Austin. Before we start, just one or two bits of housekeeping. Today we will have a digital uh, Q&A via Slido. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question for a chance to be answered later in the session, please go to this session's page in the South by Southwest Go app and click engage and enter your question there. I also would like to just give a big thank you to all of our volunteers who work at this event. Uh, they are why this event is able to be possible. All right, now on to Lily. Of course, we all know who Lily is and that she's been quite a big deal for quite a while. But over the years, she's evolved into a, uh, into a dynamic storytelling icon and the definition of a multi-hyphenate. 
She is an Emmy-winning entertainer, actress, producer, New York Times best-selling author, gender equality advocate, and president of Unicorn Island, which I have to say is probably the coolest job title of anyone that I've introduced this year. Um, she kicked off her run at South by Southwest by receiving the Variety Comedy Crossover Award, and she's gonna premiere her first feature film, Doing It, uh, which she co-wrote, produced, and starred in uh, today at 5 p.m. at the Stateside Theater. So everyone here should obviously please go and see that. It's a really, really fantastic film. She is here today to talk about how she uses entertainment and humor to shake up culture while maintaining important social commentary that ignites impact. Lily will be joined today by Polly Orit, who is the head who, who is the head of development at Unicorn Island Productions. Together at Unicorn Island, they use storytelling to highlight underrepresented communities. So without any further ado, please welcome Lily and Polly to the stage, please. Thank you all so much. What a good, you're so good at this. You're so good at your, give it up for this guy right here. My God. What's going on, y'all? Turn up, it's a Tuesday. Thank you for being here so early. The lights are so bright. Hi, Polly, take it away, I'm gonna shut up. Hello everybody, thanks for coming out. Oh, Lily. So wait, can I? Yeah, sure. So, so just so I all know, Polly and I work together. Polly, how long have we worked together? Six years. Six years. We talk to each other every freaking day, and we're both crazy. And now you're gonna be in on this conversation. I feel so bad for you guys. Right now. This, this is my first time moderating. First time moderator, Tonight. give it up! Hello. Come on, Bear come with me. on! It's gonna be great. It's gonna be amazing. Ask me all of the things that you've never asked me before. Oops, I didn't prep for that. Okay, oh, okay. let's go, baby. So, Lily, this is your first South by Southwest. Is this what you expected? So yeah, I, I think I have been to Austin before uh, on my tours, but I only got to see the hotel room, honestly. I'm loving Austin. I'm having an amazing time at the festival. I'm a big nerd. I love films. I love meeting other creatives. So it has been so fun to meet people just as nerdy as me. Like every person here is a nerd and I love that. I love that about this. How many of y'all are nerds? Are, are they like, you're film nerds. That, that, that's what you are, right? Okay, the loudest cheer also was someone on my team, I'm pretty sure. Um, but yes, okay, so I just love meeting other creatives. Have you seen any movies? I have. I have seen some movies. Um, yesterday I saw Monkey Man. I know Dev and the, and the crew were just on stage. I thought it was phenomenal. I, I told Dev last night as well, this is a big statement. I'm going to make it, I think, the best action movie I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to say that. Took the number one spot. Uh, I saw Cryptic. I saw, I think it's pronounced Azrael, I think. I saw Babes, Alana Glazer's movie, which was also awesome. I'm just loving supporting all these other filmmakers. Tried any barbecue yet? I've not tried barbecue yet. What the heck? Where should I eat barbecue? Okay. DM her. D yes. DM me. <laughs> uh, so you recently received the, let's see, Comedy Crossover Award at Variety's Power of Comedy event last Friday. Correct. Will you tell us a little about a, your journey crossing over? Okay, so this award basically, it was called the Variety's Comedy Crossover Award. In very blunt terms, it means that I was kind of important before, but now they've told me I'm actually important because I've crossed over. <laughs> That's what that award means. In 2010, is anyone familiar with my YouTube videos? It's okay if you're not. Okay, amazing, thank you. So in 2010, I started my career on YouTube. Um, I made a whole bunch of types of videos, you know, comedy, direct cameras, rants, talking, imitating my parents, whatever. Um, moved to LA in 2015. I've done a lot of things in the digital space. Then I wrote a couple books and I had a late night show. And during that entire time, I knew what I really wanted to do. I wanted to act. Like, I've, I've always wanted to act. I've wanted, I grew up with movies. I, it was my dream to be on the big screen and to write movies and to do what I'm doing now. So the word actually meant a lot. The crossover award meant a lot because I do feel like, if I'm just going to be really honest, when you start in the digital space, people have a tendency to pigeonhole you. Like, they will not let you evolve from that space. I don't know if anyone can relate to this or if you've started on socials or do any work on socials, but people get very comfortable being like, this is your box. We're gonna put you in that box, you're gonna stay in that box. And I felt like no matter what I do now, people are gonna keep leading with just this many followers and she did that thing on YouTube. And I have nothing against the digital space that gave me my career, but I think as a creative, you wanna grow, right? You wanna try different things. You wanna change the way you tell stories. And so I'm happy to say that, you know, I'm, I'm fully embracing TV and film and long, long, longer format storytelling. And so the Crossover Comedy Award really validated that, um, even though my parents will not care at all. Honestly. And what are some of the like similarities between your experience back in the day on YouTube and what you're doing now? Like what are what's the synergy there? 
So I think that when I started to get onto bigger sets, like TV sets and, and film sets, there's a lot more money, there's bigger budgets, there's a lot more people, there's like 100 people on a set versus me and my team of four that like can execute things. So there's a lot more people to work with, but I will say the one thing that is the same is story is still the most important. And I do feel like content creators understand that almost better sometimes than sometimes sets do. Because I think when you are on a big film set, there's so many moving parts, and you have so many things that you're thinking about. You're thinking about the budget, you're thinking about the days, you're thinking about the optics, the mar you're thinking about all these things. And sometimes I have to tell people, like, remember the story? Remember why we're here? Remember what we're trying to say? Um, and so I think that the thing I love about everything I've done is that I really have prioritized the story. So in our new film, Doing It, just like my YouTube videos, I'm like, how do I want people to feel when they leave? Like, what, what is the message I'm trying to say? And I don't want that to ever get lost. It's way harder to tell the story in film and TV, but I, I still want the story to be the thing. Excellent. All right, so today, as you guys might have heard, is the world premiere of our movie, Doing It. Oh, give it up one time. Come on, man. Come on. Stateside Theater, 5 p.m. Come check it out. And who's free at 5 p.m.? Please, come to Stateside, and let me sell this to you in the way it needs to be sold. How many movies... Just yell out, how many movies have you seen so far here? Okay, so y'all know, whoever said seven, that some of the seats are uncomfortable. You know that. Some of the theaters are. Our theater has comfy seats. I tested it personally. Uh, doing It is our movie. 5 p.m. it is premiering. It, it's a sex comedy. Um, it was uncomfortable. But it was, it's so needed. Um, I'm sure you're going to ask me a bunch of questions about it, so let me not jump the gun. Yeah, yeah, So tell us about your origin story of how, how this film came to be. In 2019, we actually fact-checked this. We've been working on this since 2019. Um, an amazing creator by the name of Neil Patel uh, sent us this premise that I immediately loved, which was a 30-something-year-old Indian-American virgin finds herself accidentally teaching high school sex ed. And I was like, this is amazing. Also, this terrifies me because my parents are going to be mad at me. And so I, I, I think throughout my career, anytime something scares me, I know I have to do it. Anytime I've done something great in my career, the one common feeling I have is I'm so scared to do this thing. And so I love the premise. Um, we brought on an amazing director, writer by the name of Sara Zandia, who took a few passes. And then from past 10 to like 25, I, I co-wrote my first feature, which is this movie, Doing It. I learned so much. But I was like, yo. Growing up, I never saw anything like this. I think, and I'm just going to get real, real. I don't know. I can't see with the lights of how many girls and women are here. Or, or I mean, how many South Asians are here. But any culture, I think, can relate to this idea of, like, being so uncomfortable with sex. Growing up, it was the thing that would torment me. Like, I don't know if I know as much as my friends. I don't know if I'm, like, a loser. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm so uncomfortable with my body. And no one ever talked to me about it. My parents never gave me the talk. My school barely taught me sex ed. Um, I tried to Google things. I would overhear things at school. I just was so uninformed until like full-fledged adult life. Like I only recently learned, we'll get into this story, but I only recently learned that boys could not take off their penis. I swear to God. <laughs> because in not, sixth grade in the playground, I didn't know anything about it and I overheard a boy and he, I swear he said he takes off his penis. And I was like, what? And so I just didn't ask any questions. I just took this knowledge all the way until like the ninth grade, I swear, in high school. I'm like, I'm still not completely sure like what they do with their penis. Like when they take it off. So I'm assuming they like charge it at night. I don't know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Only until recently. And I was like, oh, but it's just, it's, it was such an awkward upbringing. And I'm like, if I can make something where people watch it and they realize, one, they're not alone. That like a lot of people feel awkward about this journey. And a lot of people, especially girls and women, have felt like they have to be ashamed of their bodies. Like, let me make a movie that addresses this head on, even though it's uncomfortable and scary. So that's what this movie is. It's full of sex jokes, but full of, full of message as well. So talk about how the film, as a sex comedy, tackles all those themes. Like, what's your approach to how you interweave these kind of heavy subjects into totally. an R-rated So I'm gonna keep it 100 with all y'all. This movie, I think a lot of people are gonna like it. And I think a lot of people, uncles, are gonna be pissed. I do think some uncles and aunties will be pissed. And that was very scary for me because I was like, okay, I had a pretty reserved upbringing. Um, I'm now writing a sex comedy and there's some scenes, like I, I won't give it away, but the opening of the movie, we go there. And it was a big conversation we had internally because I was like, 
I think I was operating out of fear. I was like, okay, well, we don't want to do that because people are going to get mad. And I, I realized I kept saying answers like, we can't do that because people are going to get mad. We can't do that because people are going to get offended. Then I was like, wait, maybe that's why we have to do it. Because if I don't do that, if I don't go there, if I don't push the boundary, I'm not addressing the issue. And I think now I've created a film where if people watch it, and they will, and some people might be like, I don't, I don't know if I'm okay with that, I think they're going to have to ask themselves why. Because what we're showing is like a completely natural part of people's lives, and it is a natural part of growing up. And honestly, I'm going to say this how it needs to be said, if you're mad at the movie, it just features a sexually empowered woman. So you got to ask yourself why. Like, why are you offended about that? So I really had to force myself to go there knowing that my dad is going to see the movie and knowing that, you know, he might be a little uncomfortable, but I ma we made the choice, the very active choice to go there to talk about things. Um, I myself have scenes that I was like, I'm nervous about this. I'm uncomfortable, but I, I'm going to go there and do this. And <sighs> we went there. And you've mentioned you're tackling all these difficult subjects like shame and sex and how uncomfortable that is. You're mentioning that you are gonna piss off a ton of uncles in this project. Or they're like, gonna be super cool about it, we'll, see, we'll it. see. Maybe, maybe you can cancel, maybe not. Like, or, like, what else is scary about this besides those? Are those the main things? Well, I care about the subject matter so much, so I'm definitely, like, I don't know if you, for those of you that follow me, you might know, Unicorn Island also has a charitable arm. My charity is all about empowering girls and women, specifically within the South Asian community, specifically in India, and the main way we do that is de-weaponizing shame. I really believe shame is a thing that upholds the patriarchy. Like, if you really look at it, it's like women are taught to be ashamed of their bodies, they're taught, they're, totally, they're taught to not speak out. It is not an accident, it is by design that women are shamed so that they don't speak out, so that they stay in their lane, so that the system can maintain the way it is and that certain people stay in power. I think as soon as you start eliminating shame from the equation, a lot of things will change. Um, but we have to unlearn that. I, this movie was me unlearning that, to be like, oh, why do I feel nervous about doing this scene? I should be empowered to do this scene, I should love my body. So I care about the subject matter so much, so I'm scared because I know the stakes are really high when you're trying to change culture in this way. But y'all, it's Unicorn Island's first feature. It's our first feature. <laughs> it's the first time I, it is the first time I am the lead in a film, the first time I've co-written a film, the first time I've produced a film. It's a lot of firsts. I really want it to do well. So I'm very scared for all those reasons. And not to mention, I have to say, this film is independently financed. This is uh, Anita, who is our financer, is right here. She's a, a epic South Asian woman who raised all this money. Um, and a lot of people believed in it, and I want to make sure that they didn't make the wrong choice. I want to make sure that they can walk away from this being like, we need to invest in many more South Asian projects like this. So the stakes are high. The stakes are high. Whatever you're doing at 5 p.m., cancel that ish. <laughs> the stakes of this are high. Can you rein it in? You're covering way too many of my questions. Sorry. Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so you've talked, so you grew up Second daughter of Punjabi immigrants in yes. Toronto. I also want to just point out real quick, how many South Asian people are here? How many Daisies? Raise your hand. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. I want to point out what Polly just said right now because I'm just going to keep it 100. Usually a white person would just say Indian or they would say South Asian. She specifically said Punjabi. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because you didn't ask this question, but I'm just going to go on a tangent for a second. Uh, a, a question I get often is how do you tell diverse stories because my team has a lot of white people and a lot of diverse people. And my answer has been, um, my team is not basic. My team will learn the correct terms and they will know the right words for things. In fact, every month we have a mandatory, not a mandatory, I'm lying. We, every month we have a Bollywood movie night where my team watches all of the Bollywood movies. They've seen, all, name a Bollywood movie you've seen, Polly, please. We won't butcher your, we won't judge your pronunciation. Name any movie you've seen, go, go. Because any movie, come on. Any movie? Any movie that we watch at Bollywood movie night, go. Oh man, guys! I'm your favorite? What's your favorite? The one we just watched. Now. Your favorite? <laughs> um, let's see. Three idiots. Yep. Did you watched three idiots. Three idiots. Oh, right. Excellent. But the point I'm making is that I want to flag she said Punjabi because I'm really proud of her. Because, anyways, can you carry on? We try. We try. <laughs> She's giving me an education, guys. Yes. Um, so, obviously, you tackle a lot of, you know, let's say this movie is for everybody, mm -hmm. but it is told through a culturally specific lens. Mm -hmm. Talk about how you went about representing South Asian culture and Punjabi culture totally. in this film. Totally. So I learned from a lot of things in my life, specifically uh, my short stint as a late night host, that 
representing South a the South Asian community is a blessing, and I'll be completely honest, a challenge because there is one billion South Asian people. And so there's no possible way I as one person can represent all of those people. Because although we do have a lot of things in common, I could probably tell you stories about my childhood and you'd be like, oh my God, same. There's also a lot of differences between us. My parents are not exactly like yours. My love life is not exactly like yours. My sexual journey is not exactly like yours. And so um, I'm telling a story that I know very intimately in this movie. It's true to me, it's true to the director. Um, but you might watch it and you might say, I relate to this, or there's some parts I don't relate to, um, and that I just had to embrace. That yes, it's, it's very South Asian in the sense that, you know, the mom, she's, we, we really went out of our way to make sure she wasn't a stereotypically strict mom. But having said that, I also didn't have a mom that was like, sex is cool, sex everywhere. I had to be true to a level of, she's still a little reserved, but she's not super strict, and like, that is true to me and I hope people can see a little bit of their moms in that character. Um, you know, she does have a reserved upbringing. She goes to school in India. And so I was like, okay, what is true to Indian kids to, you know, during this time period, let me, let me embrace that. And so I, the best I could do was what I knew, and I hope people see themselves in it, but I just wanna be really honest and say that one of the curses of being part of a minority group in terms of representation, not in terms of number because there's so many of us, but in terms of representation is that that is true, like we're just so, we so badly wanna see our stories on screen and we have a handful to choose from right now. And I think the challenge is we want that handful to represent all of us and all of our experiences and it's just impossible to do. You know, it's impossible. I can't look at Never Have I Ever and be like, this needs to completely mimic my high school experience or I'm gonna be pissed. It just cannot happen. I think the real win is when you have such a range of stories and true representation is you're like, oh man, there's like so many stories to choose from that are South Asian that one of them is definitely gonna, gonna be the one that I resonate with. And that's a pretty like macro approach to how you approach the culture. I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, Lily is a perfectionist and incredibly detail-oriented. Pair that with making an independent film and you get a lot of hands-on uh, work, I would say, on set. Talk about some of the like, little nuanced details that you infused into this project to make sure that the South Asian authenticity really resonated. So it is true, everyone I work with, I used to like this about myself, then I stopped liking it about myself, and now I'm back to loving it about myself. I am a very involved person. Anything I do from me hosting a dinner to me being part of a film, I don't just put my name on something. I'm like, I really care about what this is saying, the outcome of this, the quality of this, to the point where I hosted a dinner two days ago at South by Southwest, and before I confirmed, I was like, can you send me pictures of the table settings? I wanna make sure the plates are nice. Can you send me the menu? No one can leave hungry. I wanna make sure there's enough food. Like, I'm very involved like that. So with this film, there is a lot of small details that I was very adamant on. Um, one is growing up, I was very close with my grandfather. He's in some of my earlier YouTube videos as well. Um, his picture is in the wall, on the walls in the house, in the film. Uh, my mom was the cultural consultant of the film, so her younger images are also on the walls of the house. There's a lot of my personal family sentiments in there. Um, growing up, I was, I had two Tamil best friends, who, which is the reason I know a lot of Tamil. Any, I mean, any Tamil people in the house? Just you! <laughs> we like it! I see you, I see you, but... The, you know, the opening shot of the, of the movie is Barnathium, you know, so there's a lot of things from my, my the high school name is, is the, the school I went to, so there's a lot of personal touches in the film. A lot of uh, personal experiences of mine also went in there, and so it's not based on a true story, but it's based on a true story. I think it's based on the true story of millions of girls and women, honestly. I think that's the truth. You're neglecting to talk about kurkuri, my favorite snack ever. Oh my God, yes! Sorry. She said kurkuri. That's how deep she's in. <laughs> She said kurkure right, right just now. So yes, small things like I was like, you know, my character is eating a snack. I want it to be kurkure. We have to go get kurkure. Do you know how hard it is to clear some of these things? Can we just take a moment? One of the hardest parts of making diverse films is the fact that like I need to be like, I want to use this kabi kushi kabi gum scene. And I, we got to track down this, the rights to this thing and kurkure getting like clearance on that is just, it's, it's, a, it's the wild, wild west in some ways getting clearance but we managed to get a lot of really cool things in the film. Stepping on my questions again. Sorry. Yeah, all right. You can ask it again. You, uh, all right, so as you mentioned, you starred in, produced, and co-wrote this script yep. with Neil Patel, the original screenwriter, and our director, Sarah Zandia. And this was your first time writing a feature script, yep. writing on a feature script. Yep. Talk about that experience, and did you like it? Are you gonna do it again? Oh, I'm gonna keep doing it. Like, I, 
I keep telling my investor over here, I'm like, I have the next script almost ready, just saying. Um, I want to, I love this. You know, when I was making YouTube videos, I love that too, but I had, it was very immediate gratification. You come up with an idea the same day, I would shoot it, I would edit it, I would release it, and then it's on to the next one, on to the next one. And that works for certain ideas, but right now where I'm at is, I want to like sit with things for a while. I want to have several drafts. I want to think, okay, I did this, but like, is this the best it could be? How could I make it better? How could this character evolve even more? I'm just really enjoying sitting with creative longer, taking my time t telling a story and telling a message. Um, so I definitely want to do more. But I will say I'm still learning. Like I, this experience really taught me, okay, this is not a seven minute YouTube video. This is an hour and a half movie. How do I, what is the arc here? What is the story structure? And I was so lucky because I worked with such experienced, awesome people that taught me along the way from actors to people behind the scenes as well. So yes, my, I, this next chapter of my career is dedicated to TV and film in that way where honestly, I might stop being a basic, a basic on Instagram. I don't know. We'll see. It's a hard thing to let go of, but I might have to let go of that a little bit. All right. I see yeah. that. What do you miss about the short form storytelling as you're delving into long form? Hmm. What do I miss about people dragging me on the internet? <laughs> this is such a tough question. No, I will say, listen, Social media, I've been very clear about this. It is a double-edged sword. I love it and I hate it at the exact same time. <laughs> it has given me my entire career. Um, but it's also very mentally unhealthy. One of the things, not to get too deep, that I've had to work on over the past two years is after a decade of making stuff for social, my brain is wired and conditioned to only think of success in a certain way, which is through numbers and did this go viral and did, how much engagement did it get? Like, the number of times I would check analytics and insights in a day was compulsive. It was like seriously problematic. And then I decided one day, I was like, all right, I wanna get into TV and film now. And I believed that I was gonna be able to snap and be like, and now I'm doing that. And my brain couldn't. I'd be working on scripts, but I was like, I still need to make a funny thing for Instagram because if people aren't watching me there, how am I gonna do this other stuff? I'm not successful. People are saying I'm not relevant. I'm not successful. And I talked to my therapist about it and I was like, I'm in this trap where I have new goals and I have new ambitions, but my brain has a compulsion where it keeps forcing me to chase the same goals I've already accomplished. Like I've had viral videos, but my brain is like, you need to keep doing that. I have sold merch and I've had sold out tours, but my brain is like, you gotta keep doing it but you can't keep doing that if you're trying to also accomplish new things. And so it's taking two years, literally, of my brain being like, it's okay if you don't post this on Instagram. It's okay if a million people didn't watch this comedy clip on YouTube, it's okay. Because guess what, you're making space for new growth. That's been super, super hard. Um, but the thing I do miss is that on YouTube you, and, and I, Instagram, you get immediate val validation. You get that immediate rush of people being like, I relate to this, I love this, and there's a little bit of a community there. I miss that, which is why I'm so excited for tonight, because it's, it's a moment for that community to happen again. Um, I just, I really love the people that, that w connect with my content, and I hope I get lots of opportunities to connect with them in person. Well, doing it is for sale at this festival. We are out, up for distribution. Where the buyers in the room at? Yeah, I know you're all here. You guys have a checkbook, you wanna come talk to us after the movie, that's cool. Um, but you know, there's a chance it might sell to a streamer. Uh, we, you know, that doesn't always share those metrics and data. So how, how are you gonna measure success for this movie? I will break into their buildings. I will <laughs> hack their computers. Um, okay, this is another thing I've had to, so and in anticipation of tonight's premiere, I've been excited, I've been nervous, y'all. I've been nervous and I've had to think a lot in my meditations. What, how are you defining success for this film? And I think I'm in the minority with this answer because I don't know if my investing group is going to agree with me. But I'm not going to make eye contact with you. I'm going to go over here. Um, I will be happy and glad and relieved if we break even. <laughs> I will be happy. I'll be like, oh, that's, that's so lovely. That is, what a privilege to break even. That would be amazing. It will be so great if it makes money because so many people put their money into this. And I, I want so badly for them to make money. Um, but for me, my number one metric of success is I just want it to be successful enough for me to do it again. I think I want to make sure that it creates enough buzz where the next film I do is a little easier. It's a little easier to make, is that the next time there's a story that's told through a, through a South Asian lens, people are less hesitant, that a buyer is less hesitant, that an exec is less, I just want to chip away at that path to be like, oh yeah, doing it, okay, that, you know what, that was good. 
this we don't have to overthink about. Because the reality is, you know, I do live in a situation where I, I think sometimes we have really great ideas and we go into a, and I'm not calling any specific, ex actually, am I going to call specific execs out? I'm not. But there are a lot of times I go into a room and there's this really great idea and it'll be like, oh, yeah, but, you know, slum dog already happened. Or never have I ever, yeah, it already exists. There's that one girl in Sex Lives of College Girls is kind of similar to that. That season of Bridgerton, you know, happened. And I'm like, they, people really do group all, all diverse stories into these lumps like that. And so it's really hard to get things made because it already existed in that instance. So like, we can't have two of those things. And I'm just like, how many spy movies exist? How many spy kids exist? How many Mission Impossibles, you know what I mean? So I think when you're in a diverse minority group, you're still so much proving yourself over and over and over again in the way other cultures and, and films don't have to prove themselves. So if I have to prove myself and this culture and our stories a little bit less with the next project, then this project is a success. That is my only <laughs> measure of success for me, personally. So you're referencing yourself as a part of a diverse minority group, yet some of us may know South Asians actually take up a quarter of our global population. Mm -hmm. Reconcile that and why. Polly taught me that stuff. You know, that. like why do you think this group is, this culture is still being regarded with tokenism in entertainment? Well, I think a few things. So I was um, born in Canada and I was born specifically in Toronto, which is very, I will still say after trial. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, who's Canadian? Oh, I thought you looked polite up front here. <laughs> I got polite vibes from you. I got polite vibes from you. Um, I will say after traveling the world, I still think Toronto's the most diverse city I've ever been to. I didn't have a single friend growing up whose parents were not immigrants. Not a single one of my friends didn't know another language, didn't eat, you know, didn't watch movies growing up that weren't in English. Then I moved to LA and it was kind of a culture shock in that way because immigration patterns are different in America and California. And I met other brown people and I was like, oh my God, like, so where are your parents from? And I'm expecting them to say like, Gujarat. And they're like, Ohio. And I'm like, oh. That's different, but cool, but different. And so I do think in America, which is one of the biggest markets and you know, the market of focus a lot of times is still kind of catching up with this idea of like, oh, South Asians, because I will say it, it is kind of black and white. You know, it's, there's a lot of minority groups where people just don't get it. I, I literally had someone ask me, I was like, I love soca music, which is like Caribbean music. And someone literally said to me, is that Bollywood? Like that's the level I had someone ask me, what is a samosa? What is a sari? And I was like, what? Like growing up in Toronto, every person knew those things. And so you're nodding, you know what's up. Um, you're like, I have a samosa in my pocket right now. She, you know what's up, you know? <laughs> but I think there's just a learning curve. And I'll also just say, I don't want to play the blame game. There is work to be done on, on the studio side for them getting an education. But I'm also going to have to say, South Asian community, we got to take a little ownership here as well. Because for things to be popping, you got to show up. And I think historically, uh, we've been taught from our elders, not on purpose, but because of their trauma, that we have to compete with each other. And there's not room for all of us. And we got to tear other people down. It's always, your cousin did this. And you know what they did? And she's better than you. And so we all grew up being like, we can't support each other. No, if I support you, I'm going to lose. If I support you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be knocked down. And we have to unlearn that trauma. We have to show up for each other. And we have to be like, no, we want South Asian stories. And we want that. And we can't tear them down. So we have to take ownership over that as well and band together a little bit. All right, some work ahead. So you've mentioned that in this movie, you play Maya, who gets a job, or accidentally gets a job teaching high school sex ed, but she's a virgin. How relatable was Maya's experience to you personally? Oh my God, how honest am I gonna be right now? Like, I, this is my debate, I'm such an honest person, but then I'm like, why did I say that? <laughs> but I think I'm gonna just be honest. I am gonna be honest, because, yeah, I am. Because I shouldn't be embarrassed, because the whole film is about not being embarrassed. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Um, I was very uncomfortable with sex for most of my life. Um, I was very scared of dudes for most of my life for that reason. I came out very late in life, so like I equally don't know enough about things about women, um, to be honest. I'm just like, tell me about everyone's bodies. I don't even know about my own. Um, was terrified and didn't know how to use a tampon for most of my life, honestly, until I became, I see some people nodding. I fought for that line to be in the movie. There's a line in the movie about that. And a lot of people were like, really? I don't think that's relatable. I'm like, I think it is. 
I actually think it is relatable to a lot of cultures because I was taught just if you're if you're if you're embarrassed, that's fine. But can anyone relate to that sentiment? And I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay, good, good, good. But uh, I was taught that you know don't sit on a boy's lap, you'll get pregnant. I was taught that if you use a tampon, you'll you'll won't be a virgin anymore. Um, I in school was taught if you even kiss a boy, like herpes, boom, <laughs> immediately. You know, so I relate to a lot of the fear tactics in this film. I was terrified. My first boyfriend, I was like vividly remember reporting to my friends. Oh my God, oh my God. Okay, so like something happened between his name was Nick. I have this thing where for some reason almost all of my boyfriends are named after the Backstreet Boys. It's really weird. <laughs> Minus Howie, I've dated every one of the Backstreet Boys' names. It's a very bizarre thing. Um, but I remember I like ran to my friends. This was in, this was in high school, y'all. I ran to my friends, and I was like, oh, something happened between me and Nick. And they're like, oh my God, oh my God, tell, tell, tell. And I was like, okay, I'm really nervous. Like, don't judge me. I'm like, we just held hands. <laughs> and I was freaking out over the fact that I publicly held hands with a boy. And that's where I was at. Like, that's where I was at. I was embarrassed to talk about my period. I was embarrassed to talk about my bra. It was just, like, very uncomfortable for me for a long time in my life. And if a movie like this existed, I feel like I just would have felt a little more normal growing up being like, oh, I'm not the only, because I really felt like everyone else had it figured out, just me. I was the only one that didn't have it figured out. And that's just not true. We just don't talk about it enough. So I didn't know how to use tampons for most of my life. <laughs> if you can relate, don't be embarrassed. You're not alone. I promise. Make that a gift, please, someone. <laughs> Put that on TikTok. Make my day. As you were researching and kind of writing on this script, did you learn anything about sex education that you didn't know before? Y'all, my search history is a hot mess. <laughs> like, if anyone goes through my laptop, they're going to be like, she's a freak. Um, yes, I learned, I, I thought that this issue of sex ed not being taught in schools was just like a my generation thing, but it actually still happens today. I did not realize that. While making this movie, I talked to a lot of my um, cousins who are teachers, and I was like, this is like not a thing anymore, right? And they're like, no. Parents will write into the school still and opt their kids out of sex ed. It is not a mandatory thing. Teachers sometimes refuse to teach it. Some schools ban it. Different countries in different states and different provinces all have different rules. It is not a regulated thing by any means. I think that's wild. I don't, if you're a parent, can you raise your hand real quick? Okay, cool. If you plan to have kids at some point in your life, can you raise your hand real quick? So many people are not raising your hands, and I'm like, you're so smart. Um, <laughs> geniuses, honestly. I'm still unsure, but I was like, I didn't realize there's still this, and I don't want to be rude, but I am going to call that a delusion of parents thinking that their kids are not going to learn this. Parents are still to this day being like, I'm not going to talk to my kids about this. They don't need to know this stuff. And I'm like, do you really believe that your kids are not learning this with the internet, with people at school, with everything that exists? Like, that is a level of delusion that I'm just going to have to call you out on. If you do not talk to your kids or your teachers don't talk to your kids, they're going to learn. It's just not going to be from an accurate source. So I was like, my mind was blown to realize that people still have this mentality, but it's very prevalent. No, we were talking to a school teacher when we were up there, and she was saying how Canada has this curriculum where they teach sex ed across the board, but it's the one class that people can opt out of, that parents can opt their kids out That's of. Wild. The only one in the curriculum. Like, the so. class you should be able to opt out of is history, because that is just a lie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that should be the class that you opt out of. <laughs> Don't get me started. Um, I'll answer a question one more way, and this is going to be, uh, I won't get into too much detail, but I will say, one of the challenges of this film, I actually have a list on my phone called Person of Color Challenges that I learned from this film. It's a list of things I was like, I wasn't expecting that. That was hard. Um, because sometimes people will come up to me and they'll be like, can you give me an adv any advice? Something that's in my search history is darker Indian man penis. <laughs> and the reason is because one of our cast members is the fabulous Utkar Shambhadgar who is in the film, um, I don't know if you're familiar, but he's a darker skinned Indian man and there may be a scene where he's got his peen out. Or not. Or, or not. not, maybe not. It might not be his peen, it might be a, a fake, we don't know, you decide. But the point is, I, there was a moment where I was like, had to ask myself the question, Utkarsh was like a brother to me and I, I had to call him and be like, just wanna understand what the shade of your penis would be to ensure that this is accurate. So I had to, uh, have that conversation with my dear friend Othgar about the color of his penis. And that's in my search history. And I had to create an entire mood board of said thing. There was, 
A penis mood board. It was a penis mood board. And that was the one email out of the entire production that Polly looped in the wrong person. <laughs> so we, you looped in like an exec from like a different... An agent. <laughs> like the he one was email. He was a friend. He was a friend. One email, full penis mood board. Not even as an attachment, in the body of the email. In the body of the email. Thank you for mentioning yes. that. Yes. Classic. Classic. All right, well, you're talking about some challenges of this movie. Yes. So this was Unicorn Island's first time producing a feature film, and we, we brought in, you know, a veteran independent producer, Antine Bregman, and Likely Story Productions. Yeah, yeah. Here, no big deal. But we also brought in some first-time financiers, some Camelback Productions, Anita. Shout-out, shout-out, shout, out, shout out. That big round of applause you know? to, take a, to put your money and be like, we're going to bet on this. Sh big shout-outs. Great. Super brave. So let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges of making an independent movie as a first timer. You're poor. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> this question is making me sweat, actually, because I'm nervous about this now. Um, I'm just kidding. I wanted you to show you that my vest is cool. Um, thank you. It was in the description of Yeah, my stylist is going to be like, you wore the freaking jacket the whole time. How dare you? Um, the challenges are that. Listen, movies take a lot of money and a lot of time. Um, and if you're not in the business, I think when you hear the numbers, you're like, that's so much money, but you don't realize how quickly that money gets spent. Um, there's a lot of people involved in a production. Um, so to make a dollar stretch is very, very difficult, especially because you're trying to do two things at once. You're trying to tell an accurate story for a, for, for, through a cultural lens where you're like, I want to do right by them. I want to do right by them. I want to make sure it's quality. I want to make sure we can have all the references and all the things and the music. And then you're like, oh, but I also like have a limited set of resources that other films don't have and how can I accomplish both of these things? Um, so it is really challenging because when you're part of a project like this, um, people are looking for every excuse to write it off. Honestly, that's, that's the truth. People in power that make decisions are looking for every excuse to be like, yeah, well, that didn't work. Well, that didn't really whatever. Well, see the quality, they're, every excuse they're looking for that. And so you're like trying to combat that with limited resources and you're learning. It was our first film. It was our investors' first film. We're like learning this stuff as we go. Um, and so it was just like a crash course up against a lot of obstacles, you know, post pandemic, pre strike. There was just so many things going on and you're just trying to make the best possible project. Um, but is there a challenge you're thinking of specifically? Well, I was curious, like any lessons in particular that you took out of this as far as, I mean, yeah, I mean a challenge I would say in particular was, frankly, it's really important to us as a company that focuses on underrepresented voices to make sure that there uh, yes. is that representation represented totally. in front and behind the camera. Care well, to expand Lily? Correct. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'll just keep it real. I'm gonna, I, I, I keep saying I'm gonna keep it real, but that's because I always have to use it as disclaimers, like you're not gonna get a BS answer here. Um, for me, it is so important that as many people as possible, I was like, this is a movie, I wanna make sure there's as many diverse people, specifically even South Asian people, that can understand what we're trying to do. And like I said, I wanna emphasize, the movie's not just for South Asian people. Like anyone's gonna see it and be like, oh God, I relate to this, but it's told through that lens. And so I was like, I wanna make sure that behind the camera, in front of the camera, there's a lot of South Asian people. We ran into two challenges, which I get. Like we shot in Toronto and there's a handful of people in the union that are South Asian for any given job. And if there's another show that's like has a diverse cast, they've booked those people. So literally when I say like, there is no person for us to go to, there was no person sometimes where I'm like, there's just not enough representation in these unions that we have to mine from to get these people. The second issue is we have limited resources. Um, and make no mistake, I, we, me and Polly, our fees, my fees, we have put them back into the movie. <laughs> like, we are not, when I say I'm probably going to walk away with no money, like, that is a real thing. I put a lot of money and resources into this movie because I, I feel like I'm in the position to be able to do that. But when you have someone that you're trying to hire for a job and you're like, industry standard is here for this job, our budget is here, and this is what we have, it pains me so much to go to a person that's South Asian and be like, this is all I can offer you because, like, they're so used to hearing that. I heard that for my whole career. This is how much we got for you. We can't offer you more. And I'm just like, all right, like it is what it is. And it pains me to do that because like, those people are worth so much more, but it's just what we're working with. So that was a big challenge as well to be like, we want to use these people. We don't have a lot to offer them. So I called up a lot of people to be like, I don't have money to offer you, but here is why I love this project and why I want it to win. And if you're aligned, like let's do it. But it is very, very difficult and hard to sometimes get the diver diversity. It doesn't mean you can't, I'm gonna keep trying, I'm gonna keep doing it, but there are some real challenges. 
that can't be ignored. Indeed. Yeah. So in this film, we actually first meet your character, Maya, when she's in middle school. Yeah. This is going to be our last question before we open it up. We're going to do Q&A. audience questions, and I want you all to hit me with some hard yeah. effing questions. No basic stuff, please. But what, if you could go back and tell middle school Lily any piece of advice, what would that be? Ooh. I learned this in my 30s. I know, I don't look a day over 22. But I learned this in my 30s, and it sounds silly to say, but I didn't realize that as an adult, or as a person, for forget you're an adult, you're allowed to make decisions that are right for you. I know that sounds so silly, but for my whole life, I was just told, this is what you're supposed to do. This is the linear life. This is what girls do, this is what they don't do, this is when you're supposed to speak up, when you're not supposed to speak up, which is your dress, which you're not supposed to dress. Um, and I just accepted it. I was like, makes sense. Everyone else is doing it, sure. And only in my adult life was I like, wait, I think I can unlearn that and decide that that's not actually right for me. If I did that from a younger age, I would have been such a healthier, happier person way earlier in my life. But for too long, I was just like, tell me what to do. I will just take it and keep doing it. It doesn't work for me, but I'm gonna keep doing it. Um, I would have unlearned that sooner. I would have told her to learn that sooner. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. All right, we're gonna open up to some of your questions. Yay, uh, yay. We, we like this one a lot. It's a uh, spoon feeding into all the things we wanna hear. Perfect. Why is comedy your tool of choice to make impact? And what other tools support this? Anonymous. Who's anonymous? Who asked this question? Do you want to get some credit right now? Yeah, be proud. No? Oh, they're like, it's your publicist. Um, <laughs> I, that's why I actually said that, because I knew it was going to be you. Okay. <laughs> no, this is an important question. Um, I feel like growing up, every subject was taboo. Mental health was taboo, sex was taboo, everything. And I needed comedy to talk about it. Like, I, comedy was the only way I could talk about those issues without me feeling uncomfortable, other people getting upset. I feel comedy is the best vehicle to talk about important things because it allows people to put down their defense mechanisms. I feel like everyone, especially today, we're so defensive, we're so like, no, but I'm right and you're this and I have to oppose you. And comedy is the one thing that kind of, it should allow you to be like, let me put that all aside for a second. I'm like, we can laugh about this and talk about some important stuff. So that's what the film does. It has a lot of scenes that I honestly would probably not do if it wasn't for comedy. And so I think it's just the most, um, the best vehicle for driving impact. Cool. So now we have non-publicist questions, which I love. Yes. Not um, that I don't love you, you're great. <laughs> um, okay, Nicole H. Uh, mentions that, she's, that she loves that you're passionate about helping youth better understand and not be ashamed about sex. But what age do you think should be, what's, what's the appropriate age to watch your film? I'm gonna get in trouble. Um, okay, so obviously it's a sex comedy. Proceed with caution. There is raunchy sex jokes. I do not think super young kids should probably watch this film. Having said that, if you believe a child is at the age where they're hearing about it anyways, like if I, uh, take this with a grain of salt, I'm not a parent, but if I was a parent, I would absolutely want my child, specifically my daughter, to see this film. Because I think, yes, there's sex jokes and it's raunchy, but what it's really teaching girls is like, don't listen to the shame, don't listen to the judgment, learn about your body, learn about sex, learn that you have choices and options and decisions are yours. Never seen that in a movie growing up myself. I would want my daughter and my kids to see this movie, personally. So I'll answer it in that way. My only add to that is as the mom of a six-year-old girl, I'm going to wait a few years, but maybe around the time she's getting a sex ed education, this would be a perfect companion. Totally. And I, and I will also say that, I know we keep saying the movie's about a virgin, but a virgin. The virgin is not the butt of the joke in this film. Like, growing up, I think the best comp in terms of subject matter is like 40-year-old virgin. Where the whole movie, and it's an amazing movie, it was, I watched it before we shot this and it's iconic, but it is very about like, something's wrong with me and like, and at the end I lose my virginity and now I'm like, oh, thank God, I can be no, kind of normal. This is not, I'm not, the message is not that to be normal, lose your virginity. The les lesson is not like, <laughs> virginity is a made up construct to begin with, a really straight made up construct. So it's not the butt of the joke and I think that's an important message for, for girls to, to hear. Indeed. Um, we touched on this a little bit, but can you expand how when you switched from making YouTube videos to the, to kind of longer form content, what was your biggest struggle? Emily B wants to know. So my biggest struggle is that for YouTube, I made all of the decisions pretty much. 
I was like, I know how much it's going to cost. I can use someone's music. The worst that'll happen is get taken down. I don't need to get everything cleared. There's no legal. There's no like person gonna giving me notes. And when you make a film or when you move into other spaces where your creative team is bigger, there are notes. And Polly will attest to the fact that sometimes I'm very precious. I'm like, no, this joke has to go in and I will die on this hill. Um, but I've learned and I'm learning probably actively still of like, actually like there's merit. There's merit to a creative team being like, what about this? Can you think about this this way to challenge yourself creatively? And, but I will also say the struggle is that everything is so expensive. I will answer this by saying we ran out of money for our music budget, budget towards the end of the film. I wanted to make sure the music was like, I was like, I want to have like a desi South Asian flair. Like our music is so dope. I want to infuse it. It's expensive. Music is so expensive. However expensive you think music is, it's 10 times that. It is so expensive. And towards the end of the edit, we ran out of money. So actually, um, the movie in the last week of post-production, I wrote an original song in two days for the film. And it is the credit song and then the final scene. And it's the original song I wrote because we just didn't have money. So stay tuned for that. If you come to the to film, don't leave before the credits because there's an original credit song. I don't know if you guys picked up on that flex. Lily is also a songwriter and performer in this. So uh, just, just throwing that out there. No big Pretty deal. Cool. Pretty cool. What? Okay, what was the biggest challenge as an actor on doing it? Annabelle wants to know. So, <clears throat> this is my first lead in the future, like I've said. So, it was really sitting with a character for a longer time than I'm used to. Uh, and she's doing freaky things. And as a person, I'm already pretty reserved. Like, when I talk to my friends, I used to be that person that was like, had to whisper the word sex. I'd feel a little bit uncomfortable saying the word penis. We've had like 55 meetings about a dildo at this point, so like that ship has sailed. But, um, it was, some of the intimacy scenes were really tough for me. Like, I don't know if anyone here has shot an intimacy scene, but there's an intimacy coordinator and you have to talk about it in great detail. It's like my, all of my trauma. I was like, oh my God. So I'm like standing across from this guy and she's like, so tell him what you feel comfortable with him doing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I had to walk him through every part of my body he could touch and how he could touch. And I was like, this is so out of my comfort zone. But that was a huge challenge, like the intimacy scenes. And some of them, it's just me on camera. And I'm like, there's no one else to lean on. It's me and the camera. I'm doing some stuff. Like, I'm cautious. And then I, I think I just, it was, a, it was an exercise in letting go. And just being like, you have to let go. It's not about looking cool. Actually, Kunal Nair taught me this, if you're familiar with Big Bang Theory. He was one of the first people I ever acted with. And he always taught me that. He said, when you start acting, you'll have a temptation to try to look cool and pretty and all of these things because like you're so worried you're on camera. He's like, you gotta let go of all of that. It's not about looking cool. It's about looking like the character. It's about looking like what that moment's supposed to look like. And so, man, I watched this movie 50 times and there's one scene where I'm like, my nostrils are so big. And I gotta let that go. I gotta let that go. I think your nostrils are awesome. They're big. They're big in this moment because there's a reason they're big in that moment and you'll find out. <laughs> So, let's see, Anonymous wants to know, what's the number one universal sex ed lesson that you would share with someone? Um, the universal message I would give is this whole way we try to control girls and women about virginity is a goddamn lie. It's not true, it's a complete myth. Um, and virginity is also a very heterosexual construct. And I think for most of my life, I was like, don't ride your bike like that, don't do that, virginity, 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 and it's like, shut the F up, like it's not a thing. And it's not something that needs to govern girls and women's lives and it has no association with their value or shame or anything and I think we need to stop teaching about that in school because it's messed up. Yeah. Come on, round of applause for that. Samir has a really good question. This is an inventive one, thank you Samir. Uh, if Maya from Doing It, who's her character, mm -hmm. had a YouTube channel for her adventures, what's a video that would go viral? <laughs> You're asking her to write a YouTube video concept on the spot, you realize. Wow, I love, so if Maya had a YouTube video, what is the concept she would do? I'm, I'm seeing some sort of vibrator ASMR situation. I'll be really honest, for some of my scenes, your girl had to practice before shooting. And I was like, what turns me on? It was an exercise of me being like, what? And I would like whisper things to myself before we shot certain scenes. You know, I was like, Someone returning my Tupperware. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, like things like that, that I was like, what things have really turned me on? Like, it's a, I would whisper a lot of things. So I think like a sexual ASMR would be like, my mom's proud of me. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> things like that, things like that, that were like, yeah. So I think it would be that. 
All right. Yeah, I'm hearing a little bit of method acting going into this. A little so bit. Had to, was there any things you were else? You, any other things you were trying for the first time that you had to like, you know, as as an off screen version of this character? Like, how did you prepare? I did Google a lot of sexy things. Um, sometimes a creative team and people would mention positions and toys, and I was like, cool. I'd go home and Google it because I had no idea what the hell they were talking about most of the time. Um, I had to learn different positions because there's a there's a scene about that in the thing. So it was a honestly to amend my previous answer of why this movie would be a success for me. It healed so much of my trauma. Honestly, this film healed so much of my personal trauma. So I don't care which critic or uncle is pissed because like it has changed my life. Honestly, I became so much more comfortable with my body. So I want to go back to my mom. Did help on the set of this film. She was a cultural consultant, and. An hour before I submitted the script, this is a true story, it was like 11 p.m. and I was about to submit the script and I had a moment of terror because I was like, I don't, I never told my mom about this movie. And so I FaceTimed my mom and I was like, mom, I know I'm 35 years old, but I need to ask you, do I have permission to do this movie? Um, and she said something so sweet in response. She said, are you okay doing the movie? And I was like, I am, and she's like, then I think it's fine. But then she asked me follow-up questions. <laughs> and one of them was, well, what's in the movie? And this was like, a, I was on, the top, clock was ticking, I had to submit the script. So the, for the first time in my life, in this five-minute FaceTime, I was like, Mom, we've never talked about any of this stuff, we've never talked about this, but like, there's a vibrator scene, there's a masturbation scene, there's a this scene, there's that scene, and she's just like, mm-hmm. And then she said two things to me. One thing she said was, well, I've watched American Pie. And I was like, Okay. She's like, I liked it. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then she's, and this is the final thing she said, and I was like, why God, why? She said, do you use a vibrator? And I was like, and that is the day I passed away. <laughs> and I've been dead ever since. But the point is that like my mom on set, me and her started talking about sex. She started to make sex jokes on set. Like it even healed our trauma together so like I, you should watch this and it could be the first movie you watch with your parents and you challenge each other not to cover each other's eyes like let this be the first film but um yeah it was really special that's gonna be our tagline doing it bring your mom 100 percent. yeah <laughs> bring your mom maybe your mom's never seen a movie like this honestly going back to age forget how young how old can they be bring your grandma she's probably never seen anything like this movie like give them the permission to also be like damn I didn't know. My mom is probably going to watch this and be like, I didn't even know I could enjoy these things, you know? So I think we should bring all, all of the people who have this trauma. All ages, over 18. Um, okay, Jenna would like... Talk about how we think that equality is a seat at the table. And for much of my career, I thought that. Get in the show, get the spot, get the role, you made it, you did it. And then when you get there, you're like, oh wait, still people aren't listening to my ideas, still people aren't taking me seriously, this table actually sucks. And that is very true of being a woman in comedy. Like, you'll get opportunities, you'll get the roles, you get the movies, and still every step of the way, someone's going to be there being like, mm, are you sure? I don't know if that's right, da da da, -da. And someone's going to want to be speaking on your experiences and speaking on your behalf. Having said all of that, you have to just be so passionate about what you're doing to the point where you are relentless. Like, if you're a little bit passionate, this is not going to work. If you're, like, a little bit committed and dedicated, this is not going to work. Anything in film, especially if you're a woman, you have to be so dedicated to the point where you're like, it doesn't matter what hater on the internet, what critic, what anyone says, my passion is greater than that thing. And it will be tested every single time. So really, I, the advice I can give you is when you go home today, really ask yourself, how passionate am I? And if it's not, like, the number one emotion you have, you got to rethink that because you will be tested every single day, honestly. Excellent. Um, Lara wants to know where people can watch doing it after South by Southwest. This is a great question. There's three screenings at South by Southwest. And then what you need to do is you need to go on the internet and you need to 
and post an I tweet. Oh my God, how, how retro. You need to post about how you would love to see this film so someone buys it. Because someone needs to buy this for a lot of money so that more movies like this can be made. That's the honest answer, is we're looking for distribution. So um, I, if, even if you're not free to come to the premiere or come to one of the screenings, please, from the bottom of my heart, if I can ask you anything, the hashtag is doing it movie, D-O-I-N, not doing, doing it movie. Use the hashtag, post about it. If you're on Letterboxd, review it. It all matters when we're trying to get distribution, so spread the word, and hopefully the answer to that question is going to be everywhere. <laughs> hopefully. Lil, did you ever test out humorous lines or jokes on people before adding them? To, sorry, before adding them to the film to see what people would laugh at the most? Elizabeth would like to know. We actually did. There is a joke in the movie that me and Polly disagreed on. It was a pop culture reference, and both of us are so freaking stubborn. Where I was like, my joke's funny, and she's like, my version's funnier. We mass texted people on our phone. No big deal, but my in the movie. Um, <clears throat> Can we take an informal poll here, actually, guys? All right, show of hands. Okay, you want to do this? You want to do this right now? Do this right now. You want to? Okay, okay. Right. <laughs> you don't bias the question, though. I'm not going to bias okay, anything. Right, I'm just cool. going to show of hands. hands. Everyone has to participate. Okay. Who in this theater knows what Scott Pilgrim looks like? Or who knows who Scott Pilgrim is? Or who it is? Okay, okay, okay. Who in this theater knows who Bill Hader is? <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> Mine is in the movie. <laughs> Mine is in the movie. But I still think the joke, well, you can decide. It's funny still. It's, it's still, still funny. funny. It's still funny. But you know what? But you need partners like this. <laughs> See, because here's another challenge. Let me tell you something. If any of you, or maybe you are, if you want to be talent or whatever, let me tell you one of the hardest things of this job is when you become kind of successful like I am. People don't call you out on your crap. One time I went on a set and someone literally told me, it's okay if you're late. It's okay if you don't do what they want you to do. Like you're the talent. Someone has literally told me that. You, they, people try to melt your mind into turning into a diva and turning into like a person that doesn't want to do work. You need people like this that will call you out and be like, no, I'm challenging you on this. Like you gotta do what you say you're gonna do and you gotta be a freaking good person. And my team, every person that has interacted with my team this week has said the same thing to me. Your team is freaking amazing and they're really, really good because they're good at their job, they're nice people and they call me out on my ish. If no one around you is challenging you and questioning you, Get better people around you. Honestly, that is a number. That is a piece of advice I can give you too. We are recording this, right? I can <laughs> reference this whenever I need to in the future. Correct. Great. Great. All right. One last question. Okay. What is next for you and Unicorn Island Productions? So our entire mission at Unicorn Island um, is one to sound like professional adults, which is why our name is Unicorn Island. Um, but it is to create content that is really entertaining, is really enjoyable to laugh, funny. You know good entertainment, but that has a message. I'm not in the business of making any content that adds noise to the world just for the sake of adding noise. I want there to be some social messaging, some impact, some culture that could be changed. So leaving the world better, changing culture for the better in some way. I think storytelling and entertainment is the best way to do that. And so we have a slate full of TV shows and films that we're really excited about that hopefully are like amazing and the good message is lathered in sugar and other good stuff, but like that makes you think. Any one project in particular you want to talk about? Uh, really, in the last 30 seconds, I will say the next dream project, investor, the next dream project that I want to invest in that has to have a big, bigger budget than this one, is um, bigger, bigger set pieces, is um, it might, I have a group of aunties who I'm obsessed with. My mom is part of them. I'm obsessed with my aunties. I love them so much. They literally call themselves the fun gang. They have a WhatsApp group called The Fun Gang, and they are unlike any Indian auntie I've ever seen on screen. They take shots, they tell sex jokes, they grind on each other at parties. I'm like, this is the movie I wanna see, so I wanna make a heist movie about The Fun Gang. So, isn't that bomb? With a group of aunties. With a group of aunties. I don't even need to be in it. I just want a group of older aunties and for them to finally be the main character they deserve to be. That is what I want. Thank you so much for being here, y'all. Please support the film. Appreciate all of your support. Appreciate you taking the time. Polly, amazing job moderating. Great job. Thank you. Appreciate y'all.
Kelsey right here with South by Southwest. I'm on the red carpet for the premiere of Sasquatch Sunset, starring Jesse Eisenberg and Riley Keough. Y'all are from Austin. How does it feel to bring this film to your hometown? It's an honor. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, we've been working with the directors for like 20 years, and I think this is our fourth film together. They're and awesome nights as well. Yeah, and so it feels amazing to be here right now, just together, like presenting this to, in front of friends and family and, and everybody. So. And it's beautiful theater that we love so much. Yeah. Um, what is the process like when you're composing a piece like this that has seemingly no dialogue? We get in pretty early. We get a script. Um, sometimes years in advance. Uh, in this case, we, we had a script for this film for a long time and uh, just started with, uh, I think the first directive was 1970s pastoral nature documentary and that's, um, that's where we started. Well, thank you guys so much for chatting with me and I look forward to seeing the film. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You're wearing a huge suit and prosthetics for this entire film. How do you adapt your acting to something like that? Um, I, honestly, I was that's what I've done most in my career as a, as a little person. We're mostly cast in costumes and, and stuff like that. This was more of a departure because it was such an emotive role through the, the makeup. Um, a lot of times, like as little people, we're, we're put in costumes that, that completely cover our faces and we, we aren't seen. Um, and so that, that, was, that was the real challenge, I think, is like finding out also how to emote as this creature between an ape and between a human and, um, and, and, and have it come through. Yeah, that sounds like some really hard circumstances to do. Fog it up a little bit. <laughs> We're a little humid here in Texas. Yeah, it's morning in Austin, right? Um, my next question, what was your favorite on-set memory? Um, there's a scene where I get to... Uh, destroy a campground and it was maybe like probably the most difficult day for the, the crew but it was the most fun day for me because I could just be rambunctious and rough and like destroy all of these human objects and it that, that was a blast well thank you so much for talking to us I look forward to seeing this film awesome. thank you I'm with Jesse Eisberg cast of Sasquatch Sunset I'm curious how did they pitch you on this project Yes, I've been friends with the Zellner brothers who made the movie for, you know, 15, 20 years. And David, uh, David Zellner told me, um, I want to send you my new script. I said, I can't wait to read anything. He's like, well, I want to send it to you to act in. I said, fantastic. I, let me, I can't wait to read it. And he said, but I just want to tell you, it's, uh, you're not playing a human being. And I was like, oh, all right. All right, so just send it to me. I'm happy to read because I love your writing. And I planned on not being in this particular thing. And then I read it, and in two pages you realize, oh, not only is this... Uh, a good acting role, but this is a phenomenal acting role. Like it's, it's you know, you don't see our faces, and yet it's as emotional, as funny, as human, um, as like any character I, I would get to play. So, because you're wearing such heavy prosthetics and costumes in this film, how do you adapt your acting to those circumstances? Oh, thank you. That's a really astute question, and I suppose that you have to overact a little bit. I did these animated movies called Rio, and I realized like while I was recording in the sound booth, I have to like overact, I think I'm not used to com or comfortable doing, um, in order to like, you know, make sense of what this is, because it's just my voice. And this was a similar thing, like, you have to express yourself like times five in order to convey the thing. And all of my acting training and experience tells me not to do that stuff. I have like a sensor, and so you have to like kill that sensor in order to, you know, uh, convey the correct sense to an audience. Okay, I'm with Nathan Zellner, director of Sasquatch Sunset. What, how did this story come to mind and what made you guys want to tell it? I mean, David and I have just been fascinated with Sasquatches and Bigfoot lore since we were kids. And it was always, you know, like the, the footage that you would see, um, the encounters, you know, the tales were always from a distance and these blurry figures. And we just thought, you know, we just had a lot of fun thinking about what Sasquatches do in their own environment when nobody's looking and in their natural habitat and so David just started writing this script and it turned into you know from silly things that they would do natural things that all animals do to like this really poignant family drama as well so it's, based off the trailer alone it looks like a blast oh yeah it's, it's been it's been a lot of fun watching it with people it's it's a hard film to uh, 
um, it was it was it was a hard film to get off the ground. We're just happy it's it's here and people are like really responding to all the different, you know, it, it's got humor and, and some slapstick comedy and then a lot of poignancy and, and pathos and people are really connecting with these creatures that we made, which is that means we've done our job well because we we wanted them to to be real creatures and not just be, you know, like people in rubber masks. And you're from Austin, correct? correct. Yeah. What does it feel like to have your movie come to your hometown for a premiere? I mean, I, ever since I've moved here, you know, David's been here a little bit longer, but um, I think I've been here over 20 years, and this Paramount has been like, you know, the, the church of every film geek in town. I mean, we've seen so many movies here. We've played here a few times, and, and it's, it's, it's a really special screening. Just to see your, your film on, on the marquee is um, quite an honor, and it never gets old. <laughs> We're really excited to have you guys, and I look forward to seeing this film. Thank you so much for talking awesome. with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. I'm with David Zellner, writer and director of Sasquatch Sunset. You are no stranger to Austin, and definitely no stranger to South by Southwest. Why do you think this film is such a great fit for South by Southwest? Um, well, uh, I don't know. The audience is here up for for something uh, new and crazy and and uh, so hopefully this delivers for them in that in that way and I, the paramount theater is my favorite theater in the world so it, we're so excited to be showing here this how do you tell a story with characters who have seemingly no dialogue um well it's, it's kind of the same approach that uh that with that'd be done like in the silent era you know just it was all through a visual just through through just uh on, on this, focusing strictly on the visuals, uh, just on their, the way we shoot it, obviously, and then and then just their facial expressions, and it was an interesting challenge to how to tell tell a story that way. Um, but it was uh, I don't know, it was really gratifying. It made me not want to use dialogue. Yeah, <laughs> again, so, yeah. pure body language. Uh, what are some of the films that have influenced you in your career? Um, well, this one in particular, I'd say 2001 was a massive influence. That, that influences everything we do, but this one particularly, the opening sequence with the Dawn of Man with the apes, um, that was a, a huge influence. But then, there, uh, you know, just in general, as kids, we were into ape cinema, uh, uh, like the early Planet of the Apes films and things like that. So, Perfect. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. I'm really looking forward to seeing this thank one. You. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for the premiere of Sasquatch Sunset. We've got lots more red carpet coverage coming for you throughout the week.
Hell yeah. Okay, now to the reason why you're here. Over a decade ago, we first invited this incredible duo to Austin, Texas, and they won the 2012 Grand Jury Music Video Award for their video, Battles, My Machines. Who knows that video? If you haven't seen that video, you need to go watch it. The idea of someone falling up an escalator is the most beautiful thing that you did not know you needed to see. Um, they came back to South by over the years, including in 2015 with their popular DJ Snake and Little Jong video for Turn Down for What? I know you've seen that one. And that won them their second uh, music video award here at South by Southwest. After that, they continued to redefine the indie space with their indescribable directorial debut, Swiss Army Man. <laughs> Hell yes. That, that really proved that absurdity and heart can really go well and hand in hand. Uh, two years ago, we had the incredible honor of world premiering the incomparable masterpiece, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Oh, yes. That was our opening night film for the 2022 Film and TV Festival as we returned from the pandemic. We watched as audiences returned to the theater, were in community, and were absolutely blown away by the awe-inspiring, genre-defying work of the Daniels. And we watched as Everything Everywhere All at Once became the first world premiere for, at South by Southwest that went on to win an Oscar for Best Picture. And we cheered along as Daniels took home the Academy Award for Best Directing, along with five other Oscars, totaling seven wins and 11 nominations for that film. And we here at South by Southwest are just grateful to have been cheering on these badasses from the start. One of the things that I love most about them is their generosity of spirit. Over the years, I've seen them prioritize building community and continue to give back to up and coming filmmakers through initiatives like Oh My God Everywhere and We Direct Music Videos, as well as their group of friends in their own community. And it's really, really rare to come across artists as kind and as credible as these two. And we feel so grateful to have been a part of their journey, and I'm even more grateful to call these two beautiful, caring, funny, creative, phenomenal, batshit crazy badasses my friends. Was that, was that too much? I hope not. <laughs> um, and it's just been exciting for us to watch Daniel's journey, and we can't wait to see what they do next and hear what they're going to talk about today. So please help me welcome Daniel Kwan and Daniel Shinert. Wow. Uh, Thanks, Claudette. Hello. Thanks, sir. Mic check, check, funny. check. Mic. Oh, wow. There's a lot of people in here. Um, thank oh you God. so much, South By. Claudette has become a, a, an old friend just because we've been coming to this festival for so many years. Um, it is honestly my favorite festival to come to because you just get to um, hang out with people and eat a lot, drink a lot, and the movies are also awesome. Um, how many of you guys, because we'd like to know our audience, how many of you guys are uh, here in the film section, film category? Film people. Film people, OK. Oh, OK, not that many. Okay. Okay. Music people? Music people. Oh. Okay. Oh, not, okay. not that many music Just like people. conference people, tech people. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, this is Okay, uh, other categories entirely. School teachers. Teachers, yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, uh, cooks, food people, chefs, service industry. Stay-at-home dads. There's one of you, okay. Um, so we've been doing this talk, and you guys can pull up the uh, keynote now if you want to. So we've been doing this talk. Uh-huh. How we pulled off everything everywhere all at once. People keep asking this question, and we've, uh, we've had fun. Um, but we've been doing it for two years, and we're kind of sick of talking about this movie. Um, <laughs> in fact, like, we did this exact talk um, at the Film Independent. Um, and it's a really good talk. You should watch it later. It's on YouTube. Um, we looked good. Yeah, exactly. We did it again at the DJ, but more with a VFX bent for people who are into that kind of stuff. Look it up. Um, I'm that... always on the left. Yeah, oh. Or no. Yeah, oh, right. I should switch okay, it. There we go. Yeah, exactly. That's a... <laughs> Um, and then actually, two years ago at South By, the day after our premiere of Everything Everywhere, we did something with our producers as well. Um, it's, it's been really uh, beautiful to teach um, other filmmakers what we've learned and learn from other people through conversation. Um, but we've honestly recently been really distracted um, because everything that we are trying to uh, teach people about how we made movies feels kind of like um, ancient history. Um, Anything that we, you would have learned today from us um, kind of feels like it could be obsolete soon. The how of it doesn't really um, capture what we need to be talking about right now, I feel like. And sometimes it's like scary to feel like people might be getting the wrong lessons, like, oh, you can have like uh, hire fewer VFX workers or, yeah. um, you know, uh, like uh, budget movies lower. Um, I just wanted to interject and say, Dan worked really hard on this PowerPoint presentation. I'm so excited to watch it. Uh, and I'm here as moral support and a hype man and comedic relief, and I want to apologize in advance if I throw you off track. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, uh, I like improv and he likes prep, so this is a window into our process. Here we go. Um, and so obviously there's a lot going on, um, and the question of how really doesn't feel strong enough, and really what we, I started realizing is um, we should be asking ourselves why. Why did we tell this story? Why did we talk about, um, why did we talk about all the things that we talked about that went into the process of making this film, Everything Everywhere, that somehow became like way more successful and way more beautiful than we could ever even imagine. Um, that being said, if you want to see the other talks, this is, this is a harder one to find online, so there's a QR code if you need it. Also, this one is pretty good as well um, for homework at home. Um, so the question of why, why do we tell the stories we tell? Um, and this is something that we've been struggling with for a very long time, um, basically our whole careers. And uh, you know, there are a lot of answers to that question. You know, is it to entertain us? Is it to heal us? Is it to connect us? Is it to help us simplify all the noise in the world? Um, Make our parents proud. That's one thing, yeah. My mom loves the Oscar, for sure. Impress um. love interests, <laughs> yeah. Um, and perhaps it's all these things. Um, but I think the question um, shifts uh, in times of confusion and chaos, right? Um, that's when you really realize how much of a fundamental need story is to being a human, to being alive. Uh, this is a quote from Philip Pullman, uh, the author. After nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Um, he is talking, uh, he's basically referencing the hierarchy of needs, this idea that, you know, if you don't have your food, shelter, physical needs, water, you can't get to the next one, which is safety, security, next community, feelings of belonging, and you move all the way up to the top to this place of self-actualization, which is uh, becoming the best version of yourself, but also understanding your place in the world and your meaning and your purpose. That's where I am. Yes, he spends most of the time there. I'm usually down in the uh, loving and belonging. Still haven't figured that out. <laughs> Just kidding. I love you, Kira. Where are you? <laughs> uh, I have a beautiful family, and they love me, I think. Um, <laughs> one of the things that was really interesting about looking at story through this lens of a, a, a real human need that is universal uh, is when you look around the world right now, it's really confusing. Our stories are all crisscrossing and smashing up against each other and contradictory. And with everything everywhere all at once, it's really important for us to try to capture that feeling. Um, I came across this uh, writer, Jamie Wheel. He's an, a neuroanthropologist. And he talks about uh, the meaning crisis we're in. He says that in moments in history when there's too many stories, too many counter narratives, no one really knows what to hold on to. There's no unifying uh, myth. Uh, you can move to one of two camps, either down towards nihilism, where you say, well, fuck it. I don't know what to believe. It's all there, it's all a mess, whatever. I'm gonna kind of disengage from that question. 
The other side you can go move to is fundamentalism, which is this place where you hold even tighter to the thing you believe because you need to protect yourself and protect your idea from everything that's trying to you know, infect your, your worldview. And what happens when you do that is that center, that normal, middle, median area starts to collapse. And with that, trust and coordination, all the things that make society what it is. And so this is obviously um, speaking to uh, Yuval Harari's like famous um, thesis of like homo, homo sapiens rule the world because it's the only animal that can believe in things that purely exist in its own imagination, such as gods, states, money, and human rights. And so stories, stories that <laughs> money, God. Um, so it becomes really clear that in times of crisis and times of confusion, the goal of stories sort of focuses us down um, to something far more simple and far more fundamental. Um, and we kind of want to talk about that. But to bring it all back down to earth and bring it back down to us, um, we wanted to talk first about how we found meaning and how we found purpose within our own work. Um, it's us again. It's us again. Um, Dan found this thing called Ikigai online a while ago uh, that we're probably going to um, explain poorly, but uh, it's really like resonated with us over the years as like a really simple metric to kind of like ask ourselves like, uh, why, why am I bummed out this week? Um, uh, and there's four circles that uh, have very kind of straightforward meanings. Um, yeah, and like the thing, the thing that's uh, worth noting is this is just a framework that we use that's very easy. Don't please don't go home and like fill in circles and try to like crack the code of how to make good art. That's not how you make good art. I mean, try it. You yeah. can try it. I mean, maybe actually maybe surprise us. You might make something yeah. amazing. Um, but this is usually where we would end our talks, and today we wanted to start there. Um, so this is uh, a really um, reductive, westernized version of this really beautiful concept from Japan called Ikigai, which basically is, is this search for fulfillment um, and purpose. At the top, you have the circle for what you love, the selfish things that you are really you know, running after, um, what you offer. That's sort of, uh, yeah, your history, your context, your, your talents, your skills, what, what you have been given on this earth. Um, next is what will get you paid. Uh, it's, you know, the starving artist does, uh, is, is fine, but like really if you want to be serving the world and serving your stories and finding fulfillment, you actually have to eat and you have to live. Um, and the last thing is what the world needs. Um, and this one is usually the trickiest one to talk about. Um, how many people here feel like in your everyday work you are finding a balance between these four things? Okay, a couple of you. Whoa. Okay, wow, fulfilled audience, I love it. They can, y'all can go. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> We never, we, we, we never feel this. this is, it's impossible, especially in the film industry, to find that balance. Um, of, oftentimes, this is usually what our life feels like. Um. We don't have a phrase for this. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. Guy key E. There you go. Okay. <laughs> We're good. <laughs> um, it's honestly, a life's journey to find where you, where, where you sit in these circles and find making sure that you're always in this balance. Um, I think that uh, like one of, one of the first examples I'll show you is, is, a, is a, a thing that we did that is like clearly just in the green circle of what we get paid. We so, got paid well. Um, and that was it. <laughs> yep. To shoot a, a commercial where people with dog heads go to a party with people with cat heads. <laughs> And then uh, sugary drinks make them get along. <laughs> so clearly, cool. clearly not something we loved. It's not, we weren't really good at it. The effects aren't even that great. And then um, who knows, maybe the world needed it. I'm not sure. I, I haven't gotten much feedback um, that was positive yet. Um, something in the red circle, something that was firmly just for us and literally no one else in the world wanted it or asked for it. Yeah. This is, this is our Kanye West music video we made for fun. Lights, stop lights, flashlights, spotlights, strobe lights, street lights. Turn up the lights again. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> for some reason that didn't get us paid. The world didn't seem to need it. <laughs> um, and then the, 
this last circle was like, you know, just really uh, meat and potatoes, what we have to offer, what was our backstory, or at least for me, I, I used to do this thing where I'd, I'd cut together all of my iPhone videos from that year into a little montage, and it was very personal, and it was very like just a fun exercise to see what kind of random connections I could find with my footage. Um, again, it was it was fun, and it, like, it, it showed off my editing skills and my life at the same time, but beyond that, it was, uh, I don't know. Though actually, uh, it, it ended up being really instructive, and we came back to it over right. and over over the years. But it started with just like, you know, an, an accidental art project. Yeah. Um, which brings us to the, the blue circle, which is, like I said, it is the hardest um, circle to really tackle because you know either you're way too earnest and it's a little cringy, or um, you might. Um, Mis, uh, be misguided and chase after something that is like really well intentioned, but actually maybe not the best for the world. It's it really right. or it takes two years to make your movie, and two years later your movie is tone deaf and yeah, useless. exactly yeah. right. Um, and so this was the only example we could think of. One time we nailed it. Turn down for what? But otherwise, we've never made anything useful. <clears throat> and so. Obviously, uh, it's hard, right? It's really hard. We've been doing this for about 15 years, and I feel like there's only one moment in which we really felt in the, po the pocket of these four circles, and that was for our film, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But you're not allowed to applaud for the movie again for the next four years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's enough. Thank okay, you. Okay, there you go. Get it out of your hey. system. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <You're not here. laughs> um, and the beautiful thing about this is I felt this even before the movie premiered, even before we got the reviews and even before the box office, I felt so beautifully fulfilled by the process and the final product and what we were trying to do. And um, I just want, honestly, I'm giving this talk because I want you all to experience it too, if you haven't. And I want you guys to find a way towards that, whatever it is, whatever freaky little thing you're trying to do in the world, I want you to be able to really um, sing those high notes um, and stretch, your, stretch yourselves to the full ability. And so we're gonna break down each of these circles with our movie in mind. And it's gonna be a lot, it's very dense, it's gonna be very fast, uh, but hopefully it'll wash over, to, over you in a nice way, kind of like our movies. Um, okay, I should have used this slide with the applause, okay. Um, but don't. don't. <laughs> First circle, what you love. This is the easy one. This is uh, the selfish, uh, beautiful fire that really draws you to something. Um, I call this the Quentin Tarantino circle because clearly Tarantino is only making what he loves and it is beautiful. Um, if you ever get the pleasure of watching a movie with him in the theater, he is set, he's sitting in the best seat and laughing at every joke louder than anyone else. And I, I, I love him for it. We got to see Inglorious Bastards that way, and it was, ama yeah, it was <laughs> really Amazing. Wow. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. When it's just in isolation, oftentimes you can really make something weird that no one else wants. And that's OK, there's a place for that, but it's not really going to bring you to this middle section of uh, balance. Um, and so for us, one of the things, really simple gut, it's easy. We love action movies, we love kung fu, we love just the old um, Hong Kong films, um, usually with the choreography from Yun Wu Ping. Um, this was something that we imitated early on. This was like us right out of college fucking around with, uh, yeah, with no money trying to imitate that thing. Um, but it's like easy to forget this part of the process too. Uh, and, and I find myself oftentimes like, uh, struggling to get excited about a project until there's something deeply immature and selfish and personal that I get to like touch on along the way and, I'm, and, and only then am I like okay I can survive the next yeah. few months or years. It's or, a marathon you got to give yourself these like little um, speed boosts. Mario yeah. Kart speed The movie boosts. was so hard but the fact that Michelle Yeoh was there made me work 10 times harder. Yeah. It was like oh my childhood hero's right there so I, I'm not gonna complain about anything you know. And so but one of the things that we, we realized for this talk is like taking these circles and pulling them into the blue circle intersection, the, the what the world needs, really produced a lot of really interesting stuff for us. Uh, and so one of the things we asked, like, hey, but does the world need another Matrix sequel? Probably not. Um, actually, I don't know. I really like the fourth one. I know not everyone does, but I was, I was into it. The fifth one's going to be crazy. OK, exactly. <laughs> We're going to direct it. That's not true. Um, <laughs> don't make that a headline. Uh, <laughs> we already did. <laughs> OK. And so this is really interesting, because look, we love The Matrix, we love all this stuff, but really, does the world need another action movie, or does it need a hug right now? And I think 
And we kept asking ourselves, like, when is violence the answer? And, right. and our answer was, like, basically never. Like, I, I, how, how do you make an action movie when you don't really believe in violence as an answer? And so right here in the middle is this beautiful intersection, this paradox that we had to really um, work at and try to reconcile. And that's where we came up with one of the fundamental building blocks of our film. It's what we call the empathy fight, this moment in which Michelle's character, Evelyn, is working her way up the stairs, doing all the same kind of fun action, dopamine hit kind of um, playfulness, but all for the sake of, rather than hurting their enemies, understanding them instead. Um, and that was this really beautiful aha moment that suddenly became something we were building into the entire film, trying to get to this, this moment. Yeah, so like, I love bringing up contradictions, because a lot of times we'll, we'll find a problem and it'll take us months to crack it, but then it'll become like, yeah, the North Star that we chase. So the whole movie was like, oh, how do we set up that fight? How do we set up empathy? Okay, I guess we have to have a character like Waymond who's nice. I guess we have to like have Michelle be extra uh, stubborn at the beginning, whatever. Um, and this is a, another similar thing. If you know our work, this is sort of our thing. We love just dumb, stupid things from the internet. Um, Shiner interned for Tim and Eric. Um, and so a that's Dumb and Dumber is genuinely a huge influence on us. Everything we write. <laughs> uh, but then obviously, like, we look at the movies out there and the ones that we really love and we really resonate with are the ones that are giving us something truly um, beautiful and trying to pull, pull away from all the noise and give us something quiet and gentle to really celebrate. Um, and so uh, we were like, okay, can we somehow do both, right? And this, is, uh, this has become one of our signature things. This is what we try to do with everything we do now. Um, uh, starring, you know, Swiss Army Man was a big version of this, but it's why absurdity is in all of our work is because it, uh, first of all, it, it just makes us laugh and makes us cry at the same time, but also I think it forces people to lean in because they're not expecting it, that it doesn't fit to a, a clean genre, and I think that's really beautiful. Um, so this paradox, this tension, is actually where we found our voice. And so again, seeing where these circles intersect, sometimes they feel problematic or they feel like um, roadblocks you don't want to go towards, but I say chase it, right? Um, and so one of the things we've learned from this specific intersection is that story can reconcile paradox. And this is something that I think art can do better than anything else, poetry, music, um, film, whatever it is. Um, when you take two things that are opposed to each other, it actually is really um, a generative, beautiful act of creation. Um, Another thing that it can do that we try to do with our film is like transcend the binaries. Even the fact that there is a this versus that is, is not how the real world works. And actually it's a little bit more three-dimensional, four-dimensional, and I think uh, the stories that we are drawn to um, tend to be the ones that successfully pull that off, where, you can, where both things can be true at the same time. Um, and then even that, the false dichotomy isn't enough, it actually, uh, <laughs> There's, there's, the world is just so complicated. Um, and so for our film, we were like, what if we made a, a very queer celebration that starred a homophobic, homophobic mother? Or what if we tried, tried to create an indie film that could compete with the blockbusters? What if we made a pacifist kung fu movie? These contradictions are really um, where the movie shines, in my opinion. And I think as storytellers, and I, I mean that for everyone here, whether you're a teacher or a cook or whatever, we, to be human is to be a storyteller. Chasing after those contradictions, that is where the universe is showing you the seams, and that's where the universe is asking you and calling you to go pl to play, to fix, to heal. Um, and I think that's, you know, some of my favorite movies are like that. Like the Barbie, like Barbie doesn't make sense. Like it's like big commercial for a toy company, but this beautiful uh, feminist manifesto that is so playful and dumb, and somehow it works. And like that, those kind of things are the things that are really um, only born from chasing after those those contradictions. What do you guys think of my new business idea? I was thinking about having these bumper stickers that say bumper stickers lack nuance. Yeah. And then it comes with like a set of 20 other bumper stickers that go under it where you talk about like what you care about but you acknowledge the other side and their humanity and talk about like, uh, anyway, like it would work best on big cars, I guess, which yeah. I'm not a fan of. But oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Another contradiction. You're going to have to figure out something Show a out. hand. Yeah. Should I make the bumper sticker? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, hey, okay, I'll sell like oh, it's 20. Just like, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Okay. 
Um, and the last thing it does is, it, if all else fails, if we can't find the, the beautiful synergy between the paradox, it forces us to sit in uncertainty. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the test of first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Um, this is something that I don't know if our movies do well yet, but we're working on it. Um, but there are so many beautiful stories that I know of just that leave me completely uh, without words um, because uh, words are not enough sometimes. Um, and I think that is something beautiful that we should be looking for. Oh, sorry. Ah, well, anyway, whatever. Um, uh, 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 uh. All right. Yellow circle. Yellow circle. What you're good at. Ooh, you are, sir. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> what you have to offer, um, I, I think like, uh, this is like, um, I, I think about this in film school terms a lot, like, like when, I, when we went to film school, like everybody wanted to be a director, and I, I kind of wish like a teacher had said at the beginning, like, um, not everybody is gonna like every job on set, and it's super important to experiment and figure out like, what, what do you have to offer? Like, what are you good at? Like, you might discover along the way that, like, uh, you really care about the details and the props and the sets a lot more than you like pitching and trying to, like, raise money or whatever. Uh, and it's such a beautiful moment when you realize uh, your, your superpower and yeah, your the space. fact that everybody has one. And yeah. it's not, instead of being a competition of who's the best filmmaker, it's, it should really just be, like, a journey of discovering what kind of artist you are. You know? Yeah, and one of the things that we realized pretty early on as a duo is, um, as a duo, what we offer is that we are constantly chasing after things that we do not know how to solve on our own. We're biting off more than we can chew. Um, um, this is partially because we have a combination of his background in improv, my background in animation. Um, we both come from the, the MTV era, I mean, post-MTV era of music videos when there was no budgets and you had to really just um, figure it out best you can with very little time, very little money. Um, and it made us uh, really good at being lazy filmmakers. Uh, we do a lot of fixing in post. We do a lot, we basically do all the things you're not supposed to do. Um, because we're the ones fixing the post, right? We're the ones who, are, who we have to deal with the consequences of those kind of things. But all of these are things at first we thought we were bad at. Yeah. You know, and it, it took time to be like, wait, I think us fixing in post is our power. And like, um, yeah, like, this is what's unique about us. It's okay that I don't love my screenwriting classes and I don't love like sitting and carefully nitpicking the dialogue apart. That's, that's okay, it's just not my strength. Um, and then lastly, you know, we, we were both like weirdos who, um, you know, I came from an Asian American family. Obviously that got put into the movie because that was what we had to offer. Um, but also I would always, uh, you know, I would steal my sister's clothes all the time. She hated it. And uh, Daniel was the only person in Alabama doing drag at the time. Um, <laughs> I was Miss Deep South in a beauty pageant there, and uh, they had the audience actually vote. We did the show 10 times, and I never won. Uh, <laughs> so maybe this is fun. not what you offer. Okay, that's fine. No, it's um, fine. But one of the things that we do as a duo is we are constantly surprising each other, and what's beautiful about that is if we can surprise each other, there's a pretty good chance we can surprise you, and I think that's something that's really, um, again, with the intersection of what the world needs, I think the world needs those kind of things that will knock us off our trajectories and really, um, show a new path through surprise, through wonder, through curiosity. Um, another thing that we're really good at and what we have to offer is we love and are good at organizing chaos and messes and um, we are maximalists. Oftentimes the common wisdom says to simplify everything and, and that is partially true, but um, I think the world is so complex and chaotic I want to hold as much as I can in, in our stories. Um, you know, this is... Uh, a music video about a father-son relationship that goes through time and, um, during a car crash, and it happens within like four minutes. And so just a lot of density in our work. This is a five character, um, your phone's ringing. Um, there's a five character, or there's a 10 character music video for the shins. Um, again, moving through time. It's like running through a mansion as yeah. you run through your memories, and then the house gets demolished, and then they try to, uh, in a silent film version, reconnect as the house falls apart. Again, very dense for, for just a four minute thing. Um, here's a short film where we took a bunch of um, rejected, yeah, interesting ball, woo, with the one person who saw it. Um, uh, it's about a very interesting ball. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but we took uh, five or six different stories that had nothing to do with each other, and they were, they were actually all rejected stories. This is him getting sucked up my butt. I, I heard you, Steph Sue. Where are you? <laughs> I heard that giggle. giggle. Um, and again, we were just like, can we, can we stick it all together in one thing? I don't know. Let's try it out. And I, I think it's sort of successful. Um, we're good. This is, this is really, very emotional. Um, 
<laughs> um, so, but that movie was also made like as far as what we have to offer, like yeah. with favors and friends and community and just like we just ran and shot at each of our friends' houses and yeah. and it turned out better than our big budget commercials turned out at the time and there was yeah. there was like a lesson in that. And, and so and this, this intersection is really interesting because. Um, rather than a contradiction, I found a synergy between what we had to offer, which was just complexity and, and depth and, and chaos. Um, and I, I came across this quote from Joseph Campbell um, from his Power of Myths series he did with PBS and Bill Moyers. And this is something that really stuck you out to me. You can't predict what a myth is going to be any more than you can predict what you're going to dream tonight. Myths and dreams come from the same place. They come from uh, realizations of some kind uh, that have then to find expression in symbolic form. And uh, the myth, the only myth that's going to be worth thinking about uh, in the immediate future is one that's talking about the planet, not this city, not these people, but the planet and everybody on it. That's my main. So he, he can, he basically, for those of you guys who maybe couldn't hear that, Really, the ending is he's saying the only myth that's going to matter in the, in the near future is the myth of the planet, the collective myth of the, the global you know, ecosystem, including all the humans and animals and creatures or whatever. Which, like, as a filmmaker is kind of, like, exciting to hear and then, like, so obnoxious and <laughs> impossible to be like, what? Like, I, I, how do you tell a story about eight billion, eight billion people? Um, but we were like, great, let's try. Let's see what happens. Um, let's try to capture it all. And one of the things that, uh, again, again, we, we stumbled upon another um, quote that really resonated with us. It was like, as we tried to chase that feeling, we were like, this is impossible and this hurts. And we came across this beautiful quote from Anne, Lin uh, Anne, Anne Murrow Lindbergh, who is a pilot and a writer. And she says, but just how far can we implement this planetal awareness? We were asked today to feel compassionately for everyone in the world, to digest intellectually all the information spread out in public print, and to implement in action every ethical impact ethical impulse aroused by our hearts and minds. The interrelatedness of the world links us constantly with more people than our hearts can hold. This was written decades before the internet was ever um, invented. Imagine what she would be feeling right now. Um, <laughs> you don't have to, because we're feeling it right now. Um, and so this, this was really like, okay, this is interesting. We're, 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 we're getting somewhere with this Joseph Campbell prompt. Um, I, and then I read this um, quote from Nate Silver's book, The Signal and Noise. He talks about information overload. He thought, uh, so Alvin Toffler thought our defense mechanisms would be, would be to simplify the world in ways that confirmed our biases even as the world itself was growing more diverse and more complex. And so this is how we react to this problem of our hearts not being able to hold it all. We simplify. We compress, right? And uh, obviously, we were seeing this everywhere. This is this. We started writing this movie around 2016. A lot was happening, um, and we were even shooting and editing around the pandemic. A lot was happening, and we could see the worlds just compressing each other and themselves into manageable um, stories to make up for the fact that there was no way they could hold it all. Um, and so. So it suddenly felt like a cool aha moment to be like, okay, we like maximalism. We're, we're good at putting too much in there. The world feels maximalist and like it's too much these days. Uh, it would be great to talk about the whole world, but it's also impossible and we become numb to it. And also when we do try to talk about it, we oversimplify it. And all of that became kind of like the prompt of like, okay, that suddenly that's our take on a multiverse film, which at first scared me and did not sound like a movie I wanted to make, but yeah. then it became kind of personal, import, like useful, and uh, played to our strengths. Yeah, and I, I do think because of that, a lot of people were able to connect with the, the speed and fury of the film because this is what, it was a reflection of, of modern life. Um, so some things we've learned about this circle, um, stories can be a compression algorithm. And there are good compression algorithms and there are bad ones. You all know when the JPEG is compressed terribly because you're not really looking at the original image. Stories do this all the time. And we have to be really careful as storytellers. And again, no matter what field you're in, you are in when we are trying to tell a story because you never know what kind of, uh, you, you never know what kind of um, unconscious biases you're, you're building into the algorithm. Um, oh yeah, there you go. For those who don't know. Um, Einstein kind of speaks to this. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. 
Um, I found this really beautiful quote from Monique Wittig, who is a the French feminist writer. She says, it is the attempted universalization of the point of view that turns or does not turn a literary work into a war machine. Universalism has the power to reduce, to silence, to excommunicate, to consign to oblivion. And so this was really interesting because this butts up against this idea of a global myth, right? The global myth, like I was chasing after this global myth and I realized uh, how wrong it was. Um, this is the kind of thing that could really um, do a lot of danger. I mean, I, anyone here who was a woman or queer or per person of color experienced this in the 90s and early 2000s. This is, they did that study where they found if you show TV to kids for you know, half an hour, everyone left feeling worse about themselves unless you were a white straight man um, or yeah, whatever. It, Obviously things have changed, um, but there is still, it's still happening every day and we have to be super aware of, of what our compression algorithms are doing. Um, and there is one other way of looking at the global myth that I've, I found very helpful, and that is through the idea of an ecosystem. Um, thousands and thousands of stories all interconnected, interdependent, churning against each other, sharpening one each other, contradicting each other, but still being held by this uh, web of interbeing and inter interconnectedness. Um, I realize- Underneath this is just, we talk about all the time that like, uh, one of my pet peeves is when stories are treated like they're just all great, like all art's great. Uh, but I think art can be so dangerous and such a powerful tool for good and for evil. And it's so interesting to look at the stories we're making and the things we're watching and consuming and trying to think about like, what's the collective direction this is pointing, like, and, and having these conversations, trying to create a healthy ecosystem seems like a really, yeah, it's a powerful approach. Yeah, um, and this is all just a really overcomplicated way of talking about the coexist bumper sticker. Um, I change, that's one of my favorite bumper stickers, yeah, exactly. for the record. <laughs> it's got nuance. <laughs> Ish. Ish. Um, I mean, here's the thing. There is deep, beautiful truth in it. Um, and it takes us storytellers to constantly be reminding um, the world of those truths. Um, another thing stories can be is it, it can be the thing that knocks us off our trajectories. Um, one of the beautiful privileges we've had with this film is getting to hear people tell their stories of watching it and what happened afterwards. Um, oftentimes we have heard stories of people saying that it literally changed their family dynamic. Um, we had one young man say that his father, you know, maybe a decade ago, um, disowned him for coming out as gay and he had not heard from him in years until this movie came out and his father saw the film and called him for the first time, and now they're working on it. And like, these are the kind of things that we can, no, you don't have to applaud. <laughs> um, we, these are the things that we forget as storytellers. We forget we have the power to knock people into new trajectories, into new life paths. And I, I just wanted to uh, remind our, all, of, all of ourselves that it's possible. There's this beautiful um, metaphor. Uh, NASA has this thing called DART. It's the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. And basically, it's summed up as, if in case there's an asteroid about to hit Earth, what is the smallest object with the least amount of force timed at the right exact moment that will knock the asteroid into another trajectory saving Earth? What is the smallest thing that can have the biggest impact? And it's really fun to imagine our stories hitting and colliding with our audience members, knocking them off of their tra trajectories at the right moment and the right time and how powerful that can be. Um, be practical, do the impossible. Because if you don't do the impossible, as I've cried out over and over again, we're gonna wind up with the unthinkable. And that will be the destruction of the planet itself. So to do the impossible is the most rational and practical thing we can do. This is Murray Bookchin, a social ecologist. Um, I think he was speaking in the 80s or the 90s about the trajectory the planet is on, how we are destroying the planet. And literally, if you follow the logical path, we will all die and we will destroy the planet. And so he's saying, he's, he's encouraging all of us um, to think impossibly and believe in the power of thinking impossibly. Um, it's really easy for us to get bored of this idea or like tired of this idea that story is powerful and, and story can change us. And, 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 and we often become numb to the idea, but when you really look at science and psychology and all these studies, you really see how um, stories and belief systems can change us. Like when you think about habits, uh, one of the first and most powerful things you can do to change your habit is to literally change your identity, change the story that you tell yourself about yourself. Um, you think about the placebo effect. The placebo effect, lots of people think of it as a, a way to look at a gullible people who take a sugar pill and get their body changed. But really, if you reframe that as, wait, these people believed a story and they were able to affect their bodies um, to some degree 
to the uh, to some degree in a similar way to people who are taking like a, a pharmaceutical drug that costs hundreds of billions of dollars to uh, develop. That is magic, that is powerful. And like we are not really tapping into that, or we're not, I, personally me, even before this movie came out, um, I, I had started to lose faith in the, the ability of stories. Um, this especially is true for, um, I've been thinking a lot about some of my friends who have been moving through the step, 12 step program. Um, addiction is the hardest trajectory to knock yourself out of. And uh, I've had a friend recently move through it, and he was telling me about how interesting it is, um, but especially he was talking about how, like, we were talking about how, oh yeah, 12 step program, yay, there's 12 steps, I'm not gonna read them all. Um, they did a recent study, because it's, it's a sort of controversial thing, but they did a recent study at Stanford, they, they collected uh, 40 or 50 studies about addiction, and they found across the board in every single one, the 12 step program, even though it wasn't perfect, it was more effective than any other of the, um, uh, techniques that they used. And they attributed it to the community building aspect of it, and I think that's really important. But one thing that my friend pointed out that was really hard for him that ended up being really powerful was first step is accepting you have a problem. Second step is, and again, it's a little controversial, came to believe a power that was greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. This is uh, really hard for secular people who grew up in liberal households. My friends struggled with this. Um, but they said, you don't have to believe in God, you can believe in your ancestors, you can believe in nature, you can believe in the stars, something. Just tell yourself a story that is bigger than you and so that you can connect yourself to something bigger, stronger than yourself to knock yourself out the, off of that trajectory. And I, I just wanted to share that because it's, it's, it's something that I've been really thinking about lately um, and how beautiful it is. Um, all right, how are you guys Let's doing? talk about getting paid. How are you getting paid? Okay, yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, so this one's interesting. You have to be careful with this one because all the incentives are already pushing you this direction, right? Everything is moving towards this direction. And also, you know, like I said, we do need to live. We need to survive in order to um, be fulfilled. But, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and so we, we try to wield that responsibility very carefully <laughs> in all our work. Every, every day we wake up and we're like, what's the responsible thing to do? <laughs> he be he begged for this role. This was I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> he, he hates that joke. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we realized early on is uh, we were viral filmmakers. We came out when YouTube and Vimeo were first starting, and so we were writing the algorithm. This was before anyone even knew what the algorithm was. No one even understood. That's how we were being shown the content in the order that we were being shown. Um, but we felt it, and so we, you know, this is a. Video. One of our early projects was people skateboarding on dogs. Um, uh, there's, there's not a moral, <laughs> but the internet liked it. Um, even before we graduated from college, the way that we um, worked through it was we would uh, submit our work to commercial contests. I don't know if they still do these, but like basically it was free labor from college students um, to make commercials for them. And if you're lucky, you win a couple thousand bucks. Um, so uh, I won. We don't need bowls anymore. This is my dibs commercial. No, 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 no. no. Danny, what are you doing? I'm destroying our bowls one by one because I bought dibs. Um, that doesn't make any sense. And I, I got understand. paid, but uh, you see, dibs aren't normal ice cream. For the record, I, dibs, with your dibs hands. are just fine. <laughs> Support your local ice cream. You also bought yeah. cereal and milk. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Those need bowls. So anyways, the algorithm was something that we were subconsciously chasing and basically being trained by. Um, we were like subconsciously um, this, having this Pavlovian response with the algorithm. And it led us to do a lot of commercials um, that, were do that did well and made us a lot of money. I was able to uh, pay off my student loans, which I know is a rarity and a blessing. Um, yay! <laughs> um, <laughs> forgive student loans, please. Um, yeah. But also, we, we realize now, because we've all been steeped in the internet for a generation, how dangerous it can be. Um, if you guys don't know this man on the screen, his name's Nakato Avocado. He was a vegan influencer who loved playing the violin. And within a few years, he became this man. Um, he, he decided to become a mukbang uh, influencer, and he is eating himself to death slowly because each video gets 2.6 million views. Um, this is obviously worst case scenario, or one of the worst case scenarios, but it's become a thing, a rage bait, where people purposely make things the wrong way. Um, Do y'all know this word, rage bait? 
It's, you'll see it everywhere online. Like they, if they make you upset, you'll engage. So you'll just see someone like mispronounce things, make something wrong, say something bigoted or stupid, and that's, that'll get the click. It's the um, algorithm. And so everyone's chasing it. You know, it's literally led to death. Um, there's a cinematic version of it, um, which, uh, you know, it's fun to talk that about. That could have been us. We were on our way. <laughs> yeah. Like, dogboarding is a fast track to human yeah. centipede. <laughs> Gateway drug. Uh, um, so we did, we did, again, morally responsible things. Um, like turn up for what? Yeah, um, and, but this is why this intersection is so important because you can get pulled by this incredibly strong magnet, this incredibly strong vortex if you're not careful and you don't look at this intersection. And, and so for us, um, with all of our work, but especially everything everywhere, we're like, okay, can we make sure that we are making something that is really personal and indie within the film world that nor the kind of things that are getting harder and harder to make, but can we also infuse it with the stuff that was really popular at this time, you know, all the way back in, 2022 superhero movies were popular back then. Um, and it paid off. Um, we were able to actually make some money and for the company and also open a lot of doors for other filmmakers who are trying to make weird stuff to prove to financiers that like this stuff can actually be uh, fiscally responsible. And we managed to like pay our cast and crew better than we had ever been able to on you know a personal project. And so even before the movie came out, they, yeah. It felt so good, and that's like another part of this is like, you know, for 10 years we were asking so many favors, probably a lot of you are asking so many favors, and that's, that's not rare, but it's important to ask yourself like, why, why, like what can I change to make everybody have a living wage on my projects? And so one of the things that we've learned about um, over the years, but especially with everything everywhere, is uh, story can and should try to meet the audience where they are. And what I mean by that, you know, oftentimes people are say, like, don't think about the audience. Uh, and, and there are phases in which we shouldn't think about the audience. But every now and then, just turn on that brain that, like, I want to say market research, but there's this idea of human-centered design, which I know the tech world is probably very familiar with. We don't talk about this stuff in, in, um, as directors ever. Um, but you're, you're empathizing with your audience. You're putting your, your, shoes, your feet in their shoes and trying to re really see where, they're, where they are and how they're going to use your product, right? Um, and so we really had to look at where our audience was. Um, we were losing our attention spans, right? We are uh, very depressed. We are exhausted. No one wants to watch movies because they want to watch mindless binge watching shows. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not pointing fingers. This is a screenshot of one of the video games I've been playing recently. Um, <laughs> and this is in real time. I didn't speed this up. Uh, I have ADHD, so you know, it's, I have a little bit of an excuse. Are you winning there? Yes, I'm doing so good. <laughs> I'm s that see that little purple thing? It's about no. to reach the end, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose. It's going to be the worst. Okay. Um, and so we really designed this thing to give audiences something uh, fun and playful to protect them from all this other stuff that is basically the everyday life, so that, so we have the genre stuff, we have uh, the stupid viral things that you know, genuinely made us laugh, famous people, um, stunt casting kind of by accident, but kind of amazing. Also that we could capture something really honest and truthful about today and uh, give, them, give the, our audiences a, a real connection to us as a filmmaker, something very genuine. Um, and it might feel kind of um, cheap to hijack algorithms and uh, things like that in order to uh, you know, make art, but I would argue we've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, the hero's journey is the first narrative algorithm, right? It's the first time where we were able to figure out the perfect sequence of events that would lead to a satisfying conclusion and a satisfying feeling. Um, and uh, so in some ways I feel like in times of crisis and confusion, um, maybe it is our responsibility to make things as fun as hell so that we can reach as many people as we can. Um, so that's why we put the butt plug in there. We did it for your, your own good. It was for your own good. Um, so last circle, last circle, what the world needs. How are you guys feeling? Overwhelmed? Overwhelmed? Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we've learned um, about caring about the world, and you've all been feeling this as well, is how quickly you can burn out. Um, Jamie Wheel has, again, the neuroanthropologist, talks about this problem where for a very long time we've been working under this idea of 
needing to think globally and act locally. And it's so well-intentioned, but it's killing us, right? We are so anxious, we're so paralyzed, we can't do anything because we're thinking globally all the time. And he, he offers up a, a, an alternative. Grieve globally and thrive locally. Um, to grieve is not to ignore it, it's not to say, it's not to um, you know, run away from it, it's actually to hold the thing that you're losing and really cherish it and remember what is so special about it. Um, and if you can do that while also thriving locally, I actually think that is what the world needs, for you to be fulfilled, for you to become the best version of yourself, for you to thrive. And this is something we take to our film sets, um, this spirit of thriving and fun and connectedness. These are like warm-up activities and celebration days and like uh, kind of crew morale stuff that we did on set, which I genuinely think made the movie better, but I kind of didn't care. Like, because we the more we talked about it, it was like, this is just matters. I want to finish the project and be proud of the process, yeah. regardless of the product. But it made the product better, so mm -hmm. it's a win-win. Um, and just to give credit where credit is due, this is something that Shannon cares a lot about, and he puts a lot of attention to the process of how we do it um, and how we can try to find ways to thrive locally um, while we're stressed out of our minds because it's still hard. It's still impossible. Um, something that's been really helpful for me to use when I'm thinking about the, this dynamic of thriving locally um, Tyson Yunkamporta, he's an Aboriginal New Zealander who um, he's a thinker, writer, scientist, and he, he shares in his, his book this concept from his culture called The Lookout. Um, your lookout is a person's appropriate sphere of influence and accountability. Your lookout encompasses all of your reasonable obligations and activities within your pairs, groups, and wider networks. Basically, it's about tending your garden and just your garden. What is your responsibility? What can you have access to? What is, what is um, yeah, what has the universe given to you? And uh, when you start off, it's pretty small, and that's okay. Make that small plot of land as beautiful as you can. Uh, when you get to, uh, Stand on stage. Stand on stage like that. It becomes, the garden becomes much bigger and the responsibility becomes much bigger. Um, and what I love about this is just imagining an interconnected ecosystem of all of our lookouts slowly covering the world in a way that allows us to all thrive locally. Because if everyone's thriving locally, eventually the globe takes care of itself. So. So that's it. There it is. No. It's really simple. So take all of this and put it in the box. Like, store it away somewhere deep in your memory. Don't, don't hold on to this. Um, like I said, you will not be good, making good art if you're trying to fill, box, uh, fill, fill circles. Um, oftentimes what we do is we use this rubric when we are stuck or lost or feeling like something is really missing in, in what we're working on. Um, and, and it's been such a useful tool for us to be able to pull ourselves into interesting places that feel uh, more truthful, more honest, and honestly more fulfilling. Or pick the next project. You know, right. Sometimes so, we'd do something to get paid and be like, I have to do something selfish right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, which brings me to this, this, uh, this question that um, I've been we've, been, we've been asking ourselves our whole careers, okay? Like, first of all, how many of you are here uh, because you're hoping to learn something useful that might help make you better at your job? Okay. Heck, yeah, we're all overachievers. Um, and how, how many of you, is, is it because of how uh, desperately you need to be good at your job? Yeah, okay, some of you guys don't want to admit it. Okay, that's good. Um, because you've tied your self-worth to your job? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, okay, now, now you guys are getting excited. Okay, I saw some ha very excited hands. Um, deep down, um, you feel like if you don't get really good at this, if you don't get as good as possible, that you will not be worth anything um, and that you will not ever feel fulfillment. Um, this is something that I've struggled with my whole life. Uh, I was undiagnosed ADHD and that really destroyed my self-esteem um, for until I was like well into my 30s. And uh, I think it's part of the reason why I, I needed to be as good as I could be. And I think that's why you're all in this room as well. You are all good at your jobs. That's why you got sent to this place to learn things and become better. Um, but somehow we don't ever feel fulfilled. I mean, some of you. I, I think actually you guys have left. The fulfilled people have left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, which prompts the question, like, why is it so hard? Um, why is it so hard to find fulfillment today? Uh, I feel like there is a story that the system tells us. 
And that is the story that we are only worth what we can contribute to someone's profit, right? To someone's growth, to someone's um, accumulation. Uh, and this story didn't just happen magically. Um, it co-evolved with our society and co-evolved with our technology and our innovations. Um, generally, our relationship with innovation is that it's all pretty great and that anyone who stands in the way of it was kind of dumb, like dumb Luddites who didn't understand what they were doing. And while not all of that's completely wrong, we want to provide a bit of a counter narrative to show something that is deeply important, important that is being sacrificed every time our story changes, every time we, are, um, we move ahead in society. Um, and it's often most evident in the stories we tell ourselves. The, th the thing about innovation is it gives us things more efficiently with more convenience, and that opens up society to do more things, to have more things. But oftentimes, the process tips over, and we become too good at it. There's too much convenience. And with too much convenience becomes disposability. So, and, uh, in, in order a way, I'd say like every convenience creates disposability. Yeah. Like you're going to take whatever that thing is that you made shorter, faster, and you're making it less valuable. You're making it a, a something to get through, something to get past. And in order to make something more disposable, we actually have to change the relationship with the world around us and change the stories we tell. Like the earliest cultures, a lot of them all around the world believed in animism. And for those who don't know, that is this belief, this story that they told themselves that every living creature, rock, tree, river had a soul, had a life. And a lot of modern people you know, kind of laugh at that and think it's a little silly. But regardless of what you believe, that story was actually really beautiful because it kept things in balance, right? There was this really beautiful uh, relationship with the world around them. Um, when we invented agriculture, we couldn't just um, force an oxen to drag a plow because that oxen had a soul. And so we changed the story of the oxen and said, oh, actually, we're not all beautiful, soulful things. We're gonna lower the value of this one thing. And you see this happening slow, through, slowly throughout history. Every new achievement, we've done it to the trees. The trees are, are, are incredible, beautiful things that provide food, water, shelter, um, cooling the earth giving us the oxygen to rebreathe, and we've reduced their story to $70 of lumber at Home Depot. Um, and like I said, some of this is necessary. Even the oldest cultures who believe in animism would kill, would chop, chop down trees, but there is a narrative where there was grieving and there was uh, respect and there was gratitude, and that has been lost. And we have slowly created an entire world where everything is disposable. Our shoes, our cars, our phones, um, we're all culpable, we're all responsible for this. Um, but the worst part is we've even done it to the people. And these norm devaluing stories, they become no normalized and compounded through generational amnesia. And we slowly move the threshold of who is valuable and who isn't. Um, for instance, modern capitalism and, work and, the cap and the capitalist workforce only works if we are able to compel people to work because we can't force them to work. And so we had to change the story we told ourselves and say that your value is your job. You are only worth what you can do. And we are no longer beings with an inherent worth. And this is why uh, it's so hard to find fulfillment in this uh, current system. The system works best when you are not fulfilled. Which brings me back to AI. Wow. <laughs> what? You guys love AI, clearly. Oh, yeah. And yeah, so now we're going to talk about why we love AI and why everything's going to be fine. Um, no, here's the thing. There's going to be a lot of people who are saying how amazing AI is. And it, it is. There, it's magic. It's probably going to solve cancer. It's probably going to give us a lot of climate solutions. This is a powerful thing. Um, but I'm really terrified of what this new story we're going to have to tell ourselves in order to accept this new convenience, this new progress. It's terrifying, right? It's to imagine what this, what this technology will do within this current system, within this current incentive structure. This is the same system that brought us climate change, income inequality, and the general lack of gratitude and understanding of our worth and the worth of, of those around us. Um, and if you're anxious about AI while well, everyone is saying, chase it, get ahead of it, it's because you know deep down, oh, we're next. 
most of us are next. Even if the jobs aren't going to be lost, the value of the job will go down, right? And again, like I said, it will slowly be compounded and normalized until we don't even realize it, and we're now at a place where everyone is disposable. Um, we are ghosting each other constantly, firing each other. There is no um, longevity between uh, employees and employers, or even um, friendship. We are now in a place where we are more lonely than we have ever been. Um, and we all understand it's because of the technology, the social media, the ways that we are now, again, re rewriting our story. And so, one of the things I'm realizing we all have to be doing as storytellers is we have to really rewrite the system story and center what is truly valuable. And that might be different for everyone. For me, I really believe it is our humanity and the connection that we have to our communities and our environment. And it might feel kind of crazy to think that our little short films or our little poems might actually make a dent in the, in the crack in the system. Sometimes it feels like throwing little rocks at, at this giant brick wall. Um, but we have to remember that the systems that we have now are just fossilized stories of the past. And as this current fossil is crumbling and showing its crack, we actually have an opportunity to rewrite the stories and rewrite the systems for tomorrow. We have to undo what the stories have done to us, to our value and to the value of everything around us. Um, and so I also want to say, we're not saying don't use AI. I, I don't believe in dogmas. I don't believe in that kind of puritanical um, lifestyle. It doesn't work. AI is here. It is going to be rapidly um, deployed in every aspect of our lives. Quan loves it. He uses it all the time. Uh, he's going to go home and apologize to ChatGPT later. I know. <laughs> um, but we talk about if you're going to use it, when you use it, like really try to think about why you're using it. Are you trying to use it to create the world you want to live in? Are you trying to use it to increase value in your life and focus on the things that you really care about? Or are you just trying to like make some money for the billionaires, you know? Uh, and, and if someone tells you there's no side effect, it's totally great, get on board, I just want to go on the record and say, that's terrifying bullshit. Yeah. That's not true. Uh, and we should be talking really deeply about how to carefully, carefully deploy this stuff. And check in on your friends. Like, if your friends are on chat too much, like, check in on them. Go on a walk with them. Prove to them that humans are fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the good work. Um, yeah, again, reconcile the paradox. There's, there's, th we are living in an age of paradox, and we should be chasing it and really looking at why it feels so wrong to use AI, but also how are we supposed to survive in this, this, uh, this current system and current environment that is going to basically um, have AI everywhere. Um, and so to summarize, to end us off, whew, we're, yeah, we're doing good. Um, we're almost done. Why did we write everything everywhere we, all at once the way we did? Um, and the answer is we did it to save ourselves. Um, every story and every art that we, we make is an active act of saving ourselves and our value from a system that wants to devalue us um, and the people that we care about. Um, the problem is, of course, right now there's so much to, to, to be saved from. AI aside, like I said, there's the climate crisis, there's um, multiple wars, there's in deepening uh, polarization, loss of consensus truth, the list goes on. When we wrote Everything Everywhere, I was spiraling about our president, and I feel like I was losing my own empathy for so many people, you know, and trying to understand like, why, like how to make sense of this really crazy world and my parents' generation and myself. And so we dove into a project about relating with that generation and, and trying to build bridges, and uh, it, was, it was a healing process. And one of the things that I'm realizing now is, again, it's not just our work, it's all of our work. Um, this kind of collective rewriting of our stories. Um, I've been thinking a lot about something that Mary Jane Rubenstein has said. She's a philosophy of religion and science uh, professor at Wesleyan University. And she said that um, if you look at the 12-step program, what's fascinating about that second, um, if you look at that second step, uh, you can kind of look at the world through that. We are, we are addicted to a system. We know how to solve our problems. We understand what a lot of the solutions are. We just don't know how to actually have the will to do it. And so if you look at us collectively, we are on step one. We are finally, after decades, admitting that there is a problem. 
specifically to climate change, amongst other things. And now we need to be actively thinking about, okay, what kind of stories are we going to be telling to bring us into that second step? Um, we, need to there, believe, we need to believe in something bigger than ourselves. And that is each other. We need to believe that we collectively can build a new global, global e ecosystem of myths. That's why we're starting a religion. Yeah, you can. <laughs> got a t-shirt and everything, no. Um, but honestly, just finding a way to weave together all of our lookouts into an intricate network that is both somehow hyper-local, hyper-bioregional, but also super global and can contain the complexity, the chaos of the planet without reducing, without simplifying, in ways that can reconcile the pirate paradoxes so that we can meet our audiences where they're at, knock us out of our trajectory, and bring value, meaning, and fulfillment to every organism on this planet, but most importantly to you, the artist, the storyteller. Your fulfillment is the first step in helping the world find its own. So we are on stage humbly, naively, but joyfully inviting you to find your fulfillment by remembering your place in the world, the power you hold as a storyteller, and your responsibility to that power. We are asking you to remember why we all tell stories. We look forward to seeing what you tell next. Thank you, guys. Mark Duplass is an acclaimed actor, writer, director, producer, and no stranger to South by Southwest. He screened his first short film here in 2003. Is that three? Oh my gosh, and starred in numerous shows, including the Apple Plus series, The Morning Show. He is joined by the president of his production company and veteran producer, Mel Eslin. Please welcome Mark and Mel to the South by Southwest studio. Hi. How are we doing, you two? Good, man. Good, How are you? Yeah. Oh, I'm doing great, man. This is, I find it that that was a real reaction, not teleprompter, of like, like how long you've been doing this because it's that's crazy. Like, that's it's wait, insane. 21? It's 21 years ago. 21 years ago, man. And now here you are yet again doing your thing. It's yeah, in, Same it's thing, just gray hair. I, <laughs> you see very relaxed on the couch right now and I'm really feeling <laughs> it, both of you. It's pretty comfortable. Yeah, no, right? Right? Yeah. And it has to be. And I love how I asked you, oh, how many have you done so far in life or what? And yeah. that just speaks to <laughs> <laughs> how, today. how much of a veteran <laughs> that you guys are. But uh, starting with Mark, like you're here launching not one, but four independently, fi independently, independently financed and produced shows from Duplass Brothers that will be featured at the festival this year. And now I got to look at my notes because it's a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Penelope, The Broadcast, Riley Walker and Friends, I really like that one, and The Long, Long Night. Can you break down exactly what are you doing? That's a lot of it's things. A great, it's a great <laughs> question. Um, we're trying to do something a little different, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I think that... The concept of independent film has been around for a long time, you know, um, and I think the the way that independent film started was just there was a lack of a place to put these really interesting films uh, that were from underrepresented creators, mm -hmm. the kinds of stories that maybe weren't exactly as commercial as it might be obvious, and and they found their place in independent film. TV needs this now. Mm -hmm. So we had a really big boom in television. You know, we had peak TV and, and all these streamers came out and there were all these wonderful shows, yeah. but now they're trimming down and they're realizing this model is not sustainable. And what that means is really interesting, uniquely lensed television is an endangered species. Mm -hmm. um, and so Mel and I have started to realize that, you know, as we like 
take out our shows to pitch to studios. You know, everybody's like, no, we're not making that anymore. And then we started being insecure. We're like, what's going on? And we call all our friends and like, yeah, everybody's passing on everything unless you are going to be the next Game of Thrones. Right. That's what's happening right now. Uh, so Mel and I are stubborn. Um, <laughs> and so we're like, well, we're not going to let this happen. And we're not, we don't like to be bored. And we don't like to be bored. <laughs> um, and I always loved John Cassavetes who would, you know, use his money from the Hollywood stuff he would act in and, mm -hmm. and go make mm -hmm. his own stuff. So we're, we're, we're basically kind of tripling down on the independent film model and we're making full seasons of television yeah. on our own. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take them and try and find a place for them. It's really cool. Can you both talk to me about like, walk us through how pioneering a new way from, uh, a new way, a new form of this through development, production, mm -hmm. like talk to mm -hmm. me about like, the thought process, like what's the experience like, like, cause being the first to anything is often kind of like mm -hmm. difficult, right? So how is that going? I mean, it's not dissimilar, at least from the inception, it's not dissimilar from indie filmmaking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a little bit right. of a longer process mm -hmm. and uh, more shooting days, but for the most part, you know, it's just like, this is what we do. We go, we, you know, we move quicker. Um, we trust ourselves mm -hmm. and then now we just chop it up into episodes. Um, Part of that is a, the design of mm -hmm. this has to be something that can successfully be made cheaply. Right. Yep. You can't just say like, hey, I wrote Game of Thrones, let's go make this cheaply. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you have to write something. Like Room 104 was a show we did for HBO for years and mm -hmm. it's an anthology series all set in one motel room. Right. Um, and so like shows like that uh, can be the best versions of themselves actually on a lower mm -hmm. budget. So we have to identify those things. Yeah, okay. and those are shows that we've made and I don't know if those would get made nowadays and that's right. why we turned you know to just doing it ourselves um, but I mean as far as like what this is gonna look like at from this point on mm -hmm. I mean there is no ecosystem for this yeah, there's no map there's yeah no there's precedent. no map yeah. right this is where it gets confusing the making of it was pretty simple mm -hmm. and now it's like okay where are we gonna put these things and our and our hope is that you know the the big places, the Apples and the Netflix and the Hulus and the HBOs mm -hmm. see this and they say, oh my God, this is really, really good. This can cut through right. and it's not as expensive as a lot of the stuff we're making so right. they can take a gamble on it, you know? Mm -hmm. But we're also realistic that they, that might not happen. We might have to find an alternative mm -hmm. route to it. Right. But what's really fun about this kind of stuff is like, what happened at Sundance and South by Southwest in the late 80s, early 90s mm -hmm. was, all these films came, and then some of them get bought by the traditional distributors, and then there were these other beautiful films that had nowhere to go, and then a whole ecosystem sprung up around it. New companies sprung up around it because mm. they saw audiences love this stuff. They want this stuff. Right. So companies like IFC Films and Magnolia, they started to literally be birthed out of the need for these things. Mm. I'm not saying that's going to happen, and it's a different time now, right. but my belief is that if we don't double down and protect this type of storytelling, which I call the interesting middle, basically, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, it's gonna die. Right. Um, and I do believe people want this. I do believe people love Killing Eve and, and what Phoebe Waller-Bridge did. That's the stuff that's gonna go away, yeah. you know? Um, I may destroy you, like, oh, it's gonna be gone. Right. Yeah. That's, and so we have to protect it. I really believe it. Mm -hmm. So Mel, let's start with like one of the four, Penelope, mm -hmm. right? You started writing that at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. What, talk to me about what happened when you and Mark brought that to buyers when you were done with it. You know, I mean, it started as an idea that Mark had early pandemic just from watching these um, reality survival shows. Mm -hmm. And then we also both were wanting to escape and abscond to the woods and uh, throw away our phones. Uh, and so it kind of was birthed from those thoughts and feelings. Right. And, you know, we really actually didn't take it out too much. You know, we started to like dip our toe out there with it and realize, you know, it's, we were a little protective of it, I think yeah. is the best way to say it. When you want to make like a meditatively paced show about a young yeah. girl returning to nature, mm -hmm. there's not a really good chance you're going to make it through the development system yeah. and right. keep that intact. Yeah. yeah. And so we just, we, we believed just, in it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, you know, we said, let's, take this huge gamble and pay for something, maybe the biggest thing we've ever 100%. paid for. Mm -hmm. And then we we're like, what's the easiest way to do this? Mel, you go 
direct all episodes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it was I really don't have easy. To do it. You do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, you know, it'd be really hard to ask somebody else to work for free. Of yes. Course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I really enjoyed that one. I was telling Thank you, Mark, you, that I Thank enjoyed you. it. I watched the first one last night, and it reminded me a lot of a like kind of Into the Wild, but mm -hmm. like a coming of age totally. feel to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I was, I was really the score was like pretty fantastic. I was like. I think that, yeah. that Penelope represents sort of like the upper echelon of what we're doing mm -hmm. in independent TV where like it really is like a premium young adult show that can play on the big streamers, right. but, you know, and that was a, a big risk for us. But we have like a whole sort of stratosphere of mm -hmm. things like when you look at Riley Walker and Friends, it's like a follow documentary mm -hmm. and it's kind of a show like How To With John Wilson or, yeah. or Painting With John that's just like you know, a very slice of life documentary series about a musician who's coming to the end of his rope and trying to figure out whether it's worth it or not. And he just sits with a different musician every episode and they try to write a song or try and figure out why this thing that they love so much is probably going to destroy them. Right, you know? right. Um, yeah. And so that, you know, that's something that can be made a little more cheaply, and mm -hmm. so we're trying to find a kind of a range of things to do. Okay, yeah. I, li I like when uh, Riley was walking around saying, he was driving, he said, oh yeah, I've been to woods, crack houses, all because of this dang guitar. And yeah. like, <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> I was like, that's, what, that's yeah. literally what being a musician, like a uh -huh. you know, struggling musician mm -hmm. is like. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mark, in your book, Like Brothers, you wrote, and I'm gonna read this out, it seems that people like the Coen brothers have a specific vision of what their movies will look like from the moment they begin writing them, and then somehow are able to realize that vision and make those movies. We, however, are not the Coen brothers. Yeah. So can you describe like what your creative process is that's yeah, totally I mean, not the Coen you know, brothers? I would say there's a couple of different forms of that, but you know, when I'm at the helm of something creatively, I just have the inherent belief um, that um, I can't know best before I hit set. Mm -hmm. I can do my best to prepare, I can take some guesses, mm -hmm. but I believe that bad art is made uh, for people like me who are not geniuses like the Coen brothers mm -hmm. um, by sticking to your initial vision and not wavering from it right um, that you have to be fluid um, I hear that and, a lot. and I think that causes you know some consternation for some people creatively um, but we've made it a you know our sort of credo to work within limits um, and do the best that we can with it and so you know when you look at the array of TV shows we've made here, Sometimes that applies when Mel and I are at the helm, like Mel really is, like mm -hmm. the creator of Penelope. That's her baby, and Riley right. Walker is a little more of mine. But we have two other shows where we've kind of passed off the reins to mm -hmm. you know, some creators who would, would never have been given the opportunity to write, direct, and star in their own show if it had gone traditional development. It would have mm -hmm. been taken away from them. You know? right. Right. So in that case, we try to turn over the keys a little bit to them and just say, look, you know, you're being awesome. You're working for super cheap here. Mm -hmm. We're taking care of you and protecting you creatively and letting you do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and we help out a little bit along the way, but by and large, you know, it, we let them do their thing. And, right. and that's just, I don't know, I, I've just been taught over and over again in this creative process um, that you can't look at this as, as an empirical thing where each project you make is going to get better because you've right. learned more. Right. You got to get lucky and there's a lot of magic involved so you just have to be really attentive and really willing to pivot. Yeah, some of the best yeah. things in film and TV I feel like are accidents and yeah. it's just because they allow for that fluidity to just kind of, you know, just wish and wash and kind of like reveal itself as the creative process goes on. And it's hard on. to do that. It's hard to do that, particularly in, in independent storytelling because you're feeling the clock, you're mm -hmm. feeling like you got to get it done. but. We're unfortunately taught in film school uh, in a lot of ways that like a successful film means you shot all the pages you were supposed to shoot, mm -hmm. you made your day, you got all the coverage right, and then you go home and you feel like, yes, we got it, that was successful. But like we're not often taught that like sometimes it's over okay to go over schedule or like even cut a scene and make this scene even better because mm -hmm. you've got to make sure what you're getting is actually inspired. Yeah. Right, right. In 2015, and you guys were both talk, talk to me about this, like. You talked about the death of the middle class of, mm -hmm. uh, of film. What's happening for television? That's right, exactly right what's now. happening. Mm -hmm. Nine years later, yeah. here we are. It's mm -hmm. the death of, you know, I call it the interesting middle, but yep. that's it. The interesting yep. middle, that's pretty cool. It's, it's, di it's dying, and it sucks, and, but it's cyclical. Like, this happened in the music mm -hmm. business 30 years mm -hmm. ago, and we, this is just something that happens, and it's right. unfortunate, and um, I think we just didn't want to give up or wring our hands. Get um, caught in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that things do come around and they and they change and I think it's important to be part of the things you want to see if you right. can. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, as far as like 
you know, because you're doing what you can to kind of like save and protect the future of filmmaking. Uh, let's talk about like Tyler Perry purchasing like an eight hundred million dollar expansion after seeing like an AI generated video. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you like protect the future of the industry from something like that happening? I don't think we can. <laughs> <laughs> Very. I don't know. <laughs> and we don't. And we don't have. And we don't have Tyler's money or, or influence and all yeah, that yeah. And, all, and all that stuff. But like. You know, I mean, for me, we can't really know what what is going to happen with with AI, but mm -hmm. I think that you know the the more obvious threats are things like you know uh, job elimination, you right. know, um, right. and the below the line crew. I think that's something you have to be really thoughtful about, and we're yeah. constantly in conversation about what's the mm -hmm. right way to keep this ecosystem healthy, you right. know, yeah. and what is what Ethical does that mean? and sustainable. Yeah, yeah. and that's right. that's really. That's really confusing right yeah. now. Right. Well, in 2015, you also gave a very memorable uh, speech here at South by Southwest where you kind of echo what you're saying right now. The Calvary isn't coming, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. what advice do you give to aspiring filmmakers kind of entering into this new, like, model, this new this new way of making films? Like, um, what do you, and what do you mean by that, that the Calvary, well, you already said it, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that was nine years ago, and, but I do think that some of that stuff still applies, mm -hmm. you know, the, the basic tenet of, um, you know, if you're waiting for someone to come discover you, if you're hoping you can get your script into the hands of that person that's mm -hmm. going to buy it and give you that magical, you know, early 90s Sundance story, mm -hmm. uh, you're doing yourself a disservice. And that doesn't mean you can't put some of your efforts and energy towards that. Right. But if you're nowhere, and when I say nowhere, I mean no connections, mm -hmm. no one knows exactly what you can offer yet, um, you know, the bulk of your destiny is unfortunately in your hands, you mm -hmm. know, and it sucks, but like no one cares and no one is coming is the truth. So you kind of have to like find uh, your group of people that are like-minded and, and go after it. And the only thing that I try to add now to, to people, you know, that I wish I had added in 2015 mm -hmm. is like, it's not, um, it's not a game of, a, it, this wasn't a good process for you if you don't become a successful filmmaker mm -hmm. because what I didn't mention then and what I like to mention now is like, I am not a filmmaker. I, in my core, am a musician. Mm -hmm. I was a musician from 15 years old. That's what I was gonna do. I used to go out on tour. I lived in Austin. I put out records. I lived in my van. I would just like travel around. You were Riley. And, and that was my mm -hmm. thing, right? Yes. And I failed. I didn't make it. Um, but here's the great news is I learned so much about the artistic process. Mm -hmm. I learned how to make stuff on my own. I learned how to collaborate with friends. I learned how to accept criticism and failure. Mm -hmm. And then I took all that stuff and I made a pivot into film. And then I was way ahead of the game by the time I got there. And then I made it work there. So my thing is just like, go ahead long into it. Don't be afraid. And if there has to be a pivot or you don't quote unquote make it, yeah. it's okay. It's going to go into something else. Right. But I do love that it's. Ten years later, and we're yes. back here going. Well, the Calvary still isn't it's coming. Still not coming. And now, especially in TV, so let's yes. uh, pivot and go do this now. Yeah. Like, how many times can we say this? Yeah. Like, yeah. How many more ways? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm very proud of this, and to be honest, I feel like this ties into just kind of. I feel like there might be a little change coming because. I've been excited about this all morning. Godzilla minus one one best oh, yes, visual effects mm -hmm. at the Oscars, right? Fifteen yeah. million dollar budget looks fucking amazing. It's right? incredible. It's yeah. incredible. It is incredible. Now I'm gonna compare you to Godzilla minus one because you made a three dollar movie. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> we did not win an Oscar. <laughs> no. But you did. It's called This Is John, and you said that this movie changed everything for you and your brother. It did change everything for us. And uh, you know, the the very important story to remember about This Is John is like, it was a three dollar movie. We made it in our kitchen in South Austin, on West Mary Street between Congress and South First, where we lived for $900 in rent, a mm. three bedroom at the time. Um, and that movie got into Sundance, and it got into South by Southwest, and it totally created our career. But the arbitrary nature of this business needs to be known. When we got back from Sundance, we had only submitted to one other festival, mm. the San Antonio Underground Film Festival, okay. which was not the biggest film festival at the time. <laughs> to say the least. And at Sundance, they let us know there was like 5,000 submissions and, and 90 shorts got in. And that felt really, really good. Mm. And in our mailbox was a letter from the San Antonio <laughs> Underground Film Festival saying, we regret to inform you we're not able to accept your movie. Oh, um, what? But there were over 200 submissions and we could only take 60 <laughs> films. <laughs> so just remember, just remember,
It's all subjective. Yeah. Stick in the game. Yeah, keep did going. You, did yeah. you ever go back to San Antonio and say, look at us, man? Like, you know what? It was no, such a no, we're here. It was such a beautiful moment because we were so high on ourselves and I was just like, this is perfect. Don't even happen to us. <laughs> yeah, this is just exactly what we needed. That was great. And now yeah. I have to ask, like, what costs three dollars in this movie? I need to know. It's exactly. We had our parents' um, one chip Canon mini DV camera that we used to film all our vacation videos on. Mm -hmm. There was a dead pixel in the center of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to Seven uh, Eleven. I got one of those little mini DV tapes. It was three bucks. Mm. That was it. That's how long ago it was in the yep. olden times. Yeah, we were shooting on tape. Okay, like, if, so if you're aspiring yes. filmmakers. Just go shoot on mini DV. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, dude, shooting on your phone now oh, at like way 4K better. Yeah. looks incredible. <laughs> like, it's important. Like, we had the ugliest, worst sounding film ever to play at a film festival. But, mm. like, it was, a, it was a hit because at that time, that story worked. It connected with yeah. people, and that's yeah. all that matters. Just that's have a great. good story. Yeah. That's great. All right, so in 2005, South by Southwest screened movies from Andrew Budowski, mm. Joe Swanberg, and the Duplass brothers, the Puffy Chair. Yes. You stayed in touch with one another, like, since then. This whole, and you, like, you created this whole subgenre called Mumblecore. Mm -hmm. Like, how has South by Southwest, how has that experience kind of, like, changed everything for you? Can you speak and to South that? South by has been a huge part of my life for a long time. I went to college here, you know, so I started coming to this festival in 1995, you know, and I was going to the music festival, and I was going to the film festival and I was just thinking like oh my god like that's when badges were like $25 and you could get into things right and I was like one day I like I hope I can have something here you know mm -hmm. um, and then they, they did take our first short film in 2003 which was big but I think in 2005 with the puffy chair mm -hmm. that community of young filmmakers started to cement itself um, that we were at the right time and place for the technology, you know, that a cheap camera that we could make stuff in. Mm. And um, the camaraderie really happened here at South By, because uh, Sundance is, you know, equally, if not more so, responsible for the, the you know, birth of my career. Mm. But there's not as much time for that hanging out and like wonderful creative coagulation, because yeah. you're stressed. The press is crazy. Everybody's got the flu. You're worried There's about no selling your queso. movie. There's no queso. Yeah. yeah no queso. But South by, like, we were here for a week and we got, like, time to just, like, okay, let's go to Polvo's and mm -hmm. let's, like, have an hour and a half meal. And, like, th that was pretty pivotal to mm -hmm. cementing those relationships. Okay. Well, South by obviously is, like, kind of, like you said, changed everything for you. And you know, South by is a place to, like, for people to achieve their dreams, especially, like, in the world mm -hmm. of, like, filmmaking and TV making now. Yeah. Um, with all that being said, what's, like, one final piece of advice you can give to people? hoping to come to South By with mm. like that independent television show or film um, that you can. Mm. I mean, I think ultimately at Days End, that's what we films. keep saying is like, you gotta make something. Mm -hmm. So it's um, in order to make something successful, I think we're our big uh, secret, not really a secret is always make it for what you have, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the best way and surest way to follow it through and to yeah. make something. So back into a location, back into the number of people you have, back into the number of days you have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the best stories with a great creative mind come out of limitations, right. which I think is what we did on yeah. Room 104. We mm -hmm. said, here's a box, stay in it. Mm -hmm. And everybody gave us a wildly different story. Yeah, and look, hopefully South by Southwest takes that movie or that, you know, whatever it is of yours you're making when the time is right but you know if they're like the san antonio underground film festival and they and they don't take it like listen it's okay like when i was a singer songwriter in the late 90s i kept trying to get into the music festival and i just mm -hmm. couldn't get in by the way i shouldn't have because it wasn't that good <laughs> but i remember what i did was i just booked a cafe that was not part of South by Southwest mm -hmm. during South by Southwest mm -hmm. and I was able to drag people over and it became like this really weird alternative hit so yeah. I'd just be like do you really believe in your movie or a TV show like throw up throw up a sheet somewhere <laughs> yeah. downtown and just start playing your movie like just try some stuff carve out the space that. yeah get you get in where you fit in and sometimes you got to make the place where yeah. you fit in yeah. That's incredible. Well, That's thank true. you so much for coming to the South by Southwest studio, you guys. Cheers. This thank has been you. amazing. And thank you for coming by. You can watch all of our studio interviews on the South by Southwest page at youtube.com slash SXSW. I'm your host, Juju Green. Thank you so much for watching. This is thank seriously you. like, Sorry, thank you, Juju. No, Juju, no, you're fine. No, you didn't cut me off. I stopped. <laughs>
Hi everyone, my name is Austin Nowert. I'm the senior film and TV programmer here at South by Southwest. Hope everyone is doing well. Day five, I believe, that's what at least what people tell me. Days start to blur together right now. Before we get started, there are a few things I'd like to go over. One is that there will be a Q&A today. This will be done digitally via Slido. If you'd like to ask a question for a chance for it to be answered later in the session, please find this session page in the South by Southwest Go app and click engage. And number two is I would love to just give a huge heartfelt thank you to our volunteers who work at South by Southwest. Without them, this event would not be possible. I also, I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is the final featured session in the film and TV tracks at South by Southwest this year. Um, the last five days have really blown by, to say the least. We technically don't have a closing session for the film and TV tracks, but I feel like this works perfectly as a, uh, as a closing session, so I'm just gonna call it that anyways. Um, so now, where to start with Sydney Sweeney. She is one of the most popular and sought after actors of her generation and has received acclaim for performances in such projects as White Lotus, Euphoria, and the film Americana, which world premiered here at South by Southwest last year. It's great to have Sydney back at South by this year with Immaculate, a film in which she not only stars in, but also produced with her 5050 Films production company. 5050 Films gives wind and support to projects that Sydney finds interesting, challenging, and relevant. Immaculate will be world premiering tonight at 10 p.m. at the Paramount Theater, so of course everyone here should make sure they go and, and, and see that. And if for some reason you can't make it tonight, then it'll be in theaters nationwide on March 22nd. Sydney will be joined today by Perry Nemiroff, who is senior producer at Collider, where she hosts, produces, where she hosts and produces the interview series Collider Ladies Night. Outside of Collider, you can also catch Perry on the awards season prognostication show for your consideration, as well as her work with Rotten Tomatoes, Fandango, and NCM's new V pre-show hosting Close Up, uh, where she hosts Close Up with Perry Nemiroff. Without any further ado, everyone, please welcome to the stage, Sydney and Perry. Thank you guys. Hello everyone. I wanna give my own little introduction right now and I said this to you earlier, the coolest thing or one of the coolest things in this industry is when I get to see someone who's so wildly talented, builds a massive fan base and then uses that notoriety and that ability to shine a spotlight on projects that they're passionate about in a way that makes things happen that either might not happen at all or not happen in the way that they should. That's what you're doing with your career, and that is what we're here to highlight today. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also very excited that we get to fi follow my little Collider Ladies Night roadmap a little, because I would like to learn a little bit more about your early days in acting, film, and television. And I always love starting with this question. Oh, man. What was the first movie you saw, performance you saw, or personal experience you had that made you say to yourself, I absolutely have to be an actor? Oh my goodness. You know, growing up, I actually just lived in my imagination. I was always outside building imaginary worlds. In school, I would randomly write scripts, and I didn't even really know what scripts were and have my friends play them on the playground. And I think that when I realized what movies and TV shows were and what actors were, and that you could play all these pretend worlds and be all these people, that that's actually what encouraged me. Like, I'm so f amazed and fascinated by tons of films and actors, but it was truly just the idea of being able to be more than just myself. I'm just curious, do you remember what any of those screenplays are? Like, what you used to like writing about? It was just random. I mean, I, I need to go through it, because I actually just found a notebook, and 
I had all of my my little write-ups from like fourth grade. I know this is a lot to ask, but I feel like you should share it. It would inspire so many young people out there. I'm telling you. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> All right. So you identify the dream to become an actor. I have two questions about what happens next. One from the crafts perspective and then another in terms of navigating the business. So you want to be an actor, but I find that in this industry, it can be really tough to like fully believe in yourself and have confidence in your craft. So do you remember the first thing that happened that gave that to you, that made you feel like you deserve to be here? I think that didn't come until a lot later. I always had the motivation that I wasn't gonna accept no, even from like 10 years old. But the feeling of, I'm here, I deserve this, I, I feel confident in the space. It didn't happen until much, much later. What specifically? I mean, I could think of a number of things, actually. I'm just like thinking about all the nominations you've received. <laughs> and I mean, that's got to give you a nice backing there. It's incredible. And, and I get to play such diverse, interesting, challenging roles. And that's what I dream of doing. So whenever I get the opportunity to play a character like Cassie or Cecilia and Immaculate, like it's, that is what makes me feel really good and I'm happy to be able to do. I'm not sure if this has happened, but is there, or if you can remember anything with such specificity, but is there any uh, fan interaction you've had, whether it's at a convention or, or a festival like South by Southwest that I guess signaled to you that like not only is your work good, but, but it really matters to people? I get so happy and excited whenever People come up to me and they share their stories about when they watched either Euphoria or White Lotus or whatever project it was and what it meant to them because that's why I do it. Being able to connect with so many people through my characters is such a beautiful experience. And I have like a group of people that I always see in New York or in Italy or Paris and it's always really amazing to see familiar faces and, and watch them grow as I grow as well. That makes me so happy to hear. All right, the other half of my question was, was the business side of it all, and big two-part question here. You'll notice I like two-part questions. I apologize in advance. So you decide you want to become an actor. At that point, what did you think was step one to making that dream a reality? And then ultimately, would you recommend that first step to an aspiring actor? I was quite young. So I, I did not know anything about the industry. Came from a small town, Spokane, Washington, has nothing to do with this world. And my parents had nothing to do with this world either. And they thought that acting was like wanting to be a princess. It was unattainable. It was just a far stretched dream. She'll come out of it one day. And when I was young, I was like 10 years old, this really small indie came to town and I found out about it. And I wanted to audition really bad, but my parents were like, what, what's going on? So I, I put together a five-year business plan presentation of what could happen if they let me audition for this movie. And in it, it had, like, if I audition and I book it, then I'll meet people on this set that will then introduce me to an agent, and then the agent can get me auditions for commercials and short films, and then maybe I'll have a resume, we could go down to LA for pilot season, when pilot season was still a thing. And my parents realized I was pretty serious about my dream. That's so much <laughs> industry awareness at that age, I'm very impressed. My, my parents definitely taught me to do a lot of homework and research and try and figure out as much as you can before you start asking questions, so. Can you name one specific thing from that five-year plan that became a reality where you're like, I did that bullet point? Um, it took 10 years by getting an agent and then starting to get auditions. Oh, I love talking about agents because I feel like we don't do that nearly enough in this, in like the uh, interview line of work. When you found your agent, what was it about that person that signaled to you? They wouldn't just help you, I guess, navigate this business in a successful way where you get work, but that you were getting work that felt right to you and mattered to you. So my agent, Jennifer Millar, she's here, um, and Scott Melrose and everyone at Paradigm, they've been my agents since day one. And I have such an amazing team and I'm so thankful for them because they fight for me like no other 
and I couldn't imagine doing this without them. Such an important thing in this business to have a good team like that at your back. So looking at some of your earliest credits of all of your first shows and films, which one would you say helped put into focus the most the types of stories you would really want to tell going forward and the types of sets you would want to work on? It would be Sharp Objects and Handmaid's Tale. So I filmed those right like in the same year. And Sharp Objects was one of the first shows that I, I got cast in that wasn't just like a co-star or a featured extra. And I will never forget Jean-Marc Vallée. Um, he saw in me what I hoped that other people would see in myself and I appreciated everything that he did for me. And then during that time, I also worked on Everything Sucks, which is with Michael Mohan, who directed Immaculate. And he's the first director to hire me in a series regular role on a show. And so it was just such a beautiful way to like, start to feel more confident in the room and have characters that really meant a lot to me. Before I get too far ahead with some like really big titles that I know everyone's gonna wanna hear about, I always love asking this question, especially to cover the early days of someone's experience in this industry. Can you give me an audition high and low? Uh, like a wonderful moment, but then, you know, not necessarily- Oh, I've like, had so many lows. <laughs> I was gonna put a positive spin on it. I mean, it. auditioning you know I like process that. sucks. <laughs> it sucks a lot. Um, I mean, I, lows, I mean, it's, sometimes casting directors aren't your friends. I've had casting directors who would eat food while I was in an audition or take a phone call or not look up from a page or just, I just wouldn't feel great. Do you have an audition low where you learn something from it that you are able to apply to future auditions? And whether or not that a cast, whether or not a casting director was doing that, you were still able to make it a positive experience for yourself. Yes, this one's ingrained in my memory because I will never be able to forget it. Uh, I was 14. It was the first time that I got to like test for a recurring role on a TV show. And I think it was like for ABC Family. And I'd never walked into a room with more than two people before. And this time it had the producers, the writer, the director, and the casting directors and the assistants. And I remember walking down these stairs and it almost felt like a stage. And I got so nervous. I have stage fright, I'm a little nervous right now. And I just forgot all my lines. I, I, I was so scared and I remember just standing there apologizing profusely and then I just asked to leave. And I, that moment just set me up for knowing I can't control everything. It's okay to look at the page. It's okay to be nervous because I was so scared that I was nervous, but I've now taken all these nervous energy and turned it into like excitement. We were literally just talking about this backstage. I think nerves in, in this industry or really anything that you do aren't a bad thing. It's not having the nerves that's bad because maybe it's a sign that you're not as passionate anymore. So. Nerves come from caring. I like that. <laughs> I, t I told you, I have a positive spin on everything. The audition high now. Audition high. Um, one of my audition highs was with this casting director. His name's David Rubin. And it was actually for Sharp Objects. And he was one of the first di casting directors who memorized all the lines actually like felt like I was doing a scene and I hadn't felt that because I'd never really done much other than like a small co-star role and it just felt amazing and I will forever appreciate that I actually hired him on a movie that I'm producing now because I hope that actors feel that same way when they walk in. You like read my mind with a follow-up question. I was gonna ask how you find your casting directors now given your own experience. Yeah. It's important and I'm, I'm so excited that at the Oscars we're finally gonna recognize a casting director's contributions which feels so long overdue. Yeah, no, they're, they're a huge part of the entire process. All right, I'm gonna ask a question that I will admit is unfair but given we're talking about casting directors and agents, can you name an unsung hero on one of your shows or films? Like someone who's not on the poster, not a director, someone behind the scenes that makes a big difference in your day-to-day -day on set. I mean, the entire crew is so vital to the, everything day-to-day -day on a set from 
the PAs, grip, sound, transpo, crafty, like everyone makes the day happen and just you have to thank everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Your, your mentality with how this business operates is so, it's so clear how well suited you are to be a leader as a producer, and I love that. All right, I want to touch on euphoria briefly, and the way that I'm going to get at that is I always love asking people about the experience of breaking out in Hollywood because it could look one way to the outsider, and it could be a completely different experience for the person going through it. Two-part question, but I'll break it up. First, what would you say is a misconception about having a breakout uh, project in this industry? Oh my goodness. That's a good question. I think that one of the biggest misconceptions is that your life changes overnight. Because it doesn't. At least for me, it didn't. Um, I still auditioned for White Lotus and every project that I had after that. Um, it just, it opened more doors, but I still had to put in the work and the effort to continue doing what I love. So you mentioned opening doors. The other half of that question is what is something that truly did change for the better when Euphoria came out and it was embraced so wholeheartedly? So open doors and is there anything else that, uh... The connection with the fans. Oh. I mean, it's just, it's so amazing being able to walk into a room and have people who want to talk to you about something that like your character or the story or their project meant to them like that's it's really it's beautiful to have that relationship now with people it's so i mean so so important i mean like why, why else do we do it you know why else does this industry why else do these interviews happen if not for the passion and the connection people have to these projects which matters the other thing i wanted to ask you about was uh the reality of getting nominated for an emmy because you know depending on what stage of your career that you're at an award nomination can mean a variety of things so when those nominations came in like what did it mean to you then and has that meaning evolved at all I think I'm still in denial that it happens. Um, I was filming at the time, so I didn't really allow my time, myself time to process what was happening. And even when I was actually at the Emmys, I, I, I don't think that it hit me what was happening. I always have like imposter syndrome when it comes to that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's incredible. Like both Olivia from White Lotus and Cassie from Euphoria, they mean so much to me and I thoroughly enjoyed playing both of those characters and the people that I got to work with on both of those sets. So having both shows be recognized and then also just the characters themselves, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's everything you dream of as an actor. I love award series. And I, lo I love the fact that like someone feels celebrated and I love the fact that encourages other people to celebrate others in the industry as well. I'm a big cheese ball with that stuff. Here's a, a really big question, but I think it's important to uh, talk a little, bit, a little bit about in terms of your journey to becoming a producer. Do you remember the very first time when you could feel the power of your own voice on a set? when you spoke up and it made a difference? When I was working with Michael Mohan, um, he just is so incredible. And I always felt very comfortable and safe to be able to like, maybe share an idea. And whether he took it or not, it, it, it was important. He just at least gave me the space to be able to speak my, my mind and my thoughts and feel involved in the process. And that definitely encouraged me. I mean, I was like 19 on Everything Sucks, and in that moment, I remember I wanted to be a part of more than just acting. Ideal quality to have in a collaborator. Here's a really big question. This is one of my favorite acting questions to ask, though, because there are so many different approaches to the work out there. Can you name a co-star on any of your projects that has a similar process to your own, where the second you hit set, you are immediately in sync? But I also want the opposite, someone with a unique approach <laughs> that challenged you to adapt and try something new. <laughs> I don't think I can put any of my co-stars on the spot right now. <laughs> I'm, I've been really lucky. A lot of the a, a lot of the people that I get to work opposite of are really fun, and I love everyone. You you have some of the best of the best. I'll I'll get at a co-star question. Well, 
I mean like different process. I, I don't mean to like put a process down because every single process is valuable and by experiencing a new one, it could inspire something new in yourself. Can you recall a time when maybe you were having a tough time with a seam, but because what a seam partner gave you, it helped you reach something in the moment that you wouldn't have been able to without them? Hmm. There was a scene when we were filming Euphoria where Maud and I were supposed to be fighting and the scene, we were still working the scene out and I remember like Maud and I were sitting on my character's bed and we were talking through this, this what we were supposed to do and Sam came in and we kind of just like started talking through it and, and Maud is so smart, like she, is an incredible writer and people, she needs more credit because she's incredible. And she really just kind of like helped rework the entire scene. And it was, it was really cool to see. I've never spoken to her, but I've watched a lot of interviews and like you can, you can just tell she's tuned in in a very special way. Before I get to some specific producing questions, I, I wrote down SNL, and it, you, because you, you've been talking a little bit about stage fright, so I am really curious how that experience was for you with some stage fright built in. It's terrifying, guys. <laughs> it was so scary. Um, my mouth dried up. I, it was, oh my gosh, I'm like having panic attacks thinking about it. Uh, but it was, it was so much fun. And, I really wanted to do, I knew I was gonna be terrified going into it, but I wanted to do it because I think it's important to do things that scare you. I always choose characters because they scare me and they challenge me in new ways. And the whole entire SNL experience was a challenge and it was terrifying. And I think it's good to face fears. I still have the same fear, but <laughs> I faced it, so. No, it's important to face fears and keep growing. Uh, follow up on that, I guess kind of leaning into Immaculate a little here, is, is that role, I guess like the scariest or most intimidating, and if not, what role that you've done is? I think Cecilia, where she ends up, is definitely the most terrifying character. She starts unexpected. You all have no idea. We're gonna get to this later. I'm very excited about what, we're not gonna spoil anything, of course, because the movie hasn't premiered and I want you to experience it in full, but I'll say this like repeatedly for the rest of our conversation. You should be so proud of that movie, but in particular, that ending just blows my mind. So getting into your interest in producing, do you remember what initially sparked that itch? Like an experience you had on a set that made you think, you know, like, I could, I could maybe influence a set for the better if this comes up again. When I was filming Sharp Objects, I had a small role, but Jean-Marc created such an incredible environment on set where I felt like I didn't have to leave. So I would come and hang out and sit at Video Village with his producing partner, Nathan Ross, and I would just sit and watch and learn and listen. And I remembered during that time I was like, I'm going to try and observe everything I can because I want to do this one day. I don't know when, how, any of it. I just knew that if I can be in these rooms and learn from these people that I can kind of like take bits and pieces and put it into my own. I won't put you on the spot with this question, but like you, you seem very knowledgeable about every single aspect of a production. Is directing and fully leading a production uh, an itch you want to scratch one day? Maybe. Okay. I'll maybe. take maybe. I'll yeah. take maybe. Crack that door Has to open. be the right story. And then maybe. Given how much of one's life they must pour into a film, no matter what role they're, uh, they're in, actually, I feel like that's the way to get at it. Okay, another question about producing for you, because I, I feel like being a producer can mean a multitude of things. Like, a, a lot of people out there don't fully know what it means on any single production because, like, there's different titles. There's producer, there's executive producer, and then some. And it also can mean something different for the person who's actually filling that role. So what does being a producer mean to you, and how do you want to influence the projects you work on for the better? To me, being a producer and whenever... I personally will put my name as a producer on a project means I'm a part of it from 
the beginning to the end. I don't want to miss a step. I want to be a part of everything I can put my hands on. I do not like the idea of just putting my name on something and taking credit where it's not due. Uh, I want to conceptualize the project and, and bring it all together. So to me, being a producer is basically like being a parent and helping a project grow. These projects are babies. I yeah. think that's, that's a pretty accurate description there. I did want to bring up anyone but you and, and how that's impacted your approach to producing because the success of that movie is just, like it's astronomical, it's wild, it's unexpected, and it's something that I imagine you want to learn from. So is there any takeaway from the success of that movie that you think you're going to apply to the projects you produce going forward? Yeah, I mean, that anyone but you is such an incredible experience from the beginning when I was working on the script and then... I hired Will and I hired Glenn and we sold it to Sony. It was always, I wanted to bring back those early 2000 rom-coms that people went and then they left wanting to fall in love. And they left wanting to sing and dance in the rain and have big romantic gestures. And I didn't want to look at the rom-com as something small. I wanted to have big set pieces and Will did such an incredible job at like really amping up those set pieces in this film. And I think that by creating an environment on set where we truly had so much fun and we, we just shared in all of that, that love and the excitement while we were filming, like the audience felt that on screen. And I hope that I can create more projects where you can just, you feel that love, you feel that energy and the audience can walk away wanting that as well. Oh, I'm such a big believer that that quality on set radiates off the screen in the movie as well. A couple follow-ups now. Um, I, I believe you said early 2000s rom-coms. What, what's your personal favorite? Okay, so this is, this is really fun because my best friend's wedding. Um, so Dermot, I was like obsessed with. <laughs> and then we got him as my dad and I, I was so excited and freaking out. <laughs> and then we ended up screening the movie with him and the whole cast and he watched it for the first time since the premiere and that was I mean we were all crying our eyes out when he was talking about the entire experience okay I'm gonna add one more layer to this if you had the opportunity to remake the classic 2000s rom-com of your choice and play the starring role who would you pick and why you can't ask that oh my gosh it's not it's not erasing what's been done it's celebrating it and broadening the audience. No, because I'm going to get dragged on social media. Oh, <laughs> I don't got to deal with that nearly as much as you do. I will respect that concern. <laughs> no matter what I say, they'll come at me. <laughs> Shifting gears from, from rom-com to horror now. First, I want to know, what is the very first movie you saw that kept you up at night? Either Friday the 13th or The Exorcist. Mm. Exorcist is a, a rock solid choice. I was really young. My dad loved horror films and he showed them to me way too early. <laughs> I'm bad with that. People are always asking me, like, is this appropriate for my children? I'm like, I'm the last person in the world you should ask because I was like growing up on Scream when I was a teeny tiny. Exactly. Kid. My dad would say, yeah, yeah, you can watch that. You've, you've worked on a bunch of horror movies at this point, so, so that was one of the first, those were one of the first horror movies you saw. Do you remember the first time you saw a horror movie that kind of made you like, appreciate the movie magic of it and the effect it can have on an audience where it left you wanting to make them yourself? Probably, and these are like psychological horrors, uh, Rosemary's Baby and uh, The Shining. Mm. A lot of Rosemary's Baby vibes in Immaculate that I really appreciated. Well, I think, like, they just, they appreciated that genre. Like, I, I feel like now there's a lot of films that just, they're not cinematic. Part of the problem is an emphasis on the scare over character, and the scare loses its value and impact when the character is not strong, and you don't have that connection. Why not both? Yeah. I, I'll build on that a little. What's a recent horror movie you saw that you think gets it right and you wish more filmmakers out there would be inspired by? Either Barbarian, Us. I was terrified by Us. That was, I, I still have nightmares. Um, 
So those are probably yeah. No, it was so good. It was one of the greatest nights I've ever had here. It was incredible, <laughs> absolutely incredible. I'm not gonna tell you how many times I've watched that movie. <laughs> so getting into Immaculate, and specifically when you audition, because I know you auditioned like a while back, and then the project kind of stalled before it turned into what we're gonna see this weekend and tonight for some out there. What would you say is the biggest difference between how you pictured the film when you first auditioned and the movie you wound up making? I got to make it myself, which when I'm 16, like I didn't know. <laughs> um, thank you guys. Yeah, I, I mean, I auditioned hoping I'd, I'd get cast in a movie. And now I look back and I'm like, Sid, you made it. Like, that's so cool. It's a big deal. You should celebrate that to kind of, uh, you know, demystify what it's like during that period of time when a film doesn't have any forward momentum. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened between, I believe that audition was 2017? Do I remember I was that 16, date? so. What happened between 2017 and uh, Greenlight? 27, no, it'd be like 2014. Yeah. Ow. Um, well, the script went into turnaround, um, and no one ended up making it, so pulled out the clean draft, which is like the first draft, and I then started putting the team together. I brought on Dave Bernard, who was a producer on White Lotus, and while we were filming season one, I can't remember what scene we were filming, but Dave when I came back to Video Village, was like, we need to do a horror film. And I go, well, funny you say that. Um, I might have a script. And so I brought him on, and he helped just navigate the whole world, because I, I have never done anything before. And so we met with financiers, and we brought on a financier, Black Bear. And once we started doing that, we brought on Michael Mohan, our director, and we started working on the script because time has passed and we wanted to update it, also update the character to fit who I am now. And then it all started to become a really fast process. Can you tell us a little bit about how the character changed and how the age change might change yeah. the narrative of the film? So originally it was set in Ireland and it was a boarding school. And her parents died and she got sent to this boarding school and then the basis and the groundwork is pretty much the same. Very interesting. Here's yeah. a, a big two-parter about first digging into like the current version of the character. When you were first getting ready to start filming, what quality of hers were you most looking forward to tapping into? But then also, is there a quality you found along the way as you were working like on set with your team, with your scene partners? I think one of the most exciting parts of Cecilia was how innocent she was and where she goes at the end. Because she is, it's, it's such an unexpected journey. She, is, she finds strength within herself that she has no idea she has, that she's forced to unlock. And it's really fun and exciting to play a character who unlocks potential that they don't know they have. This is a big question, but like she, like she is so, like she's so sincere, she's so kind, she's so open at the beginning. What is it like for you, like playing that in, I don't know, I guess like a believable manner where it can be the starting point to her growing into like the force she becomes in the tail end of the movie? I'd hope to say I'm kind and nice, and so that <laughs> part did it, <laughs> wasn't a stretch. <laughs> um, it, it was because she was just in this new environment, everything felt very beautiful. So like the film feels more clean and crisp and the colors are more vibrant. And then as it goes on, like Michael and Elijah uh, and our editors did such an amazing job of just like grading up the film and making it feel darker and the world feel smaller. It's so powerful. I wish I had written down, Michael, it's such a nice thing to say about you just in terms of the evolution of the character and how well you're able to capture that. And I can't remember the exact words because I didn't write them down, but they were very accurate. The performance is really something else in this. 
looking at uh, the, I guess, the, the production design and everything that's involved in that part of it, are there any little details that you were able to add to Cecilia via the environment and also the costume work that you were able to work with? Everything. I mean, Italy was such an amazing backdrop for this film. I, I truly felt like the locations were characters in themselves. And Adam Reamer, who helped design and, and set deck everything, is so incredibly talented and, and just elevated every room that you'd walk into. It felt lived in, it felt haunting. It, it, there was just every little detail was so thought out. And it was, it, it just helps your character really feel like she's living in this world. I don't know if you remember something this specific with enough clarity, but is there any little detail in the costume work or production design that, you know, people might miss on a first watch, but it's important to filling out the world and you hope that they catch it? Ooh, that's such a great question. There are... There's bits and pieces... Well, we want to be careful. I about know. Spoilers. I know. I'm like, how do I? This is a very difficult movie to talk about, like to the fullest, while avoiding spoilers. I know. Because there's, there's like the third act of the film. There's, there's a place that this character goes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to say it without. I. I'll have a question that could kind of get at that. I actually have another, another way to look at, you know, a little bit of what I just was bringing up. I had read somewhere you like building memory books for your character, and this is kind of a similar thing to finding a detail on a set, but we do learn a little bit about Sister Cecilia's backstory in the movie, but is there anything in that memory book you came up with that we don't necessarily see or hear directly in the movie, but we could still feel informing your performance? Her search for friendship. I think, so... I always imagined that she she was always an outsider. She never felt like she had a friend group or someone to rely on, which is why she easily was able to drop everything and, and go to this unknown convent in Italy. And she finds sisterhood through um, like Gwen, who's played by Benedetta, she's and incredible. she's amazing. And it was really important to me to have a character who truly falls in love with this place that's about to torture her and have it like a weird dynamic. What a way to describe that. In an effort to highlight more of your incredible co-stars here, can you tell me about a time on set when, I don't know, one of them just far exceeded your expectations? Like you're well aware of how talented they all are, but when they took something to another level and you're like, like, damn, that's why you're part of this team. Honestly, every day. I was so blown away by the cast on this film because it was a leap of faith. I mean, it was a first film that I'm producing and put together, and we're all these Americans in Italy, and we're filming a, mo a little small movie, and they just, like, they trusted us, and they gave us so much. I mean, Alvaro and Benedetta and Simona, everyone was just so incredible. And there's, so, so Julia, who this is her first film, she's never been in a short film before. She's never done anything. And she is so incredible. Like, I, I, I'm just, I'm so excited for people to see her in this movie and also everyone else. But it was just, beautiful to watch all of their work. Speaking of this being her first, I feel like we often talk about how, how newer actors can learn from acting veterans. Is there anything you picked up from her as someone who is like kind of coming in with a fresh perspective and you know, no, no pressures set by previous experiences, if that makes sense? She doesn't have social media <laughs> and she doesn't live on her phone or any of that. And I just thought she was the coolest person ever, just living in the moment, building relationships, becoming friends with all the crew. And I loved that. That is an important thing to highlight. I loved it. Here's where like some of my questions get a little dangerous and I'm looking at the time now. I'll just remind everybody that in about five minutes we're gonna take some audience questions. So this is kind of like the last chance to submit them through the South by Southwest Go app. And then we're gonna get to as many as we possibly can. I, ho I hope we can avoid spoilers. Of all the very ambitious scenes in this movie, 
which did you think was gonna be the toughest for you? And then ultimately, was it the toughest or was it a different one? I thought the ending was gonna be the toughest. It was, it was hard in its own way, but you'll see it's the first take and that's it. Um, but the hardest one was actually, I'm, I'm running through a field mm. and <laughs> Mike, <laughs> I'm running through a field and it was freezing cold. It rained the entire morning. Um, I was barefoot and it was weirdly the hardest day because I got so cold I couldn't feel my feet anymore and I didn't know that I was like cutting my feet wide open and it was a whole thing. Stunning shot. And this isn't a spoiler. You could go and see this shot in the trailer. It's really just like beautiful imagery. <laughs> Here's, I'm trying to find a way to talk about that ending without talking know, about the ending. I know. Can you tell me something about your prep process as an actor that was, I guess, kind of one of a kind for a performance beat like that versus what you're used to doing? Uh, this is probably so controversial, but I don't, I don't like to rehearse. I don't, I don't like to plan things. I don't like to have anything set. I like to just know what's my space that I can work in, where's the cameras, and let's just see what happens. Not controversial. If well, it sometimes actors don't like that, and filmmakers don't like that, and so I have to like work with it. Um, That's fair. But it was something where Mike and I and Elijah, we just kind of were like, okay, we're gonna start here, we'll move over here, we'll come back, let's see what happens. And then we just took a second, and we did it. I'm always wary about overhyping things. Like I try, I try to respect the problem that could spark, but I like I believe this with my whole heart. That is an exceptional performance beat. And then I said this earlier to you, and I'll happily say it to this crowd. I would be shocked if that wasn't one of my favorite scenes of 2024 at the end of the year. It is really so, you have something really special Thank to look forward to. Thank you. So, Two questions now about what you gain from Immaculate that you're hoping to take to future projects. First, I'll ask it as an actor, what is a new tool in your acting toolkit, so to speak, that you gain from this production that you're eager to use more on a future one? As an actor, I gained, honestly, family. I, I think that like, I've been so on the go and everything's been so like one after the other and I never had time to truly like sit and build relationships. And when I was on Immaculate, one, it felt like my playground and my world and I just wanted to become friends with everyone so they felt welcomed as well. And as an actor, like I've just now taken that into everything that I do and I hope that I can have tons of friendships and everybody just feels happy and excited to be there. I say this all the time, filmmaking families make me so happy and they're so important. I feel like that answer could, I feel like that answer could answer this version of the question as well, but what about being a producer? Because I believe this is the first like full producing credit, like not EP, but a producer. Yeah. What is a new tool or something you learned about what it means to be a producer that you are gonna to apply to your next film? Honestly, just, knowing and appreciating all of the crew's time and their energy. Such a good answer. Yeah. Such a good answer. We're gonna turn to the audience questions in just a minute, but before we do that, I love ending my interviews on this question. I will warn yeah. you, nobody likes this question. Oh, no. But I think it's a very, uh, you'll, you'll understand why when I ask it, but I think it's a very important thing to ask people and just highlight in general because we've spoken about awards during this conversation. This is an industry that loves to give other people awards. I find that a lot of artists never say good job to themselves nearly enough. So can you tell me something you did on Immaculate that you know you'll be able to look back on and say, Damn, I'm really proud of what I did there. This is the response I expect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really proud of myself for not taking the answer no. I mean, I didn't get cast in the project to begin with. They didn't end up making the movie and I didn't let that stop me. That's a great answer. <laughs> it should be 
very, very proud of that on this project and like never let that mentality go. It's Thank gonna you. steer you in the right direction, I know it. All right, we've got a lot of questions here. The first one we will ask is from Andrew. What's your favorite indie movie? Ooh, my favorite indie movie? I mean, it's, <sighs> Midsummer was an indie movie to begin with and it just became a huge indie movie, but I love Midsummer. That's a good one, that's a good one. All right, next up, uh, also Andrew, with such a fast moving industry, how do you stay moving forward in your career? Is there any fear as you continue down this journey? I think that it, it's what I was saying about being challenged, making sure that I'm finding characters that challenge me in different ways, different stories to tell, I wanna play anything and everything that people won't expect me to do. I'll kind of build on that from the producer perspective uh, briefly because the industry is changing, distribution models are changing, viewer habits are changing. Is there anything about kind of the new landscape that you're heavily considering when choosing what projects to work on? It, it, honest, it's just whether the story makes you either question things or excites me or challenges. It, it, it's truly just, do I think that this will be a conversation piece for people? Do I think that this will make people feel a certain way? I feel like that's the right answer. Quality of content forward, always. All right, next up we have Jolie. How do you shift the industry's objectifying gaze into a source of empowerment and leverage? That's a deep question. That's a beautiful question. <laughs> That is a very deep question. Um, I just keep playing characters that people don't think that I'd play. I don't. I honestly, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I love that though. Yeah. I keep thinking about because um, I have the Oscars on the brain. Mark Ruffalo and his role in Poor Things. Thinking that that wasn't in that wasn't in like the section of films that people associated him with, so feeling that taking the role was wrong, but then obviously it was so incredibly right for him. Yeah, and that's like empowering. Everyone, everyone should reach for that. This is from Anthony, who is a director you haven't worked with and would really like to. Ooh. Whenever I, I dream up these names, I'm like, oh my God, I better pick someone good so that I get to work with them next. Manifesting too. No. I believe in speaking this into existence. Uh, I mean, Martin Scorsese is incredible. I just got to work with Ron Howard, and that was a dream of mine. Oh. So one of my dreams came true. I'll also say, just because now poor things is on my brain, go work with Yorgos Lanthimos. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alexander says, have you found recently that sets are becoming less straight male dominated? If so, what roles are you seeing being filled by non-male straight people? I've been pretty lucky to work on sets with crews of all diversities. I love seeing a female behind the camera. Um, I love seeing a female in the sound department. I like that. Um, next up is from Brady. Hey Sydney, what was your most unexpected experience from your hosting gig at SNL? Any funny behind the scenes stories? The most unexpected experience, I mean, the entire thing was unexpected. It's just a roller coaster. You get thrown left, right, up, down, and you just have to like hold on for dear life and just trust everybody. Um, I think one of the most unexpected was how fast the actual live taping is, because when you do it right before it, there's a, a a live show, but it's not taped, for, or not taped, but it's li not live. And you do all the skits, and then for the actual live show, they cut some of them, and then it goes so fast. And I'm like, wait, this is already over? It, it was crazy. I have a follow-up to that. Is there anything that you do as an actor in general, like on film and TV sets, that you kind of had to shake to adapt to the SNL way of doing sketches and tapings? It was the cue cards. I've never worked with cue cards before. And it was funny because they were like, you want to look at the cue cards because if you look at the actor, it looks weird. And I was like, oh, this is, 
this is gonna be not not right for me. I've had so many people tell me one of the most shockingly uh, high pressure parts of being an actor is when you have to go to an award show to present an award, and it's nerve wracking, like being up there and reading off the prompter in the it's back. It's not. It's not natural. Also. I am I'm supposed to wear contacts, but I'm scared of contacts, and I don't wear glasses, so I can't see anybody right now. Um, I'm having to squint to see what this is, so... What? Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but I couldn't see the cue cards, so if you notice, I'm like this sometimes. Um, and my eyes get really red because they're strained, and yeah, it's a personal oh, problem. Contacts are not that bad. I... When I was young, oh boy. very small, like short film I did, um, they put contacts in my eyes and the people who did it put hand sanitizer on their hands <gasps> and then put it in my eyes and I've never felt that kind of pain before and I've never been able to put contacts in since. Another personal problem. <laughs> on my flight on the way here, I opened a thing of hand sanitizer and it shot out oh and I <laughs> Cut my eye, that just brought me right back to that moment. I respect where the fear came from. No context for you for a little, I'll read these. Anna says, how do you choose your brand endorsements? How your personal relationship with brands and their parts on your projects? Uh, uh, Mew Mew and presence in anyone but you. Oh, Mew Mew's presence. I, so I always wanna make sure that no matter what partnership I'm doing, it's organic and authentic to who I am. So Mew Mew was actually the first fashion show I ever went to in my entire career. And it's been just such a beautiful relationship that we've built now and I've been working with them for years and I love all their work and they create the most beautiful custom dresses for me that fit my body and my, my, my body shape. Um, and then like Ford, I built my Bronco, I love cars, uh, and Laneige, like use all their skincare, like everything's always a different branch of who I am. Like I feel like with acting, I'm getting to explore who I'm not and, and try out all these different lives, but through my, my brand partnerships, I get to kind of show different sides of who I am personally, and that's, that's really fun for me. What a fulfilling combination of things. I love that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Cooper says, hi, Sydney. I'm an actor currently pursuing an MBA in entertainment. How have you found your education in business to be helpful for your on-screen career so far? I think it's vital. I think that, number one, school is very important. Uh, my mom and my dad were always very, very persistent on the importance of school. And you are a business. Like, I am a business, you are a business, every actor is their own company, and it's really important to know how to run that company. That's so true, that's so true. I feel like uh, people need to emphasize and respect the value of that even more, too. Um, Emily wants to know, what is the one thing that makes or breaks a script for you in selecting projects? Ooh, it truly just, it's all over the place. Whether I, usually if I can see the, the script in my mind play like a movie or a show, then I'm like, okay, I, I see how this could be made and I'm excited about it. But it's, it's usually just if I'm scared of it. If I'm scared of it, then it's the right one to do. I'll follow up on that a little bit. And like, I'll just emphasize, like you very clearly have good instincts when picking things, but can you recall a time when you're like, ah, I don't know about that, but someone you trust encouraged you to do it and then you gained something from it? I was really scared to do reality. Um, my agent, Jen, she really advocated and pushed me to do it. And I was just scared of it because I'm usually very free with my words. And I've always worked with filmmakers who, like, they're totally, they workshop the scenes with me. And this project, I mean, it was the transcript from the actual FBI interrogation. And so I wanted to make sure that I had every single word correct. And that was a big feat. We filmed it in 16 days. It was a million dollar production. And we were filming, like, 25 pages a day. And it was just pure dialogue. And I was... I was, I was very, I was, it was a huge, it was a challenge and I was scared of it. And this is one that I'm really glad that uh, my agent pushed me to do. 
exceptional and that Critics' Choice nominee for that performance too. I was very proud Thank to you. see that, pop, that nomination pop up Thank on you. the list. Yeah, definitely <laughs> applaud for that. I have one follow-up to that also, just because, like, I don't know, it sounds like a simple basic question, but it's important and everyone has different techniques. What is a tip or trick you would give to another actor for learning their lines? Oh my goodness. It truly is just, it comes with repetition and practice. I mean, I, it's gotten to a point now where I can just read it a few times and I'll know it, but it's different for everybody. I don't know if I have a tip or a trick. That's why, that's why I'm always encouraging people to say more tips and tricks because everybody is like brain processes that stuff in a different way and one day they'll hear the thing that works for them and I love it. Um, Sergio says, who's your favorite comedian and why? I don't know if I know many comedians. <laughs> I wish I could help you out I with know. that, but I watch movies and TV. I, <laughs> I mean, know. I don't, I don't really watch a lot of stand-up. I'm sorry, I don't have this, this answer. I'll give people an answer and say, if you haven't seen I Don't Understand You at this festival, stars Nick Kroll, I, I thought it was a great blend of uh, horror and comedy. And that cast is phenomenal. We have a question from Sam. Hey, Sydney, when you start preparing for a role, what do you do to step outside your inner self and become that character to convey the director's key vision? So I, we talked about this earlier. I create character books. And it's a book that is basically this entire character's life from the day they're born to the first page of the script. And it's all of their memories, their relationships, uh, their childhood bedroom, their school locker. Like, it's everything that makes a person so that I'm not putting anything of myself into a role. Like, I can't be thinking about if I have to be sad in a scene, like I, I don't want to be thinking about my own personal things because then what makes me sad might not be portraying the same sadness that the character would be portraying. So I try to make sure that I separate myself as much as possible by building these memories and, and who these people are. I'm such a backstory nerd. I feel like with all your roles, I would love to see these memory <laughs> books. Um, very wild. Cindy says, in your opinion, how can actors slash celebrities responsibly leverage their platforms to speak on social justice issues? I think it's important to speak about the things that you're passionate about and just use your voice in a good and positive light. Getting some heavy questions. Here. I know, very good guys. Questions. I so we're gonna get this. like, what's your favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite color? Baby blue. Okay. <laughs> Landry wants to know. Hi, Sydney. Was there anything about being on set for the first time that surprised you about the industry in a good way? How small it actually is. Like how small this entire world is. You always are running into people you know. It's true. Yeah. I love that part of it. I do, too. There's a lot of random people. <laughs> Alexander wants to know, when it came to the Lore Olympus oh, cool. Webtoon series, what was it like working on something of an exper on somewhat of an experimental set, and what was the actor's process? This was so fun. This was just like playing dress up. I had a great time. Um, I actually... I downloaded Webtoons and I was like reading all of the comic strips and it was a blast and being able to dress up and like paint myself a different color and, and play such a different character. I, I had a lot of fun. I definitely want to get to this next question because I'm mad at myself for never verbally mentioning 5050 <laughs> Films during this conversation, which is your production company. Where did the name come from? And this question is from Emmanuel. Hi, hey. hi, <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, I truly believe that it takes everybody to create something, like it's not just one person. I wanna be 50-50 with all of my partners. I want to make sure that everybody has equal deals, feels that they are all equally at the table and I just wanna make sure that I'm 50-50. That's the best answer ever. I love that so much. Thank you. All right, we'll squeeze in one more question from Jolie. What is your experience with fans that don't respect boundaries? How does that feel from the perspective of someone who is in the spotlight more and more? 
Hmm. I have to say, it's a tricky one because I understand that I am playing a character that they feel close to me where I don't know this person. So like they might have a relationship with me that I don't have with them. And so it's just something that I have to navigate and I'm still trying to figure out, but my DMs are not a safe space. <laughs> there is no respect in those. <laughs> Respect the artist you admire. And this one right here is one to be respected, seriously. Thank you. Congratulations on everything you've accomplished and Immaculate. I hope everyone is seeing it tonight, but if you're not, don't forget March 22nd, spread the word, and please know how sincerely I mean the movie is phenomenal and Sydney is excellent in it. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So remember Dev Patel from the Oscar-winning Best Picture, Slumdog Millionaire, back in 2008? He is a new gritty action thriller called Monkey Man. It's here at South by Southwest 2024, and he also directed it. Hey, hey mate, how, how are you? you? How Good you doing, to see man? you, too. Yeah, yeah. How's it going? Great, fantastic, I'm terrified, to be honest. Well, <laughs> what does it feel like to be here for your directorial debut here at South by Southwest? Oh man, it's a really magical feeling. Um, I mean, the people are so warm and welcoming. You know, I've put my whole soul into this, every fiber of my being. Um, it's been a bumpy ride, but we're here now, and uh, I'm excited to just share it with the people. Yeah. Why Monkey Man for your directorial debut, a big action film where you're also acting? Oh, look, I, I, I mean, I grew up, I mean, the first person, I mean, when I snuck downstairs as a little kid, I used to, I, I watched Bruce Lee through the banister way past my bedtime, and I saw this man with the same pigment as me just blistering through the screen, and uh, I, ever since then, I've just been obsessed with the genre, you know, from Bruce Lee, Jet Li, Jackie Chan, Sammo Hung, and, and then onto the Korean kind of revenge films, and, you know, I've tried to, like, meld my love of Bollywood and and Indian cinema and the Western cinema and everything into this one kind of uh, piece because I think the genre deserves it, you know? So how excited are you to premiere Monkey Man here at South by Southwest? I'm kicked, I'm really excited. This is insane energy, it's amazing. I, um, yeah, I'm excited, man. What can people expect from Monkey Man? Um, it's got gravitas, which I think is, is amazing for a film that's so much about action and so much about its style and extravagance but there's also this beautiful beating heart at the center of it that really grounds it i think that's beautiful what makes dev patel a great director what sorry what makes dev patel a great director being unafraid to fail finding the freedom to be wrong i think that's beautiful and I was just saying, you know, like all actors, we aspire to be uh, working with incredible, accomplished filmmakers. But I really think it's special to be 
chosen by a first-time filmmaker because you're really part of their birthing and it means so much to them and it's so beautiful to be trusted like that. How excited are you to premiere Monkey Man here at South By? I am very excited. This is my first time in Austin, Texas. And, you know, what a wonderful way to come to Austin with my film's premiere in South by Southwest. What can people expect from this movie? Okay, the, the most important thing is a lot of entertainment. That's for sure. But at the same time, uh, you will, you know, see emotions, drama, and, you know, we Indians are emotional people in general. So you will see a lot of that. How is Dev Patel as a director making his directorial debut? He's amazing, but yeah, I, I can tell that he's very demanding as a director, which is good because he got the best out of us. How are you? I know I'm you, good. brother. Shout out to great to see you. Nice to see you it's here nice in Austin. To actually, see people you recognize on the carpet. Isn't that a good thing? It does. It does feel like maybe I have a career or something. Oh, come on. Yeah. Your career is awesome. How excited are here. you to be here in Austin for the premiere of Monkey Man? Uh, it's a very personal one, this, because I'm very close with Dev. And oh, here he is right here. And he went through complete hell making it. Why? But it was just grueling. I mean, all movies are grueling, but this was particularly challenging. It was, it was in Indonesia, on an island, um, during COVID, low budget for what we were trying to do. And Dev just rose to the occasion and captained the ship phenomenally. And so, and it's been what, three years? So. What makes him a great actor's director and a great action director? I mean, for me personally, what I like is that what makes him good at both of those things is that he's more sensitive than most people doing those making action movies. There's a sensitivity and heart to his performance and there's a sensitivity and heart to his directing. And there's a sensitivity and heart to how he approaches dealing with actors. So I would say that's the most unique thing about him. What well, was, you know, you've done this so, so much since District 9 now, which is the first movie I saw you in. Uh, what were the unique challenges for you with this movie? This one was relatively straightforward for me. I got to improv everything, so Dev brought me on to improv. So, you know, I play this underground fight ring guy called Tiger, and like 90% of what I'm doing is just messing around with a microphone with an actual audience there. The biggest challenge was the heat. It was so hot, we had people dying of heat stroke nearly and like we're just passing out a couple times and I, I just, I mean, I'd come out of a scene and my entire shirt was just like, it had been drenched. That was as tough as it got, you know, but otherwise it was, otherwise we were on a tropical island on the beach. I mean, you can't complain. Hey, hey nice to see you, my friend. Yeah. Let's have you stand to your right a little bit. Okay, so you have been here before. Yes. What makes South by Southwest the perfect place to premiere Monkey Man? I mean, this is obviously a place where people come who really love movies. I mean, really love movies with a capital M. Um, when I premiered Us here in 2019, I felt like the audience was warm, welcoming, and they really wanted to just see something that they could interact with as a, as a crowd. And that's what we have here. We have a film that really deserved and demanded to be seen on the big screen. What makes Dev Patel a great director, his first film? Well, first of all, he's got a great actor in his first film. So that's that always goes far. But no, I mean, look, this is a guy who's been around the greatest director, some of the greatest directors of modern time and making films with them. And the, what, what he was able to accomplish is, um, you know, it, it are so many uh, cinematic achievements that I, I wouldn't even uh, be so bold to dare. So I'm, I'm blown away by him. And that is what I call a jam-packed premiere from Monkey Man here at South by Southwest 2024 Film and TV Festival. Check back right here for more amazing content.
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the last session of the day. My name is Monica Sack. I am the Senior Director of Conference Programming here at South by Southwest, and I am beyond excited to introduce our next session. Def Jam, can you believe they are celebrating their 40th anniversary? 40 fucking years! <laughs> They were pivotal in changing our culture and exposing so many people to a new genre of music, innovating the way we view branding even. And I have a feeling that they have at least another 40 years of continuing to push innovative approaches to creating, communicating, and capturing more fans. Here to talk about what's next is the current chairman and CEO of Jeff Def Jam, Tunji Balligan, current artist of Def Jam Recordings, Lady London, and last but not least, the person who had such a profound impact on my formative years, because I am a product of the 80s, and I just aged myself. Um, 
I'm getting all choked up. Um, hip hop legend and public enemy legend, Chuck D. Today's session will be moderated by President, Song Trader, and GM of Bandcamp, Brian Biniak. Reminder that questions will be accepted through the Slido platform. You can find that in the South by Southwest Go app as well as the online schedule. Just look for the session listing and hit the Engage button. Now, please join me in welcoming to the stage Tunji, Lady London, Chuck D, and Brian. Check, check. Well, first off, thanks everybody for making time. I know there's a lot of uh, opportunities for you to attend panels, um, but you made a wise choice and you chose the best. So thanks for being here. Um, nothing more exciting um, than getting a chance to talk to the luminaries on stage today and celebrating the 40th anniversary of, of Def Jam. And so wanted to kind of talk about both um, the past um, and the present, uh, and per the title of the panel, what's next, what we can expect. Def Jam is a brand and a business of firsts, um, leaders in music, leaders in culture, leaders in a lot of different parts of our lives. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to turn it over to the panel. So I'm going to start with Chuck. Um, and wanted to maybe take us back a little bit to the beginning, um, because you shaped a lot of what Def Jam is today, and been there through those, those eras. So maybe you can kind of give us some, some of the highlights for you and being part of, of what it is and, and everything that got created from the work that you and your fellow musicians produced. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, for, what's up, uh, South by Southwest? So, you know, they gave us an order to sit in and, and immediately I had Lady London sit right here because being flanked by the present and the future energy of Def Jam, I, I'm so honored. So that's why we switched up at the last minute. Because number one, Def Jam started as a, spontane uh, a spontaneous explosion. Really it started out with T. La Rock and Jazzy J and, and Rick Rubin doing a record with another distributor before they realized like, well, this ain't gonna actually, you know, be a check in our account. So Rick Rubin and Russell Simmons started the Purple Label in 1984. My, myself, along with my cohorts, Bill Stephanie, Hank Shockley, we covered it, because we were DJs, so we covered the explosion in the debut of Def Jam as writers, as promoters, as also outside DJs and musicians, just like many of y'all out there. So we covered it from the outside in and we tried to make a competitor to Def Jam because they were closer to New York City than us. But long story short, Rick Rubin tried to recruit me for two years and finally after two years, we decided not to be a competitor and then join Def Jam. So you had the initial artists of the Beastie Boys, um, LL Cool J, an original concept. And when we came in 1986, 87, we kind of put electricity to the building that already was being built. That was 40 years ago, and then 35 years ago. It was a connection of the record company being enjoined with the management company because management from the outside was looking at rap music and hip hop as this temporary thing. And when we joined in, we said, listen, we can make this thing as hard as the rock guys out there, the rock world. Uh, last, lastly, before we move it on, Run DMC was meant, and Jam Master J, they were meant to be on Def Jam. And one of the biggest, you know, biggest hurts of, of all time is that they never ever got a chance to record on Def Jam and bear the fruits, although they planted the seeds. So this coming full circle 40 years later and the energy of these two great people, uh, to me, just to come in as, as a, a person that, that can give stories, but give advice, past, present, and future, it's a joy. So we don't have to go back as far, we could bring up the pack, it's like talking about the Yankees, or the Lakers, or some of y'all, although I'm a Knicks fan. But um, 
<laughs> yeah, they're talking about Def Jam, the present and the future, especially with all the tools and technologies and the energy and the, and the fact that I think women are the future of rap music and hip hop under their own terms. And, and, I, and listen, and I say this on a day that, a day after that, one of, of the foundational artists on Def Jam in the 90s, Boss, who also was a Texas resident, had passed away yesterday. So we go full circle, but we go forward. Thank you. Speaking of growing up in, in Brooklyn, how did, how did Def Jam shape you and your music and, and your artistry, Lady London? Um, hey, y'all. It's hey. my first time here, so I'm super happy to be amongst you all. Um, I grew up between the Bronx and Jersey, and so even bigger than Brooklyn, no shade. Is, um, <laughs> is the fact that we birthed hip hop, you know. Uh, it was born in the Bronx in the 70s, and so um, I think growing up in hip hop culture, although I am younger, I was born in the mid 90s, and when I think about hip hop, I'm like, wow, look how far we came. From being such a small genre of music to becoming the highest stream genre of music right now is crazy to me. Um, you go from seeing Rick Rubin and, and Russell Simmons cultivate such a dope environment. Um, you watch you watch time evolve, right? You see the Rockefeller, you see the Murder, Inc., you see us incorporate, because, you know, again, no shade, New Yorkers, we didn't accept everybody when we came into hip hop. We, we, we let the South come in and watch what they were able to do. We saw the Ludacris, we saw the Young Jeezys of the world. We introduced the Midwest and breaking Kanye West and so many other things. Um, so just watching Def Jam, it's a pillar of our community as we know hip hop to be. There will be no strong foundation for hip hop without Def Jam Records. And it's just what it is. So I'm happy to be celebrating 40 years here as the future face of hip hop. Yeah. And Tunji, you've got the privilege of stewarding the Def Jam brand, you know, into the future. Uh, what, what does that mean for you and in, in your role? Man, um, first of all, it's an honor to be here with two incredible lyricists and also with my friend Brian, who I've known since literally the beginning of my career. He was one of my first bosses ever. Um, I mean, it's like, it's like they both said, it's much more than a label. It's, there's a whole culture behind Def Jam. Um, there's a whole world that feels bigger than just music and artists. And, you know, I remember when I was growing up, because I'm 40 years old as well, so I'm the same age as the label. I'm the first person that's running the label that like really grew up on the label, you know? So my perspective is a lot different than my predecessors, but it was the first record label when I was a kid where we actually like, you know, we knew who the executives were. You know, we, we it, it felt like much more than just great records. It felt like a whole environment and a community. And you know, um, I'm just trying to foster that in the future with, with another new generation of great artists. I also feel like Def Jam has always represented cutting edge black music. And obviously in, in 1984, that would be New York hip hop. And I think you've seen the label evolve over time, just like Lady was explaining, to expand into different regions and, uh, and different genres. Um, but you know, don't forget that Beastie Boys were there at the beginning. And you know, that's, that leads 20 years later, 30 years later, to an artist like a Justin Bieber being signed to Def Jam, um, who, you know, at the end of the day is making black music. And I feel like as long as we continue to represent that, you know, it, it, the label will move forward into the future and continue, you know, to have that next 40 years. And for me, cutting edge black music in this era, obviously hip hop will always be at the center of that, but it also includes other genres like R&B and dance music and pop music and Afro beats and dance hall. And, you know, I really want to want to cultivate an environment that is a safe space for artists from all those different corners of the world and all those different genres uh, to coexist, work on stuff together, and really just push each other to you know another great run, another great addition to the legacy. So I'm just doing my part. I'm also a rapper, so like you know, that's how this whole thing started for me. I was supposed to be a rapper, somehow I ended up becoming an A and R guy. Um, but I think the reason why I w 
became a very good A and R guy was because I was an artist first. So my relationships in the creative community were genuine, and my motivation was was very much from a creative, genuine space, and it, it all just kind of built from there. I could tell the whole story, but that's a whole other panel. Next time. So, so Chuck. The world's changed a bit in the last 40 years and how you connected with your fans then and how you connect with fans now. So, so how do you stay connected with the, the fans from the beginning and, and how do you connect with the new fans of, of today and introduce them to, to your work and Public Enemy and all of the different music that you're producing? Well, hell, you said the world's changed in 40 years. The world's changed in the last four years. Yeah. Uh, you, you stay connected, like in ball, in sports, they say that the team is only as good as the coaching and the players. Um, I think in the Def Jam situation, the tunes he's coming along, he, you know, he's almost like, he's like a championship young coach who also knows what it is to relate to the players that play. I think when there's something comes in like a public enemy, you stay connected because you recognize all the tools. I, I was on the forefront of um, the 1999-1998-2000 go to Congress and fight for, fail, for file sharing type wars. And um, it was a, a evening out of the, the majors and the independents. So what I had to do, I knew I couldn't fully at that particular time rely on a major record company to get me to my fans who are in every single continent, even the North and the South Pole. So I said, why am I contracted with this situation if you're not recognizing the pioneering innovations that's, that's evening out the playing field? So I left the fold in 1998, and I, I ventured strongly and rather successfully in the area of technology, you know, being able to, you know, elbow with what Steve Jobs was doing when the whole industry gave the industry gave it away to iTunes and thought they were getting over because they only thought Apple was 5% of the computer market. So they give them everything. And Steve Jobs comes up with iTunes and turns the industry upside down. But also being aware of all these moves and coming here like five or six times talking about how artists should think about recognizing these technologies and empowering themselves. Uh, the, the biggest thing that artists want to know right away is like, if I'm not going to deal with a big record company, how am I, how am I going to make a living? And I, I would very clearly say, well, you're dealing with the arts. And myself with an art background, just dealing in graphic arts and, and all kinds of visual arts, you always have to get in the conversation of the one, meaning one fan at a time, or one piece at a time. So as an independent, we had to look at one person at a time. And at the end of a, a, a great work effort, then you have a culmination of a tribe or a whole lot of people that will stay connected with you. But this was like, what, 20, 25 years ago. Artists since then knew that they would be connected with people that had their like interests. And so the majors now have to have a person like Tunji to be you know, aware of what's out there and what could be built and in what they have in the catalog area like myself and be aware of a lady London who also seriously, you know, is an artist where in an age where people listen with their eyes. So you listen with their eyes. So instead of saying this is a sonic delivery, it's sight, sound, story and style. That's what music is today. And artists have to hit on all four points, especially to stay in tune with the conversation between them and their fanatics. So we're at this venture point in 2024, in the 40th year, where it truly is just, it's just the beginning because new tools are coming in and a new way of looking at the connection between artists, fan base, and then those that are able to spread, spread it around the earth and beyond. And I say beyond because right now they have satellite wars. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, it's very important to have energy, young energy to be able to figure this out because you want that connection. You don't want the fan base to feel that they're better than you. You want them to be continuously awestruck. And that's how you spell audience in this 2020 period. Audience, A-W-E-D-N-S. Once you have them awestruck, then anything can happen after that. But you gotta continue to have that cut above to make them go, wow, damn, I can't do that shit, damn, they dope. 
And that is the core of fanaticism. I mean, we could say what we want to say about ball, but the closer we get to the court or the field or the diamond, we as fans say, yeah, all right, yeah, we can't do that shit. <laughs> I thought I, I thought Scottie Pippen was short, but nah, damn, dog. <laughs> so we want them to say the same thing about the artists, because you know people sing in the shower and they do their thing on the other side of the TV on the radio. But when the closer you get to an artist that's really doing their thing, you, you, okay, I'll just be a fan for a while, you know, and that's good. That's good for this label and good for the future of music. Speaking of awestruck. So as a lyricist, you are leading the next generation uh, at Def Jam and, and broadly in the industry. So who inspired you early on and how are you defining your own space and, and where you go with your music? Wow, uh, loaded question, Ryan. Um, I'm inspired by so many and by so much. Um, I'm inspired by, of course, those who came before me. I'm inspired by environmental stimuli. I'm inspired by my own upbringing. I'm inspired by um, different cultures. I'm inspired by my college experiences. So if I begin with musicians, in a, in a, in a bit of an unorthodox way, I'm inspired by people who aren't even rappers, just by people's approach to music. I like savants. Like when I think of like, true musicians, a Quincy Jones, a Prince, you know, people that like multi-instrumentalists, mega producers, mega engineers, which is why in my craft, I'm always like, how can I learn how to play the piano? Or let me hear the, like, I can hear instruments individually in my music. Um, so I say that to say, in rap music, I love Slick Rick. He's one of my favorites um, because I approach all of my lyricism in a narrative way. It's always a story that's being told. It's always um, vivid imagery that I seek to paint the picture of. And um, so him, Kane, uh, Jay-Z, obviously, Jadakiss, um, Foxy, MC Light, um, Kim, I mean, Lauren, Lauren is, is Whitney Houston, Janet Jackson, literally so many women that I just like their poise as well. Like if you, I love Janet, like I love Janet. I met Janet, y'all, I met Janet two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I met Janet two years ago and I secretly lost my mind internally. But um, it's just so many that I'm inspired by and so much that I'm inspired by. And I hope to not only do so much for rap music, as it is right now, because we're in a very interesting state. Very interesting is the word that I'll use. Um, but I hope to transcend a generation with my style of approach to music. So, yeah. Nice. Tanji. You shared early on that as an artist that, that enabled you to connect in the industry in a unique way. And one of your gifts and, and talents in your career is being able to connect with talent and find talent. And so in that process you know, of evolving and connecting and enabling a lot of amazing careers along the way, kind of what, what, what were those connections that, that supported that? How did, how did you become the a &R steward that you are prior to Def Jam, and, and how are you bringing those gifts with you in going forward? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say before I was an artist, I was a fan, you know? Um, and the most important connection in music is between the artist and the fan. Um, and as my career and my life have evolved, I've remained a fan. And my favorite thing to do, I'm a nerdy fan too, like, I go deep. You know, I, I wanna hear everything first, I'm searching everywhere. And I also at this point just have like a worldwide network of people who are sending me dope shit. And um, also Lady London, Lady London mentioned producers. Having great relationships in the producer community has helped my career tremendously because they're the ones who are making the records before they even become records. So, um, you know, I, I was able to kind of gain trust, I would say, because I came from an artist space. But my approach has always been to really dig deep into the underground because 
the the pop star of the future is the underground superstar of, of today, you know. So, and and I've seen it happen so many times. I've seen I've seen someone who was all the way left of center, and you know, very very different from what was happening in the mainstream, remain themselves, work really hard, build their story, and turn into the next star. Um, and I, you know, the one that really inspired me at the beginning of my career was. Um, I was lucky to be at Warner Brothers Records when J-Rock from TDE got signed. So I was able to meet Kendrick Lamar when he was K-Dot very early. And um, he was extremely talented, but he hadn't really put all, his, all the pieces of his artistry together yet. He was the hype man for J-Rock, which is how, why he was in the building. I was a marketing assistant. So they would come in and have a J-Rock meeting. And I couldn't go to the meeting because I was an assistant. And he couldn't go to the meeting because he was the hype man. So we became friends and we would just like talk about hip hop and debate, you know, who's nicer, Lil Wayne or Lupe or whatever. And, um, you know, this is at, at the time I was still really active in making music and running around LA and doing shows and stuff like that. And then, you know, years later, two or three years later, I ended up at Interscope and he had changed his name from K Dot to Kendrick Lamar, which is, you know, his government first and middle name. And he had just, he'd simply just become the best rapper in the world. <laughs> like, he's, whatever the hell he was doing for those three, four years, I, I know he went on a lot of tours and just really honed his craft on stage in the studio. And, you know, I, I saw this kid perform for 20 people, you know, in, in at, on the rocks. And, like, there's a flyer, you know, from 2009, I think, where we did a show together, you know. So I was really there at the very beginning, and then I was able to see and help him get into the Interscope building. I didn't sign him because I couldn't sign people because, again, I was an assistant. But I was, <laughs> but I was the one who was running around telling all the A and R's, "Yo, this kid is the, this kid is the future. You gotta, we gotta get this kid." And you know, eventually he got signed to Interscope. Dre got involved. You know, Good Kid, Mad City came out, classic album. And me getting that little A and R coordinator credit on that album is what sparked my career as an A an and R in a real way. But the real lesson of that story was seeing a true artist who fought through the adversities of being a different type of artist and was able to make it all the way into the mainstream without sacrificing or compromising who he really is. In fact, I would say his music became more complex and more weird <laughs> as, as, as he got bigger. And you know, that's my, favorite, that's my favorite thing to see, is like someone who comes from the left, um, an underdog who's able to beat the odds and not change the, the essence of what they are. That's what Lady London is to me, you know? That's what Public Enemy was able to do. So that kind of became my mission statement. It was like, if he could do it, I, I want to work with artists that can, that can do that. So um, yeah, and, and also just taking chances. Uh, it's funny because I started in hip hop, but most people know me because, I'm, because of like my R&B signings, because I signed a lot of new generation R&B acts like Bryson Tiller, Khalid, SZA, um, her, I didn't sign her, but I A&R'd her, uh, Lucky Day, you know, I signed Kate Trinata, I signed Childish Gambino. Um, I was also the first person in America signing Afrobeats, which for me was a big cultural tie. <laughs> yeah, because my parents are from Nigeria, and I grew up in Nigeria a little bit, so you know, being able to eventually sign a WizKid or a David O or a Thames, all these things for me just go back to like what I said at the beginning, like being a fan and just, you know, I'm like a fan that snuck into the back of the show and like started programming everything. So um, yeah, just staying true to, to where I started and again, like supporting people who have something different to bring to the table because if you can, if you can really build that the right way, you know, it could be transformative. Hip hop happened because it's everywhere today, right? And, but there were some folks like yourself, Chuck, who paved the way for it to happen. Um, and there were a lot of roadblocks along the way. And you enabled all of these careers to kind of flourish and, and take off. Now that's, what, that's what makes it fun. The roadblocks in the way, so you could just kick down the doors and and beat it down and go forward. You know, it's no no guarantees. That's the thing about it. That's what makes uh, the energy of art and culture and music so great. 
So I don't know if I was cutting off your question, Brian, but in this time, the, the, the beautiful aspect, and I'm a big Motown fan, which is also at Universal Group. For years, I was waiting for somebody to be able, after Gerald Busby, and he passed away, but I was like, wow, it would be so great if somebody has the energy of Barry Gordy to really, you know, go into the Four Tops tapes or go into, uh, have the Four Tops new, make new music or something like that in their whatever uh, configuration they might have or combination, you know, and that never really happened. So often the acquisition becomes a shell. That's not really happening with Def Jam because of Tunji, because he's bringing these, these energies and this vision, which might be uncomfortable to many at, at, at at, at many uh, different vantage points, but at the same time, it all leads to the right innovation of being able to have artistry. And it's easy to call something dope and whack. I mean, that's, that's, it's easy to say that. But as we're entering a time of artificial intelligence and its momentum and its speed, artificial intelligence is not going backward and is never going whack. Its goal is to make something perfect in sight, sound, story, and style. So being able to find an artistry that has the perfect imperfections, you want to keep the scars sometime. You want to keep the, 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 the gristle in the dirt. That's the beautiful thing about artistry that it is formed out of this idea and this step forward that comes in the, into the unknown and uncertainty and then with the confidence of a label or management or a situation say, yeah, keep stepping, fuck it, you know? That's what makes it in the first place, something that you ne necessarily don't have to see or hear, but you got to feel it. It's got to be something in the feeling. And even if it's wrong, if you can feel it and it goes forward, then that's what makes it dope, all right? We've lost that in the ability to thinking that we will always get the most perfect something at the end of the day. And now with artificial intelligence, you're never gonna get more perfect than that. So where's the, swir where's the swerve, where's the bend? Where, where's, where's the, 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 the whip with the wop, you know what I'm saying? That's what music offers, and this is what initially, kind of like last century, is not the same as far as people dance to it. They dance to a rhythm that came like that. Now Afrobeat will give you a rhythm. Now what will you do with Afrobeat? You gonna listen to it, nod to it, or you gonna dance to it, or stare at it? So this is the job and also the joy of an artist doing their thing and feeling confident about it. They got to keep on going forward, but they also gotta have the confidence behind them to do their thing. There were a lot of walls that you knocked down along the way where there's some you climbed over you blew them up whatever it was to kind of get to where you were going were there some kind of key moments in time that you felt I catalyzed talk or? about but I, I think at the turn of the century it, it's already classified i mean that whole thing of file sharing the majors had a chance to embrace file sharing and they didn't. They could have made it in 1998, they could have turned the MP3 into a great way to deliver singles. So up to that point, they were delivering albums with 18 tracks that nobody could hear and promoting one song and one video, which would cost 80 times more than the whole album being made. They made crucial mistakes that led them into file sharing, which has been going on you know, unofficially and officially for the last 20, now 24 years. So here we are right now in this space. I, feel, I felt proud that I knocked down the door so somebody could be at home making something at their crib that might end up going to the marketplace and being picked up by one of the majors. Um, what I didn't foresee, I didn't, I didn't come out to destroy the majors. I didn't think that when in 1998, when I got involved, that we would go from six down to three. That's a little troubling to me because if you got Sony, Warner, and universal, that means in the music as it goes forward and so many artists out there, what we have and what we need is thinkers, an administrative body, what hip hop needs and what the Def Jams need is like a whole bunch of people that are able to evaluate the talent. In sports, you got the players, but there's way more people outside of the game that contribute to making the game strong. We don't got that in music. Once upon a time, 
Like we had the source, okay, one magazine, then rap sheet, two magazines. So you got four magazines that's covering everybody. Now we got like blogs and, you know, and we have to step up to the point where somebody out there being a fan could be rewarded for evaluating the talent out there because that is your true core middle fan base. Sports, they got podcasts, they sell the game. And music, we need a lot of people that's outside of the artistry who are favored to sell the game, that, that, that also tell the story of Atunji and tell the story of Lady London and being able to tell the story of like how the Beastie Boys contributed and all this without it getting caught up in mythology and hype and hearsay and talks that they ain't really based on nothing. You know, I mean, I tell people all the time, hip hop does not move if not for the Caribbean. So you cannot detach the Caribbean from hip hop. So anybody that comes up and, and encounters that, I say, you fucking crazy. That's when I go in my New York mode. And I know how to curse very fucking well. <laughs> so sometimes, we, as OGs, we could be nice and in the cut. But when you hear stuff out there, you got to cut it off. And those are the obstacles that you want to slice off when people come up with mythology to serve their own interests. There's an actual fact here. Def Jam is documented. It's a movie called Crush Groove, people. You can see the actual beginnings of Def Jam. It's not called Def Jam, but it's right there. You're looking at Rick Rubin. You're looking at LL Cool J getting his debut. You're looking at Russell Simmons in there, although he didn't play the Russell Simmons part, but he's in it too. It's documentation. And whenever you could throw documentation away like it don't mean shit, that's when you have a problem with whatever you're trying to get across to a population. Fake news, fake news. <laughs> Def Jam is particularly compelling because you, it transcends music. You know, Russell and the rest of the team did Def Jam comedy, they did Def Jam poetry, they did video games with EA, Def Jam Vendetta. And I watch you and everything that you're doing. You know, you're, you seem to be a film producer and you're Take, you're a photographer and, and you're a musician and you're into fashion and you're into all of these different things and so you're, and you're a business person at the same time. So how does that all kind of come together for creating who you are and your music and your connection with your fans and your business? Yeah, I think um, when I came into the game transparently, I just wanted, wanted to rap people to death. <laughs> like... I didn't care about nothing else. I just wanted to prove that I was one of the greatest, definitely one of the greatest female lyricists of the 21st century, period, stamped. Yeah, that's just, that's what I wanted to do when I was first coming in. And then as I began to cultivate not only my career, but the foresight I had for myself in the next 10 to 20 years, I was like, I would love to be a brand. Beyond my own artistry, brands are forever. Brands are, when you are a brand, your reputation stays in rooms for longer than you do. And you are in rooms that you haven't even entered yet. Your name, your brand is in those rooms already. And so I, I began to think to myself, what is it that I want to represent? What is it that I want the Lady London brand to personify outside of I'm um, the best lyricist? Like, rap people to death, right? Okay. I'm like, I would love it to focus on the black family education, economic empowerments, the arts, health, travel, beauty, and fashion. Those are my core initiatives because that's what I cared about. That's what I've always cared about. In my studies, I, I have both my degrees are in medical sciences from Howard University, HU to real, uh-huh. And, and from University of Southern California. And so when I think about my trajectory in rap music, I wanna be a well-rounded artist if, if I leave this earth with nothing more than my name and my brand, understand it to be clean. You know, sometimes your power is not in your position, but in your posture and in your poise. And so the way that I walk in rooms and the way that I dominate rooms, with just the way that I am, who the woman that I've made myself to be, is so important for me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, juggling business and juggling rap music and juggling you know, my passions, it's a full-time job, but it's something that it has to coexist. It has to. I'm not, I'm not one-dimensional. I'm not just a rapper. I'm not just 
a you know a, a sister or, or a medical person. I'm I'm all of these things that make up Lady London, and it's very important that I continue to walk in that. You know, you only got one person to be. Everybody else is already taken. <laughs> We're going to try to save some time for questions, um, but I did want to kind of go through and, you know, ask you all a question about if we came back here in 40 years, what would we be talking about? Is it 40? 40. So if this is the first 40, what's the next 40 look like? Oh, in 40 or 4? 40. 40. I'm going to be dead, dude. <laughs> <laughs> 40 years, I'll be no, 103, no, no, dog. On. <laughs> nah, nah, every day is important, man. So if you said four, I'd be like, damn, I didn't know we was going to break up into five countries. But um, <laughs> that's real talk. I, listen, I was telling Brian yesterday, you're doing a great job, by the way, Brian. When I first started touring on a Def Jam tour, us and LL Cool J, we played Germany and we had to play, you know, West Germany. So to go in and play East Germany, you're on one road on a bus, and you got to get waking up with dogs and flashlights because there's one road to play Berlin, which is split into East Berlin and West Berlin. And all your fans on the, on the East Berlin side listening to the radio commercials to come to the Public Enemy LL Cool J Def Jam concert, they can't come because you got a barricade Cade in there with people on stanches with guns ready to fire and shoot them at the wall as they want to get close to the concert. So that was what, you know, what, how we, 40 years ago, I mean, well, 35, 36 years ago. So we've come a long way. And, I, you know, like I said, it, and, and I saw the, the wall fall two years later. The public enemy was playing a concert and the wall came down and all of a sudden the east was open. So it's crazy uh, to predict 40 years ahead. But you do want to take three to five years at a time. I think my life personally is always made up of three to five year increments because you find out that you write half a life and the other side writes itself. And same thing with creation and creativity where you find out like, I didn't know that I would end up doing that or being that or that would end up being there. So I think the energy is very, very important. The confidence of the energy. I think the beautiful thing about music and, and culture that it brings the human being together for our similarities and knocks the differences to the side. But governments think in opposition to that. So to continue to make feel good, human connecting, sometimes rebelling music is always life-saving and life-serving. I hope in 40 years, 40 years I'll be in my late 60s, I just hope to still look good. <laughs> and I hope that I'm, I got at least 10 hit records that I could tour if I wanted to and get up on that stage like, like a Tina Turner or something, you know, just still looking good. <laughs> uh, in 40 years, I will be 80 years old. Um, Hopefully still making great records, working with great artists, staying inspired. Um, Chuck made a point earlier about how labels were not embracing technology 25-ish years ago. Ironically, I was one of those kids that was downloading everything. And it, that's, that was a huge part of my music education and you know, learning about artists that either I didn't grow up during the era of or didn't have the money to buy the music of. So you know, I would download the whole Beatles discography and you know listen to everything and or download all of Stevie and spend a month diving into Stevie. Um, but I mean, I, I think in this era, technology is, is bringing creatives closer together and I think it's breaking down walls. And hopefully in the future, we'll have a, a more connected global conversation of creatives and music and artists. And I think you can, you can see and hear how different genres are influencing one another. I mean, hip hop is, is in every genre now, actually. It's funny when people are like, hip hop's falling, but then you, you look at the other genres that they're saying are growing, and I'm like, you're like these people, these are rappers. Like, <laughs> this is just a different language or a different style, but it's all kind of based on, on rap and hip hop. But you know, I hope in, in 40 years we see a more open, global, creative conversation and, and that people are 
you know, using and, and drawing from influences that are beyond just their doorstep. Because now you can actually, like, connect with someone who's 20,000 miles away from you, and you can hear and be exposed to sounds and styles that when I was a kid, you know, there was no way for me to hear what was going on in South Africa. But now it's like, you know, American kids are dancing to my piano records, and, you know, the, the UK rap scene is now getting almost as big as the, you know, a UK rapper can actually, like, compete on a global level or, you know, things like that. I think, I think we'll see more of those uh, walls coming down, ironically, to uh, reference something that Chuck mentioned earlier as well. I, I'd like to add to one thing. Uh, my, myself and my manager, Laurie Buller, we talk about this. What We want to end also the stigma of genreism. I mean, when we got in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, 36th group, I think 10 years ago, the biggest talk was like, well, that's not rock and roll. I said, well, who the fuck you think is the role, baby? <laughs> Let's shut up all the rockheads, right? <laughs> Without even going into the discussion of the blues and rock and its history, I ain't, I ain't gonna waste you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna freeze you on that one when they try to figure out what the role is. But the ending of genreism where there's so much before the year 2000 that could be protected in this catalog without the excuses. Well, nobody cleared it. I mean, with three majors controlling pretty everything, I'm pretty sure a resolution could be made somewhere where the, the, the classic period before 2000 in the area of catalog, box sets, legacy, um, connection, branding can actually be at least revered like Styx and Foreigner and not even Led Zeppelin, but Def Leppard. I mean, that you go into the vaults in those majors, major company, and they, their managements and their fan base and their surroundings protect those groups and those masters like that shit is uranium. You can't go in and touch a Miles Davis master. You can't go in. So these companies preserve the master, but the legalities that seem like it's insurmountable that they got to handle to take care of hip hop catalog was one of the reasons that I stepped into the Def Jam. I said, there's a world bef before 2000 that need to be preserved. Uh, hey, look, you won't even be able to go into a Rolling Stone. We didn't talk about the Rolling Stone, the Who, the Beatles, and, and, you know, and, and Led Zeppelin. Those masters at the same companies are like vaulted. So Def Jam is a beautiful place to start to say, we, our vaults are pristine but they have to go in, there's a lot of dynamics that have to go in there, legalities have to be flipped and changed, and there has to be a concerned body of interest from fan and working population alike that are able to make these changes so when the legacy artists for the next 40 years come along, they know that it's not in vain and not in chaos and despair. So that's very important, and that's one of my reasons why when I first had the conversations with the new Def Jam and conversations with Toonzy and just seeing what the, the work that Lady London is doing now and the energy and also what you're bringing to the table, Brian, just in the conversation of opening up. This is what people need to see other than, oh yeah, that's that hip hop shit and I'm glad that hip hop 50 shit is over with and by the way, you know, like it's the biggest music in the world but I don't know fucking why. We're gonna give you reasons why. So what's next for you? So what, what, what can we expect from Lady London? What can't you expect? The world is mine. <laughs> the world is mine, you know, and you have to speak like that, honestly. I, I believe I'm the biggest in any room, so I, I walk in that stride. So I think for me, um, short term, what's next is a tour um, and new music and uh, just like getting, getting my point across and maintaining Maintaining myself and my integrity through it all, you know? Tunji, what's, what's next for you and Def Jam? Um, just more, just really trying to represent and be that destination for uh, black music from all around the world. I'm just gonna keep running, running in that direction. Um, I also just became a dad, so 
teaching my daughter about music. I'm excited about that. Yeah, I'm excited to to, to play her records and and you know see where her her ear is at. And Chuck, what's next for you? Uh, I. I I created, a, I'm a technologist, so we created the world's first cultural media app called Bring the Noise. Y'all could go in the store. Yes, it's TikTok 35 and up, but it's a lot better than that. It won't get kicked out of the United States. <laughs> Not to say that's always a bad thing either, but if you go to bringthenoiseapp.com, it's the world's first cultural media app. It's, 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 it's dynamic. We have thousands of users, and it's just an alternative for the fans. It's filmmakers, artists, musicians, in sports, and then we tell people, you know, if you got drama and chaos, leave that shit over there. There's X, there's IG, there's Facebook, there's YouTube. Keep it over there. It's, we kind of got a nice artistic community of uploads, and and um, and it's growing. So that's what's now for me. All right. Well, what's what's now before we take questions is a, a little sneak peek of a video from Def Jam for its 40th anniversary. There's no sound, so just pretend you can hear the music. But you can hear the sound if you go to Def Jam's website. DefJam.com. Let's go. Chuck, you could beatbox if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the logo's like the, like the Yankees logo. There's a lot of people that wear the Yankees logo and don't even know what it means or why they're wearing it. But, uh, when, you know, Def Jam is a thing where people wore it and people knew exactly what it meant. It was hip hop. Um, so that's, I wore the P hat because of Roberto Clemente, but it also could stand for public. So, yeah, so symbols are, are an important thing and the Def Jam logo and symbol, um, Holds its own. Rick Rubin designed that with the arm. He comes from a um, from a from an art background as well, and it's held up. That's that's the thing about something visually. If it holds up, that means it's solid. You know. All Kudos right, we're gonna to go to some questions. We got the. All right. So first question for everyone: Who's an artist not on Def Jam that you've got your eye on? This is a round robin. Anybody who wants to answer can ask. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite new artists is uh, this kid, YG Marley, who has a song, only one song out. It's called Praise John in the Moonlight. He is Lauryn Hill's son, Bob Marley's grandson. Um, he, his record is one of my favorites right now. All right. What are your thoughts on the emergence of UK artists and subgenres, e.g. grime and drill. Do you see a future where Def Jam works with these types of artists? Um, we already are. Uh, there is a, a Def Jam in the UK, 0207 Def Jam. Stormzy is one of their artists um, who's really, really dope. But yeah, I mean, of course, uh, I think Hip hop has, has gone global, so at this point, there there's a, a rap scene in every country. You know, we we signed a really exciting rapper from Nigeria named Odumodu Black, who is up and coming, but like the biggest hip hop artist I would say that's come out of the continent. And you know, to me, there's there's no the borders are gone. It's just yeah. is it is it special? Is it really like cutting edge? Is it is it something that can that can cut through? I'm gonna put in a shame, shameless plug here. If you go to that app that I told you, Bring the Noise, I happen to put a feature of our rap station, which has been running for 15 years or 11 station channels, and we have Planet Earth, Planet Rap, which is curated hip hop from 116 countries for the last 15 years. So you can hear that 24 hours a day. It's curated, the way the artists come from, it's solid. So if you go to bringthenoiseapp.com, like I'm telling you again, <laughs> It will behoove you not just to be uh, 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 on the audience side of it, but also a participant. So also that has to do with the field that's out there, like what you've done with Bandcamp, the field of whoever's future for any situation that's bigger 
got to come from a situation of minor league system that they grow to the top and they're undeniably ready for the position. So that's the beautiful thing about now. This was 30 years ago. A lot of people, is hard. you got to go to L.A. or New York or maybe Toronto or London to be able to get a chance to get a shot or when somebody comes on tour to, to audition for them so they could take you to L.A. or New York. It's no longer like that. The center of the earth is wherever you want to make the center of your recording or your artistry. Nice. What's the, the most important thing a female Latina in the hip hop industry needs to know before breaking through in the hip hop industry? Um, I would say I'm, I'm guessing they mentioned Latina because they probably have some um, like Spanish in their music. Um, okay, period. Okay, Jennifer, period. Um, I would say the most important thing is understanding timing um, because you have such a uh, I think I think I would say, and maybe you guys would agree. I think you have an upper hand in a way, being able to cross over into markets that not all artists could do. The the Latin market, and I think just making those crossover records and knowing the timing in which it was time for you to cross over from hip hop to you know having a hip hop and Latin record is is very important and critical to not do it like too early or you know sometimes like that. Um, but I would say just stay true to yourself, and I just I'm speaking as a woman in hip hop, so. All right, this is from, I guess I got to call it his name, Matt Fry. Uh, Chuck, do you recall touring with the Fat Boys on the Wipeout Tour in 1987 in San Antonio where you changed my life? Answer is nope. <laughs> um, we didn't play, well, maybe the Fat Boys was on that show, but I do remember is that McGill Coliseum, I remember almost every show out of like thousands of shows. McGill Coliseum, the place looked like a big, uh, you know those campers that got made out of silver? That's what the whole arena looked like that, with cows in the back. With, in the back. But I do remember a young Shaquille O'Neal in high school coming there, dressed like a b-boy with a thick gold rope. He called me Uncle Chuck, and he says, yo, man, you brought me on stage. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, I remember that from that gig, but I don't remember the Fat Boys being on it. <laughs> All right, for Tunji, you talked about artists staying true to themselves as they continue to grow their art and career. Can you speak on how you stayed true as a, and grew it in Def Jam? Um, I mean, I don't really understand the question. <laughs> but uh, I will say that I am unapologetically myself through all the work that I do. And it really, at, at a certain point, it stopped. Like the border between my personal life, my life, and my job kind of just went away. And it's all just one thing. It's just it's just who I am. and I, And I... I feel like I figured out a way to make a career doing what I love the most, um, which is being around artists and, and putting out records. So uh, I would say that's the way that I, could, that I stay true to myself. And honestly, just trusting my ear and my gut and you know, really working hard to stay ahead of the curve and take chances on artists that you know, are unafraid to take risks and try new sounds and new approaches, uh, yeah. All right. This is from Christina. Chuck, I love your music and your art. Is there anything that you're able to accomplish or convey with your visual art that you cannot through music? Oh, wow. Thank you. I put out five um, illustrated books last year, another four coming out. I am the artist but that became a musician, not the other way around. I've been doing art since 1962 when I was two. But um, yeah, uh, I think that and I have my book publishing company. I put out more books, and I think the, the key is I'm doing some things with Def Jam. I think Enemy Radio, we have a project, and I'm going to actually make that a combination of music with art and then the technology making art live. And uh, I've done more than 40,000. I'm, I'm actually two artists. One is Chuck, and the other is Anonymous because it's really controversial or risque. And it's like Banksy, and I love it too. <laughs> and I've done 40,000 pieces of art, and, and they're splashed all over social media, and everybody's asking all over the world for more and more. So I think um, the combinations with music, and also not just my music, but other artists' music to go along with the art that I present. I mean, I'm, listen, I don't know about the music and all that, but in art, I am a beast, for real. I am the beast because of my, my speed and 
What I want to do by the time I'm 70, which is only seven years away, is be the most accomplished illustrator ever from hip hop and rap music. My, he um, my hero, my hero is my hero in art. Before I close it, is Ronnie Wood of the Rolling Stones. Ronnie Wood is also, you know, has books under the same companies that I distribute. And Ron, when I heard that Ronnie Wood, and this is an interesting short story, when I heard that Ronnie Wood, every hotel room he went into on a Rolling Stones tour, he would sketch it out. That gave me an idea what to do with my downtime for all those tours around the world. You go to a spot, you're in the city for four days, you've been there a hundred times. So I turned my room into an art studio the last 15 years and it's exploded. So that's what I want the next seven years. Whether, I, whether dead or alive, the art lives and that's the beautiful thing about music. Dead or alive, your signature is on across the sands of time, whether it's sight, sound, story, or your style. Never lose your signature. Keep the scars sometime and rock on. All right, looks like we got one last question from the audience. What's one of the best performances you saw this last year? Hip Hop 50 last year, man, I'm telling you, that shit was crazy. I mean, LL and Questlove put together the, the, the Force Tour for OGs, old heads. I mean, that shit was a CBS special. I mean, everybody, it, it pulled out all the stops. So this year, when they cut back, and, and big ups to my man, my, my, my bro OG, Killer Mike, on the Michael, right? He got televised at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So there was a whole bunch of, damn, Neil Grammys fucked us on that. And, and I had to tell a lot of people, like, wait a minute, you know they was going to fall back. After all the, the, the Hip Hop 50 that they put down, you know they're gonna fall back in Hip Hop 51. So the momentum of making sure we do our right thing, our, our thing the right way, makes you know artists like Lady London be eligible for that next year on her album coming out. So that's what we laid it down for. So yeah, that performance to me was just like everybody was invited, they pulled out the stops, and I, I, was, I was thrown aback. I was like, whoa. So I was, I was blown away, which is good. Um, Usher in Vegas. Kirk Franklin reunion tour with Kier, well, Karen Clark Sheard and everybody just incredible. Oh my God, so good. Well, I I'm excited at what's next. So um, I'm excited to work with you again, Tunji, and, and all you guys, you know, and it's been fantastic the last day spending time talking about what you think the future looks like and how you're gonna shape it. And uh, Tunji, sitting down with you a couple months back when we, I think the first, I walked into your office and you're like, so, what's up with this Bandcamp thing? <laughs> so, I'm looking forward to working with you guys all on Bandcamp. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. Yeah. And uh, like Lady London said, new music soon. And okay. a, a new Chuck D album on the way as well. Thank you guys. And that's